Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of The Snake, the Crocodile, and the Dog by Elizabeth Peters. Narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. This book is copyrighted 1992 by Elizabeth Peters. This recording is copyrighted 1992 by Recorded Books. Amelia hopes to rekindle some of the old fire with Emerson in a return journey to Armana, Egypt, where they met thirteen years before. But her plan is foiled when Emerson emerges from a nighttime ambush, typically furious, and with absolutely no memory of who Amelia is. And now, The Snake, the Crocodile, and the Dog. Chapter 1 Some concessions to temperament are necessary if the marital state is to flourish. I believe I may truthfully claim that I have never been daunted by danger or drudgery. Of the two, I much prefer the former. As the only unmarried offspring of my widowed and extremely absent-minded father, I was held responsible for the management of the household, which, as every woman knows, is the most difficult, unappreciated, and lowest paid, that is, not paid, of all occupations. Thanks to the above-mentioned absent-mindedness of my paternal parent, I managed to avoid boredom by pursuing such unwomanly studies as history and languages, for Papa never minded what I did, so long as his meals were on time, his clothing was clean and pressed, and he was not disturbed by anyone for any reason whatever. At least, I thought I was not bored. The truth is, I had nothing with which to compare that life, and no hope of a better one. In those declining years of the 19th century, marriage was not an alternative that appealed to me. It would have been to exchange comfortable serfdom for absolute slavery. Or so I believed. And I am still of that opinion as regards the majority of women. My case was to be the exception that proves the rule. And had I but known what unimagined and unimaginable delights awaited me, the bonds that chafed me would have been unendurable. Those bonds were not broken until the death of my poor papa left me the possessor of a modest fortune, and I set out to see the ancient sights I knew only from books and photographs. In the antique land of Egypt, I learned at last what I had been missing. Adventure, excitement, danger, a life's work that employed all my considerable intellectual powers and the companionship of that remarkable man who was destined for me as I was for him. What mad pursuits, what struggles to escape, what wild ecstasy. I am informed by a certain person of the publishing persuasion that I have not set about this in the right way. She maintains that if an author wishes to capture the attention of her readers, she must begin with a scene of violence and or passion. I mentioned a wild ecstasy, I said. The person gave me a kindly smile. Poetry, I believe? We do not allow poetry, Mrs. Emerson. It slows the narrative and confuses the average reader. This apocryphal individual is always referred to by persons of the publishing persuasion with a blend of condescension and superstitious awe, hence my capital letters. What we want is blood, she continued, with mounting enthusiasm, and a lot of it. That should be easy for you, Mrs. Emerson. I believe you have encountered a good many murderers. This was not the first time I had considered editing my journals for eventual publication, but never before had I gone so far as to confer with an editor, as these individuals are called. 
I was forced to explain that if her views were characteristic of the publishing industry today, that industry would have to muddle along without Amelia P. Emerson. How I scorn the shoddy tricks of sensationalism which characterize modern literary productions. To what a state has the noble art of literature fallen in recent years? No longer is a reasoned, leisurely exposition admired. Instead, the reader is to be bludgeoned into attention by devices that appeal to the lowest and most degraded of human instincts. The publishing person went away shaking her head and mumbling about murder. I was sorry to disappoint her, for she was a pleasant enough individual for an American. I trust that remark will not leave me open to an accusation of chauvinism. Americans have many admirable characteristics, but literary taste is rare among them. If I consider this procedure again, I will consult a British publisher. I suppose I might have pointed out to the naive publishing person that there are worse things than murder. Dead bodies I have learned to take in my stride, so to speak, but some of the worst moments of my life occurred last winter when I crawled on all fours through indescribable refuse toward the place where I hoped and feared to find the individual dearer to me than life itself. He had been missing for almost a week, I could not believe any prison could hold a man of his intelligence and strength so long unless... <sighs> the hideous possibilities were too painful to contemplate. Mental anguish overwhelmed the physical pain of bruised knees and scratched palms and rendered inconsequential the fear of enemies on every hand. Already the swollen orb of day hung low in the west. The shadows of the coarse weeds stretched grey across the grass, touching the walls of the structure that was our goal. It was a small, low building of stained mud brick that seemed to squat sullenly in its patch of refuse-strewn dirt. The two walls visible to me had neither windows nor doors. A sadistic owner might keep a dog in such a kennel. Swallowing hard, I turned to my faithful rice, Abdullah, who was close at my heels. He shook his head warningly and placed a finger on his lips. A gesture conveyed his message. The roof was our goal. He gave me a hand up and then followed. A crumbling parapet shielded us from sight, and Abdallah let out his breath in a gasp. He was an old man. The strain of suspense and effort had taken their toll. I had no sympathy to give him then, nor would he have wanted it. Scarcely pausing, he crawled toward the middle of the roof, where there was an opening little more than a foot square. A grill of rusted metal covered it, resting on a ledge or lip just below the surface of the roof. The bars were thick and close together. Were the long days of suspense at an end? Was he within? Those final seconds before I reached the aperture seemed to stretch on interminably, but they were not the worst. That was yet to come. The only other light in the foul den below came from a slit over the door. In the gloom of the opposite corner, I saw a motionless form. I knew that form. I would have recognized it in darkest night, though I could not make out his features. My senses swam. Then a shaft of dying sunlight struck through the narrow opening and fell upon him. It was he. My prayers had been answered. But, oh, heaven, had we come too late. Stiff and unmoving, he lay stretched out upon the filthy cot. The features might have been those of a waxen death mask, yellow and rigid. My straining eyes sought some sign of life, of breath, and found none. But that was not the worst. It was yet to come. Yes, indeed. If I were to resort to contemptible devices of the sort the young person suggested, I could a tale unfold. 
I refuse to insult the intelligence of my as yet hypothetical reader by doing so, however. I now resume my ordered narrative. As I was saying, what mad pursuits, what struggles to escape, what wild ecstasy. Keats was speaking in quite another context, of course. However, I have been often pursued, sometimes madly, and struggled successfully to escape on more than one occasion. The last phrase is also appropriate, though I would not have put it quite that way myself. Pursuits, struggles, and the other sentiment referred to began in Egypt, where I encountered for the first time the ancient civilization that was to inspire my life's work and the remarkable man who was to share it, Egyptology and Radcliffe Emerson. The two are inseparable, not only in my heart, but in the estimation of the scholarly world. It may be said, in fact, I have often said it, that Emerson is Egyptology, the finest scholar of this or any other era. At the time of which I write, we stood on the threshold of a new century, and I did not doubt that Emerson would dominate the 20th as he had the 19th. When I add that Emerson's physical attributes include sapphire blue eyes, thick raven locks, and a form that is the epitome of manly strength and grace, I believe the sensitive reader will understand why our union had proved so thoroughly satisfactory. Emerson dislikes his first name, for reasons which I have never entirely understood. I have never inquired into them because I myself prefer to address him by the appellation that indicates comradeship and equality, and that recalls fond memories of the days of our earliest acquaintance. Emerson also dislikes titles. His reason for this prejudice stem from his radical social views, for he judges a man, and a woman, I hardly need add, by ability rather than worldly position. Unlike most archaeologists, he refuses to respond to the fawning titles used by the fellahin toward foreigners. His admiring Egyptian workmen had honoured him with the appellation of Father of Curses. And I must say, no man deserved it more. My union with this admirable individual had resulted in a life particularly suited to my tastes. Emerson accepted me as a full partner, professionally as well as matrimonially. And we spent the winter seasons excavating at various sites in Egypt. I may add that I was the only woman engaged in that activity. A sad commentary on the restricted condition of females in the late 19th century of our era. And that I could never have done it without the wholehearted cooperation of my remarkable spouse. Emerson did not so much insist upon my participation as take it for granted. I took it for granted too which may have contributed to Emerson's attitude. For some reason, I have never been able to explain, our excavations were often interrupted by activities of a criminous nature. Murderers, animated mummies and master criminals had interfered with us. We seemed to attract tomb robbers and homicidally inclined individuals, all in all, it had been a delightful existence, marred by only one minor flaw. That flaw was our son, Walter Peabody Emerson, known to friends and foes alike by his sobriquet of Ramses. All young boys are savages. This is an admitted fact. Ramses, whose nickname derived from a pharaoh as single-minded and arrogant as himself, had all the failings of his gender and age, an incredible attraction to dirt and dead, smelly objects, a superb disregard for his own survival, and utter contempt for the rules of civilised behaviour. 
Certain characteristics, unique to Ramses, made him even more difficult to deal with. His intelligence was not surprisingly of a high order, but it exhibited itself in rather disconcerting ways. His Arabic was of appalling fluency. How he kept coming up with words like those, I cannot imagine. He certainly never heard them from me. His knowledge of hieroglyphic Egyptian was as great as that of many adult scholars, and he had an almost uncanny ability to communicate with animals of all species, except the human. He... but to describe the eccentricities of Ramses would tax even my literary skill. In the year preceding the present narrative, Ramses had shown signs of improvement. He no longer rushed headlong into danger, and his atrocious loquacity had diminished somewhat. A certain resemblance to his handsome sire was beginning to emerge, though his colouring more resembled that of an ancient Egyptian than a young English lad. I cannot account for this any more than I can account for our constant encounters with the criminal element. Some things are beyond the comprehension of our limited senses, and probably that is just as well. A recent development had had a profound, though as yet undetermined, effect on my son. Our latest and perhaps most remarkable adventure had occurred the previous winter, when an appeal for help from an old friend of Emerson's had led us into the western deserts of Nubia, to a remote oasis where the dying remnants of the ancient Meroitic civilization yet lingered. We encountered the usual catastrophes, near death by thirst after the demise of our last camel, attempted kidnapping and violent assaults, nothing out of the ordinary, and when we reached our destination, we found that those whom we had come to save were no more. The unfortunate couple had left a child, however, a young girl whom, with the aid of her chivalrous and princely foster brother, we were able to save from the hideous fate that threatened her. Her deceased father had called her Neferet, most appropriately, for the ancient Egyptian word means beautiful. The first sight of her struck Ramses dumb, a condition I never expected to see, and he had remained in that condition ever since. I could only regard this with the direst of forebodings. Ramses was ten years old, Neferet was thirteen, but the difference in their ages would be inconsequential when they reached adulthood, and I knew my son too well to dismiss his sentiments as juvenile romanticism. His emotions were intense, his character, to put it mildly, determined. Once he got an idea into his head, it was fixed in cement. He had been raised among Egyptians, who mature earlier, physically and emotionally, than the cold English. Some of his friends had fathered children by the time they reached their teens. Add to this the dramatic circumstances under which he first set eyes on the girl. We had not even known such an individual existed until we entered the barren, lamp-lit chamber where she awaited us. To see her there, in all her radiant youth, with her red-gold hair streaming down over her filmy white robes, to behold the brave smile that defied the dangers that surrounded her, well, even I had been deeply affected. We had brought the girl back to England with us and taken her into our home. And this was Emerson's idea. I must admit, we had very little choice. Her grandfather, her only surviving relative, was a man so steeped in vice as to be an unfit guardian for a cat, much less an innocent young girl. How Emerson persuaded Lord Blacktower to relinquish her, I did not inquire. I doubt that persuaded is an appropriate word. Black Tower was dying. Indeed, he completed the process a few months later. Or even Emerson's considerable powers of eloquence might not have prevailed. Neferet clung to us 
figuratively speaking, for she was not a demonstrative child, as the only familiar objects in a world as alien to her as Martian society, assuming such exists, would be to me. All she knew of the modern world she had learned from us and from her father's books, and in that world she was not high priestess of Isis, the incarnation of the goddess, but something less, not even a woman, which heaven knows was low enough, but a girl child, a little higher than a pet and considerably lower than a male of any age. As Emerson did not need to point out, though he did so in wearying detail, we were peculiarly equipped to deal with a young person raised in such extraordinary circumstances. Emerson is a remarkable man, but he is a man. I need say no more, I believe. Having made his decision and persuaded me to accept it, he admitted to no forebodings. Emerson never admits to having forebodings, and he becomes incensed when I mention mine. In this case, I had a good number of them. One subject of considerable concern was how we were to explain where Neferet had been for the past thirteen years. At least it concerned me. Emerson tried to dismiss the subject as he does other difficulties. Why should we explain anything? If anyone has the impertinence to ask, tell them to go to the devil. Fortunately, Emerson is more sensible than he often sounds. And even before we left Egypt, he was forced to admit that we had to concoct a story of some kind. Our reappearance out of the desert with a young girl of obviously English parentage would have attracted the curiosity of the dullest. Her real identity had to be admitted if she was to claim her rightful position as heiress to her grandfather's fortune. The story contained all the features journalists dote on. Youthful beauty, mystery, aristocracy and great amounts of money. And, as I pointed out to Emerson, our own activities had not infrequently attracted the attention of the jackals of the press, as he was pleased to call them. I prefer to tell the truth whenever possible. Not only is honesty enjoined upon us by the superior moral code of our society... But it is much easier to stick to the facts than remain consistent in falsehood. In this case, the truth was not possible. Upon leaving the lost oasis, or the city of the Holy Mountain, as the citizens called it, we had sworn to keep not only its location, but its very existence a secret. The people of that dying civilization were few in number and unacquainted with firearms, they would have been easy prey for adventurers and treasure hunters, not to mention unscrupulous archaeologists. There was also the less imperative but nonetheless important question of Neferet's reputation to be considered. If it were known that she had been reared among so-called primitive peoples, where she had been the high priestess of a pagan goddess, the rude speculation and unseemly jests such ideas inspire in the ignorant would have made her life unbearable. No, the true facts could not be made public. It was necessary to invent a convincing lie, and when forced to depart from my usual standards of candour, I can invent as good a lie as anyone. Luckily... The historical events then ensuing provided us with a reasonable rationale. The Mahdist rebellion in the Sudan, which began in 1881 and had kept that unhappy country in a state of turmoil for over a decade, was ending. Egyptian troops, led, of course, by British officers, had reconquered most of the lost territory, and some persons who had been given up for lost had miraculously reappeared. The escape of Slatin Pasha, formerly Slatin Bey, was perhaps the most astonishing example of well-nigh miraculous survival. But there were others, including that of Father Orvalder and two of the nuns of his mission, who had endured seven years of slavery and torture before making good their escape. 
It was this last case that gave me the idea of inventing a family of kindly missionaries as foster parents for Neferet, both of whose real parents, I explained, had perished of disease and hardship shortly after their arrival. Protected by their loyal converts, the kindly religious persons had escaped the ravages of the dervishes but had not dared leave the security of their remote and humble village while the country was so disturbed. Emerson remarked that, in his experience, loyal converts were usually the first to pop their spiritual leaders into the cookpot. But I thought it a most convincing fabrication, and so, to judge by the results, did the press. I had stuck to the truth whenever I could, a paramount rule when one concocts a fictional fabrication. And there was no need to falsify the details of the desert journey itself. Stranded in the empty waste, abandoned by our servants, our camels dead or dying. It was a dramatic story, and I believe distracted the press to such an extent that they did not question other more important details. I threw in a sandstorm and an attack by wandering Bedouin, for good measure. The one journalist I feared most we managed to elude. Kevin O'Connell, the brash young star reporter of the Daily Yell, was on his way to the Sudan even as we left it. For the campaign was proceeding apace, and the recapture of Khartoum was expected at any time. I was fond of Kevin, Emerson was not, but when his journalistic instincts were in the ascendancy, I would not have trusted him any further than I could have thrown him. So that was all right. The biggest difficulty was Neferet herself. I would be the first to admit that I am not a maternal woman. I venture to remark, however, that the Divine Mother herself might have found her maternal instincts weakened by prolonged exposure to my son. Ten years of Ramses had convinced me that my inability to have more children was not, as I had first viewed it, a sad disappointment, but rather a kindly disposition of all-knowing providence. One Ramses was enough. Two or more would have finished me. I understand that there has been a certain amount of impertinent speculation regarding the fact that Ramses is an only child. I will only say that his birth resulted in certain complications, which I will not describe in detail, since they are no one's business but my own. Now, I've found myself with another child on my hands. Not a malleable infant, but a girl on the threshold of womanhood, and one whose background was even more unusual than that of my catastrophically precocious son. What on earth was I to do with her? How could I teach her the social graces and complete the enormous gaps in her education that would be necessary if she was to find happiness in her new life? Most women, I dare say, would have sent her off to school. But I hope I know my duty when it is forced upon me. It would have been cruelty of the most exquisite variety to consign Neferet to the narrow female world of a boarding school. I was better equipped to deal with her than any teacher because I understood the world from which she had come and because I shared her contempt for the absurd standards the so-called civilised world imposes on the female sex. And I rather liked the girl. If I were not an honest woman, I would say... I loved her. No doubt that is how I ought to have felt. She had qualities any woman would wish in a daughter. Sweetness of character, intelligence, honesty, and, of course, extraordinary beauty. This quality, which many in society would rank first, does not count so high with me. But I appreciated it. Hers was the style of looks I had always envied. It is so unlike my own. My hair is black and coarse. Hers flowed like a river of gold. Her skin was creamy fair, her eyes cornflower blue. Mine are not. 
Her slim little figure would probably never develop the protuberances that mark my own. Emerson had always insisted these characteristics of mine pleased him, but I noted how appreciatively his eyes followed Neferet's dainty form. We had returned to England in April and settled down at Amana House, our home in Kent, as usual. Not quite as usual, though. Normally, we would have set to work immediately on our annual excavation reports, for Emerson prided himself on publishing them as soon as possible. This year, we would have less to write about than usual, for our expedition into the desert had occupied most of the winter season. However, after our return to Nubia, we had put in several productive weeks in the pyramid fields of Napata, in which activity, I must add, Neferet had been a great help. She showed a considerable aptitude for archaeology. I was unable to assist Emerson as I usually did. I am sure I need not explain why I was distracted. This placed a considerable burden on Emerson, but for once he did not complain, waving aside my apologies with ominous good nature. It is quite all right, Peabody. The child's needs come first. Let me know if there is anything I can do to help. This uncharacteristic affability and the use of my maiden name, which Emerson employs when he is feeling particularly affectionate or when he wishes to persuade me into some course of action to which I am opposed, aroused the direst of suspicions. There is nothing you can do, I retorted. What do men know of women's affairs? <laughs> said Emerson, retreating in haste to the library. I confess that I enjoyed fitting the girl out with a proper wardrobe. When we arrived in London, she had hardly a stitch of clothing to her name, except for the brightly coloured robes worn by Nubian women and a few cheap ready-made garments I had purchased for her in Cairo. An interest in fashion, I believe, is not incompatible with intellectual ability equaling or exceeding that of any man. So I wallowed, the word I hardly need say as Emerson's, in tucked nightgowns and lace-trimmed petticoats, frilly unmentionables and ruffled blouses, in gloves and hats and pocket handkerchiefs, bathing costumes and cycling bloomers, wrappers and buttoned boots, and a rainbow assortment of satin sashes and matching ribbons. I indulged in a few purchases for myself, since a winter in Egypt always has a deplorable effect on my wardrobe. The styles in vogue that year were less ridiculous than in the past. Bustles were gone. The balloon sleeves of the past had shrunk to a reasonable size. And skirts were soft and trailing instead of bunched up over layers of petticoats. They were particularly suited to persons who did not require artificial additions to assist in delineating certain areas of the body. At least I thought the styles were less ridiculous until I heard Neferet's comments on them. The very idea of a bathing costume struck her as hilarious. What is the point of putting on clothes that will get soaking wet? she inquired with some reason, I had to admit. Do women here wear washing costumes when they take a bath? As for her remarks on the subject of underdrawers, fortunately, she did not address them to the clerk or to Emerson and Ramses. At least I hope she did not. Emerson is easily embarrassed by such matters, and Ramses is never embarrassed by anything. She fit into our household better than I had expected, for all our servants have become more or less accustomed to eccentric visitors. Either they become accustomed or they leave our service, usually at their own request. Gargery, our butler, succumbed at once to her charm. He followed her as devotedly as did Ramses, and never tired of hearing the revised story of how we had found her. Gargery is, I am sorry to say, a romantic person. Romanticism is not a quality I despise, but it is inconvenient in a butler. His fists would clench and his eyes would flash as he declared, forgetting diction in his enthusiasm. 
How I wish I could have been with you, madam. I'd have thrashed those treacherous servants and fought those beastly Bedouins. I'd have... I'm sure you would have been a great help, Gargery, I replied. Another time, perhaps. Little did I know when that careless comment passed my lips that it was in the nature of prophecy. The only member of the household who did not fall victim to Neferet was dear Rose, our devoted housemaid. In Rose's case, it was jealousy, pure and simple. She had helped raise Ramses and had a wholly unaccountable affection for him, an affection that was, or had been, reciprocated. Now Ramses' offerings of flowers and interesting scientific specimens weeds, bones, and mummified mice, were bestowed upon another. Rose felt it. I could see she did. I found Rose a great comfort whenever the combined adulation of the male members of the household got too much for me. The cat Bastard was no comfort, though she was female. She had been somewhat slow to discover the attractions of the opposite sex, but she had made up for her delay with such enthusiasm that the place was overrun with her progeny. Her latest litter had been born in April, just before our arrival, and Neferet spent some of her happiest hours playing with the kittens. One of her responsibilities as High Priestess of Isis had been the care of the sacred cats. Perhaps this explained not only her fondness for felines, but her almost uncanny powers of communication with them. The way to get on with a cat is to treat it as an equal, or even better, as the superior it knows itself to be. The only persons who knew Neferet's true story were Emerson's younger brother, Walter, and his wife, my dear friend, Evelyn. It would have been impossible to conceal the truth from them, even if we had not had complete confidence in their discretion. And indeed, I counted on Evelyn to advise me in the proper care and rearing of a young female. She had had considerable experience, being the mother of six children, three of them girls, and she had the kindest heart in the world. I well remember one beautiful day in June, when we four adults sat on the terrace at Amana House, watching the children at play upon the lawn. The great constable might have captured the idyllic beauty of the landscape, blue skies and fleecy white clouds, emerald grass and stately trees, but the talents of quite another sort of painter would have been necessary to limb the laughing children who adorned the scene like living flowers. Sunlight turned their tossing curls to bright gold and lay caressingly on limbs pink and plump with health. My namesake, little Amelia, followed the toddling steps of her year-old sister with motherly care. Raddy, the eldest of Evelyn's brood, whose features were a youthful version of his father's gentle countenance, attempted to restrain the exuberance of the twins who were tossing a ball back and forth. The image of innocent youth, blessed with health, fortune and tender love, was one I will long cherish. Yet I fancy mine were the only eyes fixed upon the charming figures of my nieces and nephews. Even their mother, whose youngest child lay sleeping on her breast, looked elsewhere. Neferet sat apart, under one of the great oaks. Her legs were crossed, and her bare feet peeped out from under the hem of her dress, one of the native Nubian garments in which I had clothed her, for want of anything better, while we worked at Napata. The background colour was a strident parrot green, with great splashes of colour, scarlet, mustard yellow, turquoise blue. A braid of red-gold hair hung over one shoulder, and she was teasing the kitten in her lap with the end of it. Ramses, her inevitable shadow, squatted nearby. From time to time, Neferet looked up, smiling as she watched the children's play, 
but Ramsay's steady, dark eyes never left her face. Walter put his cup down and reached for the notebook he had refused to relinquish even upon this social occasion. Thumbing through it, he remarked, I believe I see now how the function of the infinitival form has developed. I would like to ask Neferet. Leave the child alone. It was Evelyn who interrupted her husband. Her tone so sharp I turned to look at her in amazement. Evelyn never spoke sharply to anyone, much less to her husband, on whom she doted with, in my opinion, uncritical adoration. Walter glanced at her in hurt surprise. My dear, I only want... We know what you want, Emerson said with a laugh. To be known and honoured as the man who deciphered ancient Meroitic. Encountering a living speaker of that supposedly dead language is enough to turn the brain of any scholar. She is a human Rosetta Stone, Walter murmured. Certainly the language has changed almost beyond recognition over a thousand years. But to a trained scholar, the clues she can offer... She is not a stone, Evelyn said. She is a young girl. A second interruption. It was unheard of. Emerson stared at Evelyn in surprise and some admiration. He had always considered her deplorably mild-tempered. Walter gulped and then said meekly, You are quite right, my dear Evelyn. Not for the world would I ever do anything to... Then go away, said his wife. Go to the library, both of you and immerse yourselves in dead languages and dusty books. That is all you care about, you men. Come along, Walter, Emerson rose. We are in disgrace, and may as well spare ourselves the trouble of self-defence. A woman convinced against her will. I threw a muffin at him. He caught it neatly in mid-air, grinned and walked off, trailed unwillingly by Walter. I do beg your pardon, Amelia. Evelyn said. If I have put Radcliffe in a bad humour... Nonsense! Your criticism was much milder than the sort he is accustomed to receive from me. As for being in a bad humour, have you ever seen him more pleased with himself, more cursedly complacent, more infuriatingly good-natured? Most women would not find that a source of complaint, Evelyn said, smiling. It is not the Emerson I know. Why, Evelyn, he has not used bad language. Not a single solitary damnation since we returned from Egypt. Evelyn laughed. I went on in mounting indignation. The truth is, he simply refuses to admit that we have a serious problem on our hands. Or rather, under the oak tree. Evelyn's smile faded as she contemplated the girl's graceful figure. The kitten had wandered off, and Neferet sat perfectly still, her hands on her lap, looking out across the lawn. Sunlight sifting through the leaves struck sparks from her hair, and the diffusion of light made her look as if she were enclosed in a golden shadow. She is as remote and beautiful as a young goddess, Evelyn said softly, echoing my own thought. What is to become of such a girl? She is willing and intelligent. She will adjust, I said firmly. And she seems happy enough. She has not complained. She has learned fortitude in a hard school, I fancy. But then, my dear Amelia, she has little to complain of so far. You have, quite rightly, in my opinion, kept her relatively sheltered from the outside world. All of us accept her and love her as she is. Sooner or later, however... She must take her rightful place in the world that is hers by birth. And that world is pitilessly intolerant of anything different. Do you suppose I am unaware of that? I said, adding with a laugh, There are some individuals who actually consider me eccentric. I pay no attention to them, of course, but... Well, I admit I have wondered if I am the best possible mentor for Neferet. She could not do better than emulate you, Evelyn said warmly. And you know you can count on me to help in any way I can. We shall get on all right, I expect, I said, 
my natural optimism reasserting itself. After all, I survived ten years of Ramses. With your help and that of Walter... You were perhaps a little hard on him, dearest Evelyn. The decipherment of ancient unknown languages is not only his profession, but his most passionate interest. Next to you, of course. And the children. I wonder. Evelyn looked like a Raphael Madonna, golden-haired and sweet-faced, with the babe cradled in her arms. But her voice held a note I had never heard in it before. How strangely the years change us, Amelia. I dreamed last night of Amana. It was the last thing I ever expected to hear her say, and it had the oddest effect on me. An image flashed across my eyes, so vivid that it replaced reality. A scene of baking desert sands and frowning cliffs, as empty of life as a lunar landscape. I could almost feel the hot, dry air against my skin. I seemed to hear again the ghastly, moaning cries of the apparition that had threatened our lives and sanity. With an effort, I shook off this seductive image. Unaware of my distraction, Evelyn had gone on speaking. Do you remember how he looked that day, Amelia? The day he first declared his love. Pale and handsome as a young god, holding my hands in his as he called me the loveliest and most courageous of women. No crumbling papyrus or Rosetta Stone would have replaced me in his heart then. Danger, doubt and discomfort notwithstanding, those were wonderful days. I even find myself thinking fondly of that wretched man and his absurd mummy costume. I sighed deeply. Evelyn looked at me in surprise. You too, Amelia. What can you possibly regret? You have gained everything and lost nothing. I can hardly pick up a newspaper without finding an account of some new escapade. Pardon me, adventure of yours. Oh, adventures. I gestured dismissively. It is only natural they should occur. Emerson attracts them. Emerson? Evelyn smiled. Only consider, Evelyn, it was to Emerson Lord Blacktower appealed for assistance in locating his missing son. Emerson, who unmasked the criminal in the case of the British Museum mummy. To whom else would Lady Baskerville come when seeking a man to continue her husband's excavations but to Emerson, the most preeminent scholar of his time? I never thought of it that way, Evelyn admitted. You have a point, Amelia. But you have only strengthened my argument. Your life is so full of the excitement and adventure mine lacks. True, but it is not the same, Evelyn. Dare I confess it? I believe I do. Like you, I often dream of those long-gone days when I was all in all to Emerson, the only, the supreme object of his devotion. My dear Amelia, I sighed again. He hardly ever calls me Amelia, Evelyn. How well, how tenderly I remember his snarl when he addressed me by that name. It is always Peabody now. My dear Peabody, my darling Peabody. He called you Peabody at Amana, Evelyn said. Yes, but in such a different tone. What began as a challenge has now become a term of complacent, lazy affection. He was so masterful then. So romantic. Romantic? Evelyn repeated doubtfully. You have your fond memories, Evelyn. I have mine. How well I remember the curl of his handsome lips when he said to me, You are no fool, Peabody, if you are a woman. How his blue eyes blazed on that never-to-be-forgotten morning after I had nursed him through the crisis of his fever... And he growled, Consider yourself thanked for saving my life. Now go away. I fumbled for a handkerchief. Oh, dear. Forgive me, Evelyn. 
I hadn't meant to succumb to emotion. In sympathetic silence, she patted one hand while I applied the handkerchief to my eyes with the other. The mood was passing. A shriek from Willie and an answering shriek from his twin brother betokened one of the rough-and-tumble encounters that characterise their affectionate relationship. Raddy rushed to break up the fight and staggered back, holding a hand to his nose. Simultaneously, Evelyn and I sighed. Never believe that I repine, she said gently. I would not exchange one curl on Willie's head for a return to that life. I love my children dearly. Only, only, dear Amelia, there are so many of them. Yes, I said forlornly, there are. Ramses had moved closer to Neferet. The image was irresistible and unnerving, the goddess and her high priest. And they would be with me day and night, summer and winter, in Egypt and in England, for years to come. Chapter 2 One may be determined to embrace martyrdom gracefully, but a day of reprieve is not to be sneezed at. I believe in the efficacy of prayer. As a Christian woman, I am obliged to do so. As a rationalist as well as a Christian, the two are not necessarily incompatible, whatever Emerson may say, I do not believe that the Almighty takes a direct interest in my personal affairs. He has too many other people to worry about, most of them in far greater need of assistance than I. Yet, almost could I believe, on a certain afternoon, a few months after the conversation I have described, that a benevolent being had intervened to answer the prayer I had not dared frame even in my most secret thoughts. I stood, as I had done so many times before, at the rail of the steamer, straining my eyes for the first glimpse of the Egyptian coast. Once again, Emerson was at my side, as eager as I to begin another season of excavation. But for the first time in, oh, so many years, we were alone. Alone. I do not count the crew or the other passengers. We were alone. Ramses was not with us, not risking life and limb trying to climb onto the rail, not with the crew inciting them to mutiny, not in his cabin concocting dynamite. He was not on the boat. He was in England, and we were not. I had never dreamed it would come to pass. I had not ventured to hope, much less pray, for such bliss. The workings of Providence are truly mysterious, for Neferet, whom I had expected to be an additional source of distraction, was the one responsible for this happy event. Some days after the younger Emersons left us, I watched Neferet closely and concluded that the forebodings I had felt that pleasant June afternoon were no more than melancholy fancies. Evelyn had been in a strange mood that day. Her pessimism had infected me. Neferet seemed to be getting on quite well. She had learned to manipulate a knife and fork, a button hook and a toothbrush. She had even learned that one is not supposed to carry on conversations with the servants at the dinner table. That put her one step ahead of Emerson, who could not or would not conform to this rule of accepted social behaviour. In her buttoned boots and dainty white frocks, with her hair tied back with ribbons, she looked like any pretty English schoolgirl. She hated the boots, but she wore them, and at my request she folded away her bright Nubian robes. She never breathed a word of complaint or disagreed with any of my suggestions. I therefore concluded it was time to take the next step. It was time to introduce Neferet into... Society. Of course, the introduction must be gradual and gentle. 
What better, gentler companions, I reasoned, could there be than girls of her own age? In retrospect, I would be the first to admit that this reasoning was laughably in error. In my own defence, let me state that I had had very little to do with girls of that age. I therefore consulted my friend Miss Helen Mackintosh, the headmistress of a nearby girls' school. Helen was a Scotswoman, bluff, bustling and brown, from her grizzled hair to her practical tweeds. When she accepted my invitation to tea, she made no secret of her curiosity about our new ward. I took pains to ensure that Neferet would make a good impression, warning her to avoid inadvertent slips of the tongue that might raise doubts as to the history we had told. Perhaps I overdid it. Neferet sat like a statue of propriety the whole time, eyes lowered, hands folded, speaking only when she was spoken to. The dress I had asked her to wear was eminently suitable to her age, white lawn with ruffled cuffs and a wide sash. I had pinned up her braids and fastened them with big white bows. After I had excused her, Helen turned to me, eyebrows soaring. "'My dear Amelia,' she said, "'what have ye done?' "'Only what Christian charity and common decency demanded,' I said, bristling. "'What fault could you possibly find with her? "'She is intelligent and anxious to please. "'My dear, the bows and the ruffles don't do the job. "'You could dress her in rags and she would still be as exotic as a bird of paradise.' "'I couldn't deny it. "'I sat in, I confess, resentful silence while Helen sipped her tea.' Gradually, the lines on her forehead smoothed out, and finally she said thoughtfully, "'At least there can be no question as to the purity of her blood.' "'Helen!' I exclaimed. "'Well, but such questions do arise with the offspring of men stationed in the remote areas of the Empire. Mothers conveniently deceased, children with liquid black eyes and sun-kissed cheeks. "'Now don't glower at me, Amelia.' I am not expressing my prejudices, but those of society. And as I said, there can be no question of Neferet's... You must find another name for her, you know. What about Natalie? It is uncommon, but unquestionably English. Helen's remarks induced certain feelings of uneasiness. But once her interest was engaged, she entered into the matter with such enthusiasm that it was hard to differ with her. I am not a humble woman, but in this case I felt somewhat insecure. Helen was the expert on young females. Having asked her opinion, I did not feel in a position to question her advice. It should have been a lesson to me never to doubt my own judgment. Since that time I have done so only once, and that, as you will see, almost ended in a worse catastrophe. Neverette's first few meetings with Helen's carefully selected young ladies seemed to go well. I thought them a remarkably silly lot, and after the first encounter, when one of them responded to Emerson's polite greeting with a fit of giggles, and another told him he was much handsomer than any of her teachers, Emerson barricaded himself in the library and refused to come out when they were there. He agreed, however, that it was probably a good thing for Neferet to mingle with her contemporaries. The girls seemed not to mind them. I had not expected she would actively enjoy herself at first. Society takes a great deal of getting used to. At last, Helen decided the time had come for Neferet to return the visits and issued a formal invitation for the girl to take tea with her and the selected young ladies at the school. She did not invite me. In fact, she flatly refused to allow me to come, adding, in her bluff fashion, that she wanted Neferet to feel at ease and behave naturally. The implication that my presence prevented Neferet from feeling at ease was, of course, ridiculous. But I did not, then, venture to differ with such a well-known authority on young ladies. I felt all the qualms of any anxious mamma when I watched Neferet set off. However, 
I assured myself that her appearance left nothing to be desired, from the crown of her pretty rose-trimmed hat to the soles of her little slippers. William, the coachman, was another of her admirers. He had groomed the horses till their coats shone, and the buttons of his coat positively blazed in the sunlight. Neferette returned earlier than I had expected. I was in the library trying to catch up on a massive accumulation of correspondence when Ramses entered. "'Well, what is it, Ramses?' I asked irritably. "'Can't you see I am busy?' "'Neferet has come back,' said Ramses. "'So soon?' I put down my pen and turned to look at him. Hands behind his back, feet apart, he met my gaze with a steady stare. His sable curls were dishevelled, they always were. His shirt was stained with dirt and chemicals. His features, particularly his nose and chin, were still too large for his thin face, but if he continued to fill out as he was doing, those features might in time appear not displeasing, especially his chin, which displayed an embryonic dimple or cleft, like the one I found so charming in the corresponding member of his father. "'I hope she had a good time,' I went on. "'No,' said Ramses. "'She did not.' The stare was not steady. It was accusing. "'Did she say so?' "'She would not say so,' said my son, who had not entirely overcome his habit of referring to Neferet in capital letters. "'She would consider complaint a form of cowardice, as well as an expression of disloyalty to you,' "'for whom she feels quite properly, in my opinion, Ramses. "'I have often requested you to refrain from using that phrase. "'I beg your pardon, Mamma. "'I will endeavour to comply with your request in future. "'Neferet is in her room, with the door closed. "'I believe, though I am not in a position to be certain, "'since she hurried past me with her face averted, "'that she was crying. "'I started to push my chair back from the desk and then stopped.' "'Should I go to her, do you think?' "'The question astonished me as much as it did Ramsay's. "'I had not meant to ask his advice. "'I never had before. "'His eyes, of so dark a brown, they looked black, opened very wide. "'Are you asking me, Mamma? "'So it seems,' I replied, "'though I cannot imagine why. "'Were not the situation one of some urgency?' said Ramsay's. I would express at length my appreciation of your confidence in me. It pleases and touches me more than I can say. I hope so, Ramses. Well, be succinct, I beg. Being succinct cost Ramses quite a struggle. It was a token of his concern for Neferet that on this occasion he was able to succeed. I believe you should go, Mamma, at once. So I did. I found myself strangely ill at ease when I stood before Neferet's door. Weeping young ladies I had encountered before, and had dealt with them efficiently. Somehow I doubted the methods I had employed in those other cases would work so well here. I stood, one might say, in loco parentis, and that role was not congenial to me. What if she flung herself sobbing onto my lap? "'Squaring my shoulders, I knocked at her door. "'Children, I feel, are as much entitled to privacy as human beings. "'When she replied, I was relieved to hear that her voice was perfectly normal, "'and when I entered, to find her sitting quietly with a book on her lap, "'I saw no trace of tears on her smooth cheeks. "'Then I realised that the book was upside down, "'and I saw the crumpled ruin on the floor near the bed.' It had once been her best hat, a confection of fine straw and satin ribbons, its wide brim heaped with pink silk flowers. No accident could have reduced it to such a state. She must have stamped on it. She had forgotten about the hat. When I looked back at her, her lips had tightened and her frame had stiffened, as if in expectation of a reprimand or a blow. "'Pink is not your colour. I said. I should never have persuaded you to wear that absurd object. I thought for a moment she would break down. Her lips trembled. 
Then they curved in a smile. I jumped on it, she said. I thought you must have. I am sorry. I know it cost a great deal of money. You have a great deal of money. You can stamp on as many hats as you like. I seated myself at the foot of the chaise longue. However, there are probably more effective ways of dealing with the matter that troubles you. What happened? Was someone rude to you? Rude? She considered the question with an unnervingly adult detachment. I don't know what that means. Is it rude to say things that make another person feel small and ugly and stupid? Very rude, I said. But how could you possibly believe such taunts? You have the use of a mirror. You must know you outshine those plain, malicious little creatures as the moon dims the stars. Dear me, I believe I was on the verge of losing my temper. How unusual. What did they say? She studied me seriously. Will you promise you will not hurry to the school and beat them with your parasol? It took me a moment to realise that the light in her blue eyes was that of laughter. She hardly ever made jokes, at least not with me. Oh, very well, I replied, smiling. They were jealous, Neferet, the nasty little toads. Perhaps, her delicate lips curled. There was a young man there, Aunt Amelia. Oh, good heavens, I exclaimed. Had I but known... Miss Mackintosh did not know he was coming either. He was looking for a school for his sister, for whom he is guardian, and expressed a wish to meet some of the other young ladies in order to see if they would be suitable associates for her. He must be very rich, because Miss Mackintosh was extremely polite to him. He was also very handsome. One of the girls, Winifred, desired him. She saw my expression, and her smile faded. I have said something wrong? Uh, not wrong. That is not quite the way Winifred would put it. You see? She spread her hands wide in a gesture as graceful as it was somehow alien. I cannot speak without making such mistakes. I have not read the books they have read or heard the music... I cannot play on the piano or sing as they sing or speak languages. Nor can they, I said with a snort. A few words of French and German. Enough to say things I do not understand. And then look at one another and laugh. They have always acted so. But today when Sir Henry sat beside me and looked at me instead of looking at Winifred... Every word was a veiled insult. They talked only of things of which I am ignorant, and asked me questions, oh, so sweetly, to which I did not know the answers. Winifred asked me to sing. I had already told her I could not. What did you do? Neferet's expression was particularly demure. I sang. I sang the invocation to Isis. The... I paused to swallow. The chant you sang in the Temple of the Holy Mountain. Did you... dance as you did then? Oh, yes. It is part of the ritual. Sir Henry said I was enchanting. But I do not think Miss Mackintosh will ask me to come to tea again. I could not help it. I laughed till the tears flowed from my eyes. Never mind, I said, wiping them away. You will not have to go there again. I will have a word to say to Helen. Why I ever listen to her? But I will go back, Neferet said quietly. Not soon, but after I have learned what I must know. When I have read the books and learned their silly languages and how to stick myself with a needle. She leaned toward me and put her hand on mine. A rare and meaningful gesture from so undemonstrative a girl. I have been thinking, Aunt Amelia. This is my world, and I must learn to live in it. The task will not be so painful, 
There are many things I desire to learn. I must go to school. Oh, not to a place like that. It cannot teach me quickly enough. And I am not quite brave enough to face girls like those every day. You say I have a great deal of money. Will it pay for teachers who will come to me? Yes, of course. I was about to suggest something of the sort, but I thought you needed time to rest and accustom yourself to... I did, and I have had it. These weeks with you and the professor and my brother, Ramses, and my friends, Gargery and the cat, Bastard, have been like the Christian heaven my father told me about. But I cannot hide in my secret garden forever. You had thought, I believe, to take me with you to Egypt this winter. Had thought. For a moment I could not speak. I conquered the unworthy, contemptible emotion that swelled my throat and forced the words out. We had, yes. You seem interested in archaeology. I am. And one day, perhaps, I will pursue that study. But first it is necessary to learn many other things. Would Mrs. Evelyn and Mr. Walter Emerson let me stay with them this winter, do you think? If I have so much money, I can pay them. Tactfully, as is my wont, I explain that friends do not accept or offer payment for acts of kindness. But in every other way, the plan was exactly what I would have suggested myself, if I had dared to propose it. I could have hired tutors and teachers who would have stuffed Nefret with information like a goose being fed for foie gras, but she could not learn from them what she really needed, the graciousness and deportment of a well-bred lady. There could be no better model than Evelyn, nor a more sympathetic guide. Walter could feed the girl's lust for learning while satisfying his own. In short, the solution was ideal. I had not proposed it because I did not wish to be accused, even by my own conscience, of neglecting my duty. Besides, I had not imagined for a moment that it would be considered acceptable by any of the parties concerned. Now Neferet herself had proposed the scheme, and she stuck to her decision with a quiet determination that was impossible to combat. Emerson did his best to persuade her to change her mind, especially after Ramses, to the astonishment of everyone but myself, concluded that he would also remain in England that winter. "'I don't know why you persist in arguing with him,' I said to Emerson, who was storming up and down the library, as is his habit when perturbed. "'You know that when Ramses makes up his mind, he never changes it. "'Besides, the scheme has a number of things to recommend it.' Emerson stopped pacing and glared at me. I see none. We have often discussed the one-sidedness of Ramsay's education. In some ways, he is as ignorant as Neferet. Oh, I grant you, no one mummifies mice or mixes explosives better than Ramsay's. But those skills have limited utility. As for the social graces... Emerson let out a growling noise. Any mention of the social graces has that effect on him. I told you, I went on, about how the girls taunted Neferet. My husband's handsome countenance reddened. Thwarted collar was responsible. He had been unable, in this case, to apply his favourite redress for injustice. One cannot punch young ladies on the jaw or thrash a respectable middle-aged headmistress. He looked rather forlorn as he stood there, his fists clenched and his shoulders squared, like a great bull tormented by the pricks and stabs of the picadors. Forlorn yet majestic. For as I have had occasion to remark, Emerson's impressive muscular development and noble features can never appear less than magnificent. Rising, I went to him and put my hand on his arm. Would it be so terrible, Emerson? Just the two of us, alone, as we used to be? Is my companionship so displeasing to you? The muscles of his arm relaxed. Don't talk nonsense, Peabody, 
he muttered. And, as I had hoped he would, he took me into his embrace. So it was arranged. Needless to say, Evelyn and Walter entered into the scheme with delight. I hastened to make the necessary arrangements for our departure before Emerson could change his mind. He moped a bit, before and after we left, but I must confess I felt an unexpected sensation of loss when the steamer pulled away from the dock, and I waved farewell to those who stood below. I hadn't realised Ramses had grown so much. He looked sturdy and dependable as he stood there, next to Neferet, of course. Evelyn was on Neferet's other side, her arm around the girl. Walter held his wife's arm and flapped his handkerchief vigorously. They made a pretty family group. Since we had been able to get off early in the season, we had determined to take the boat from London to Port Said, instead of following the quicker but less convenient route by train to Marseille or Brindisi before boarding a steamer. I hoped the sea voyage would reconcile Emerson and put him in a proper frame of mind. The moon obliged me, spreading ripples of silvery light across the water as we strolled the deck hand in hand, gliding through the porthole of our cabin to inspire the tenderest demonstrations of connubial affection. And I must say it was a pleasant change to indulge in those demonstrations without wondering whether we had forgotten to lock Ramses in his cabin. Emerson did not respond as quickly as I had hoped, being given to occasional fits of frowning abstraction, but I felt certain his gloomy mood would lift as soon as we set foot on the soil of Egypt. That moment was now only hours away. Already I fancied I could see the dim outline of the coast, and I moved my hand closer to the strong brown hand that lay near it on the rail. We're almost there, I said brightly. <laughs> said Emerson, frowning. He did not take my hand. What the devil is the matter with you? I inquired. Are you still sulking about Ramses? I never sulk, Emerson grumbled. What a word. Tact is not one of your strong points, Peabody, but I must confess I had expected you to demonstrate the empathy of understanding you claim to feel for me and my thoughts. The truth is, I have a strange foreboding. Oh, Emerson, how splendid, I cried, unable to contain my delight. I knew that one day you too... The word was ill-chosen. Emerson said, glowering. Your forebodings, Amelia, are solely the products of your rampageous imagination. My um, uneasiness stems from rational causes. As do all such hints of approaching disaster, including mine. I hope you do not suppose I am superstitious. I? No. Premonitions and forebodings are the result of clues unnoticed by the waking mind, but recorded and interpreted by that unsleeping portion of the brain which... Amelia! I was thrilled to observe that Emerson's blue eyes had taken on the sapphirine glitter indicative of rising temper. The dimple, which he prefers to call a cleft, in his well-shaped chin quivered ominously. Amelia! Are you interested in hearing my views or expressing your own? Ordinarily, I would have enjoyed one of those animated discussions that so often enliven the course of our marital relationship, but I wanted nothing to mar the bliss of this moment. I beg your pardon, my dear Emerson. Pray express your forebodings without reserve. <clears throat> said Emerson. For a moment he was silent, testing my promise or gathering his thoughts, and I occupied myself in gazing upon him with the admiration that sight always induces. The wind blew his dark locks away from his intellectual brow, for he had declined, as usual, to wear a hat, and moulded the linen of his shirt to his broad breast, for he had refused to put on his coat until we were ready to disembark. His profile for he had turned from me to gaze out across the blue waters, might have served as the model for Praxiteles or Michelangelo. 
the boldly sculptured arch of the nose, the firm chin and jaw, the strong yet sensitive curve of the lips. The lips parted. Finally, he spoke. We stopped at Gibraltar and Malta. Yes, Emerson, we did. By biting down on my lip, I managed to say no more. We found letters and newspapers from home awaiting us at both places. I know that, Emerson. They came overland by train more quickly than we... A premonition of my own made my voice falter. Pray continue. Emerson turned slowly, resting one arm on the rail. Did you read the newspapers, Peabody? Some of them. The Daily Yell? I do not lie unless it is absolutely necessary. Was the yell among the newspapers, Emerson? It is an interesting question, Peabody. Emerson's voice had dropped to the growling purr that presages an explosion. I thought you might know the answer, for I did not until this morning when I happened to observe one of the other passengers reading that contemptible rag. When I inquired where he had got it, for the date was that of the 17th, three days after we left London, he informed me that several copies had been taken aboard at Malta. Indeed. You missed one, Peabody. What did you do with the rest? Toss them overboard? The corners of his lips quivered, not with fury, but with amusement. I was somewhat disappointed, for Emerson's outbursts of rage are always inspiring, but I could not help responding in kind. Certainly not. That would have constituted a wanton destruction of the property of others. They are under our mattress. Ah! I might have noticed the crackle of paper had I not been distracted by other things. I did my best to distract you. Emerson burst out laughing. You succeeded, my dear. You always do. I don't know why you were so determined to prevent me from seeing the story. I cannot accuse you this time of babbling to that fiend of a journalist. He only returned to England ten days before we left. And as soon as I learnt of his imminent arrival, I made certain you had no opportunity to see him. Oh, you did, did you? Kevin O'Connell... Emerson's tone as he pronounced the name turned it into an expletive. Clever O'Connell is an unscrupulous wretch for whom you have an unaccountable affection. He worms information out of you, Amelia. You know he does. How often in the past has he caused us trouble? As often as he has come nobly to our assistance, I replied. He would never do anything deliberately to harm us, Emerson. Well... I admit the story was not as damaging as I might have expected. It would have been a good deal more damaging if I had not warned Kevin off. Emerson does not believe in telephones. He refuses to have them installed at a manor house. However, we were in London for two days before we left, and I managed to put through a trunk call from the hotel. I, too, had seen the notice of Kevin's impending return... And my premonitions are as well founded as Emerson's. I suppose he picked up his information while he was in the Sudan, Emerson mused. He was the only one to use it. There was nothing in the Times or the Mirror. Their correspondents were concerned only with the military situation, I suppose. Kevin, however, takes a proprietary interest in our affairs, Emerson finished. Curse it! I suppose it was unreasonable to hope O'Connell would not question the officers at Sanam Abu Dom about us. But one would have thought military persons would not spread gossip and idle rumours. They know we had gone out into the desert after Reggie Forthright, whose expedition was ostensibly designed to locate his missing uncle and aunt, I reminded him. We could hardly conceal that fact, even if Reginald himself had not expressed his intentions to every officer at the camp. And when we returned, Neferet was bound to inspire curiosity and speculation. But the story we concocted was far more believable than the truth. Everyone who knew of poor Mr. Forth's quest for the lost oasis considered him a madman or a dreamer. O'Connell didn't mention it, Emerson admitted grudgingly. 
He had not mentioned it because I had threatened him with a number of unpleasant things if he did. Neferet was not the only name to appear in Kevin's story, I said. As I suggested, as I expected of a journalist of his ability, Kevin took for his theme the miracle of survival. Neferet's story was only one of many. No one reading the article could possibly suspect that she was reared not by kindly American missionaries, but by the pagan survivors of a lost civilization. Even if the lost oasis was not mentioned, the suggestion that she had been reared among naked savages, for that is how our enlightened fellow countrymen regard the members of all cultures except their own, would subject her to ridicule and rude speculation by society. That is what concerns you, is it? Neferet's acceptance into society? She has had trouble enough with narrow-minded fools as it is. The clouds on Emerson's noble brow cleared. Your kindly concern for the child does you credit, my dear. I think it is all a lot of nonsense, but no doubt the impertinent opinions of the vulgar affect a young girl more than they would me. In any case, we can't explain her origins without giving away the secret we have sworn to keep. All in all... I find I am glad the children are safe at home in England. So am I, I said truthfully. The first person I saw as the steamer nosed into the dock at Port Said was our faithful foreman, Abdallah, his snowy white turban rising a good six inches over the heads of the crowd that surrounded him. Curse it, I exclaimed involuntarily. I had hoped for a few more hours of Emerson's undivided attention. Fortunately, he did not hear me. Raising his hands to his mouth, he let out a ululating call that made the nearby passengers jump and brought a broad grin to Abdullah's face. He had been our rice for years and was far too old and dignified to express his excitement in violent physical demonstrations. But his younger relatives were not. Their turbans bobbed as they jumped up and down and shouted their welcome. How splendid of Abdullah to come all this way, Emerson said, beaming. And Selim, I said, spotting other familiar faces. And Ali and Daoud and Faisal and... They will be of great help getting our gear to the train, Emerson said. I can't think why I didn't suggest they meet us here. But it is like Abdallah to anticipate our slightest desire. The train from Port Said to Cairo takes less than six hours. There was plenty of room in our compartment for Abdallah and his eldest son Faisal, since the other European passengers refused to share it with a bunch of dirty natives, as one pompous idiot put it. I heard him expostulating with the conductor. He got nowhere. The conductor knew Emerson. So we settled down and had a refreshing gossip. Abdallah was distressed to learn that Ramses was not with us. At least he put on a good show of distress, but I thought I detected a certain gleam in his black eyes. His feelings were clear to me. Did I not share them? His devotion to Emerson combined the reverence of an acolyte with the strong friendship of a man and a brother. He had not been with us the year before, now he could look forward to an entire season of his idol's undivided attention. He would have disposed of me as well, had that been possible, I thought, without resentment. I felt the same about him, not to mention Ali, Daoud and Faisal. We parted in Cairo, but only temporarily. Before long, we would visit the men at their village of Azir to recruit our crew for the winter's excavations. Emerson was in such a good humour that he submitted gracefully to being embraced by all the men in turn. For some time he was virtually invisible in a cloud of waving sleeves and flapping robes. The other European travellers stared impertinently. We had booked rooms at Shepherd's, of course. Our old friend Mr Baylor was now the owner, so we had no difficulty on that score. Though Shepherd's is becoming so popular that rooms are hard to obtain. That year, everyone was celebrating the victory in the Sudan. 
On September 2nd, Kitchener's troops had occupied Omdurman and Khartoum, ending the rebellion and cleansing the British flag of the stain of dishonour that had blemished it since the gallant Gordon fell to the hordes of the mad Mahdi. If my reader is not familiar with this event, I refer him or her to any standard history. Emerson's amiable mood disintegrated as soon as we entered the hotel. Shepherds is always crowded during the winter season, and this year the crush was greater than usual. Sun-bronzed young officers, newly arrived from the battle zone, flaunted their bandages and gold braid before the admiring eyes of the ladies who fluttered around them. One face, adorned with a particularly impressive set of military moustaches, looked familiar. But before I could approach the officer, who was surrounded by a crowd of civilians questioning him about Khartoum, Emerson took me by the arm and dragged me away. Not until we had reached our rooms, the ones we always had, overlooking Esbikia Gardens, did he speak. The place is more confoundedly overcrowded and fashionable every year, he grumbled, tossing his hat onto the floor and sending his coat to follow it. This is the last time, Amelia. I mean it. Next year we will accept the invitation of Sheikh Mohammed to stay with him. Certainly, my dear, I replied, as I did every year. Shall we go down for tea, or shall I tell the Safraji to bring it to us here? I don't want any confounded tea, said Emerson. We had our tea on the little balcony overlooking the gardens. Greatly as I yearned to join the crowd below, which I did not doubt contained many friends and acquaintances and catch up on the news, I did not deem it wise to persuade Emerson back into his coat and hat. I had had a hard enough time getting the latter object of apparel onto his head long enough to enter the hotel. The white-robed servant glided in and out, noiseless on bare feet, and we took our places at the table. Below us, the gardens were bright with roses and hibiscus. Carriages and foot passengers passed to and fro along the broad avenue in the never-ending panorama of Egyptian life, as I once termed it. A handsome carriage drew up before the steps of the hotel. From it descended a stately figure in full-dress uniform. Emerson leaned over the edge of the balcony. "'Hi there!' he shouted. Assalamu alaikum, Habib. Emerson, I exclaimed, that is General Kitchener. Is it? I was not addressing him. He gestured vigorously. To my chagrin, his wave was answered by a picturesque but extremely ragged individual carrying a tray of cheap souvenirs. Several other equally picturesque persons in the crowd of would-be sellers of flowers, fruit, trinkets and souvenirs, attracted by the gesture, looked up and joined in the general shout of welcome. He has returned, the father of curses. Allah, you mesikum bil khair efendi, marhabba, o sitakim. Hmm, I said, somewhat flattered at being included in this accolade. For Sit Hakim, Lady Doctor, is my own affectionate nickname among Egyptians. Do sit down, Emerson, and stop shouting. People are staring. It was my intention that they should, Emerson declared. I want to talk with old Ahmed later. He always knows what is going on. He was persuaded to resume his seat. As the sun sank lower, the horizon was suffused by the exquisite glow of the dying day, and Emerson's countenance became pensive. Do you remember, Peabody, the first time Ramses stood on this very balcony with us? We watched the sunset over Cairo together. As we shall no doubt do again, I said rather sharply. Now, Emerson... Don't think of Ramses. Tell me the news I have been dying to hear. I know your engaging habit of keeping our future plans a secret from me until the last possible moment. You enjoy your little surprises. But the time has come, I think. Where shall we excavate this winter? The decision is not so easy to make, Emerson replied, holding out his cup to be refilled. 
I was tempted by Sakara. So little has been done there. And I am of the opinion that there is a great 18th dynasty cemetery somewhere in the vicinity of Memphis. That is a logical deduction, I agreed. Especially in view of the fact that Lepsius mentioned seeing such tombs in 1843. Peabody, if you don't refrain from anticipating my brilliant deductions, I shall divorce you, Emerson said amiably. Those tombs of Lepsius's are now lost. It would be quite a coup to find them again, and perhaps others. However, Thebes also has its attraction. Most of the royal mummies of the empire have now been found, but, by the by, did I tell you I knew of that second cache of mummies in the tomb of Amenhotep II fifteen years ago? Yes, my dear. You have mentioned it approximately ten times since we heard of Loret's discovery of the tomb last March. Why you didn't open the tomb yourself and get the credit? Credit be damned! You know my views, Peabody. Once a tomb or site is uncovered, the scavengers descend. Like most archaeologists, that incompetent idiot Loray doesn't supervise his men adequately. They made off with valuable objects from that tomb under his very nose. Some have already appeared on the market. Until the Antiquities Department is properly organised... Yes, my dear, I know your views, I said soothingly, for Emerson was capable of lecturing on that subject for hours. So you are considering the Valley of the Kings? If the royal mummies have all been found, but the original tombs have not. We are still missing those of Hatshepsut, Amos, Amenhotep I, and Thutmose III, to mention only a few. And I have never been certain that the tomb we found was really that of Tutankhamun. It could have belonged to no one else, I said. However... I agree with you that there are royal tombs yet to be found. Our old friend Cyrus Vandergelt will be there again this season, will he not? He has often asked you to work with him. Not with, but for him, Emerson answered with a scowl. I have nothing against Americans, even rich Americans, even rich American dilettantes. But I work for no man. You have too many cursed old friends, Peabody. My famous intuition failed on this occasion. No tremor of premonitory horror ran through me. I hope you don't harbour any doubts as to Mr. Vandergelt's intentions, Emerson. You mean, am I jealous? My dear, I abjured that unworthy emotion long ago. You convinced me, as I hope I convinced you, that there could never be the slightest cause. Old married people like ourselves, Peabody, have passed through the cataracts of youthful passion into the serene pool of matrimonial affection. Hmm, I said. In fact, Emerson went on, I have been thinking for some time that we need to examine our plans, not for this year, but for the future. Archaeology is changing, Peabody. Petrie is still bouncing around like a rubber ball, tackling a different site each year. We have done the same. Yes, but, in my opinion, this has become increasingly ineffective. Look at Petrie's excavation reports. They are... Emerson almost choked on the admission that his chief rival had any good qualities, but managed to get it out. They are um, not bad. Not bad at all. But in a single season's work, he cannot do more than scratch at the site. And once the monuments are uncovered, they are as good as gone. I agree, Emerson. What do you propose? Do you mind if I smoke? Without waiting for an answer, he took out his pipe and tobacco pouch. What I propose is that we focus on a single site, not for one season, but until we have found everything that is to be found and recorded everything in painstaking detail. We will need a larger staff, of course. "'Experts in the increasingly complex techniques of excavation. "'Photographers, artists, an epigrapher to copy and collate texts, "'an anatomist to study bones, "'students who can supervise the workers and learn excavation procedures. "'We might even consider building a permanent house "'to which we can return every year.' "'He let out a great puff of smoke and added, 
then we wouldn't have to stay at this cursed hotel. For a moment, I could think of nothing to say. The proposal was so unexpected, the ramifications so complex, I struggled to take them in. Well, I said on a long breath, the proposal is so unexpected, I can think of nothing to say. I fully anticipated Emerson would make some sarcastic remark about my loquacity, but he didn't rise to the bait. Unexpected, perhaps, but I hope not unwelcome. You never complain, my dear, but the tasks you have faced each year would daunt a lesser woman. It is time you had help, companionship, assistance. Of the female variety, I suppose you mean? A secretary would certainly be useful. Come, Peabody, I had not expected you to be so narrow-minded. We could certainly use someone to keep the record straight. But why need that individual be female? And why not women students, excavators and scholars? Why not indeed? He had touched a tender cord. The advancement of my underrated sex has always been of deep importance to me. After all, I reflected... I had never counted on more than one year of solitary happiness. I hadn't even counted on that. Let me enjoy it now and not think of the depressing future. Emerson, I have said it before and I will continue to say it. You are the most remarkable of men. As you have also said, you would have accepted nothing less. Emerson grinned at me. Do you have anyone in mind? Neferet and Ramses, of course. Of course. The girl has demonstrated both interest and aptitude, Emerson went on. I am also in hopes of inducing Evelyn and Walter to come out with us, once we have established a permanent base. There is a young woman named Murray at University College, a student of Griffith who shows great promise. That is one of the things I hope to do this season, Peabody, interview potential staff members. Then, I said, rising, I suggest we begin by dining downstairs. Why the devil should we? Ali's in the bazaar has better food. But some of our colleagues are certain to be dining at Shepherd's. We can consult them about their more promising students. Emerson studied me suspiciously. You always have some excuse for forcing me into activities I detest. How do you know there will be any Egyptologists here tonight? You invited them, didn't you? Curse it, Peabody! I found messages from friends awaiting us, as is always the case. Come along now, it's getting late, and you will want to bathe and change. I won't want to, but I suppose I must, Emerson grumbled. He began undressing as he stamped across the room, tossing collar, shirt and cravat in the general direction of the sofa. They fell on the floor... I was about to expostulate when Emerson came to a sudden stop and gestured emphatically at me to do the same. Head tilted, ears almost visibly pricked. He listened for a moment and then, with the cat-like quickness he could summon when he felt it expedient, he lunged at the door and flung it open. The corridor was dark, but I made out a huddled form crouched or collapsed on the floor. Emerson seized it in a bruising grip and dragged it into the room. Chapter 3 A woman's instinct, I always feel, supersedes logic. For heaven's sake, Emerson, I exclaimed. It is Mr. Neville. Drop him at once. Emerson inspected his captive, whom he held by the collar. "'So it is,' he said in mild surprise. "'What the devil were you doing down on the floor, Neville?' The unfortunate young man inserted a finger between his cravat and his neck, loosening the former from the latter before he spoke. "'Uh, the gaslight in the corridor must have expired. "'It was extremely dark, and I could not be certain I had found the correct room.' When I tried to look more closely at the number, my spectacles fell off. Here, a fit of coughing overcame him. Say no more, I said. Emerson, go and look for Mr. Neville's eyeglasses. I only hope you didn't step on them. As it turned out, he had. Neville studied the ruined objects ruefully. Fortunately, I have another pair. 
I did not bring them with me, however, so perhaps you will be good enough to guide my steps tonight, Mrs. Emerson. Certainly. And, of course, we will replace your spectacles. Really, Emerson, you must get over the habit of leaping on people like that. Neville was one of the younger generation of archaeologists who had already demonstrated a remarkable talent for philology. In appearance, he was one of the least memorable individuals of my acquaintance, for his beard and hair were of the same buff colour as his skin, and his eyes were an indeterminate shade of grey-brown. His character was mild and accommodating, however, and he had a pleasant smile. It was my fault, Mrs. Emerson. From the stories I have heard, you and the Professor have good reason to be suspicious of people lurking at your door. That is true, Emerson declared. In this case, however, I owe you an apology. No harm done, I hope. He began brushing Neville off with such vigorous goodwill that the young man's head rocked back and forth. Stop that, Emerson, and go change, I ordered. You will have to excuse us, Mr. Neville. We are later than I expected. There is a manuscript on the table that may interest you. It was in the hope of consulting you about certain passages that I asked you to do me the favour of coming early. By the time I had closed the bedroom door, Emerson was already in the bathroom, splashing loudly. I concluded he wanted to avoid a lecture or inconvenient questions... Emerson is inclined to act hastily, but he seldom acts without cause, however inadequate that cause may seem to persons of duller intellect. Had he cause for apprehension that he had not seen fit to confide to me? He gave me no opportunity to pursue the matter at that time, dressing with uncharacteristic speed and lack of fuss while I was performing my ablutions. I had to call him back from the sitting room where he had gone to entertain our visitor in order to request his assistance in buttoning my frock. The distractions that often occur during this process did not occur on this occasion. I was wearing a gown of bright crimson, Emerson's favourite colour. It was the latest fashion and I had had to badger my dressmaker to finish it in time. Emerson gave me a cursory glance and remarked, you look very nice, my dear. I have always liked that dress. When we returned to the sitting room, Mr. Neville was peering nearsightedly at the manuscript to which I had directed his attention. Fascinating, he exclaimed. Is this Mr. Walter Emerson's transliteration of the tale of the doomed prince? It seems much more accurate than Maspero's. To compare Maspero's knowledge of hieratic to that of my brother is an insult in itself, said Emerson rudely. That is a trivial piece of work for Walter. He only transcribed it into hieroglyphs as a favour to Mrs. Emerson. She had a fancy to translate it, and her hieratic... Comparisons are unnecessary as well as invidious, Emerson, I said. I have never claimed to be an expert at hieratic... For the benefit of the ignorant, I ought to explain that hieratic is the cursive, abbreviated form of hieroglyphic writing. So abbreviated in many cases that the resemblance to the original form is almost impossible to make out. Walter was one of the leading authorities on this, as on other forms of ancient Egyptian. I was not. Neither was Emerson. It is a fascinating tale, Neville agreed. What passage in particular... No time for that now, said Emerson. If we must do this, let's get it over with. Lean on me, Neville, I won't let you fall. Take my other arm, Amelia. The cursed suffragi has let the light go out. I can hardly see where we are going. The lights at the other end of the corridor burned bright, and we proceeded with great speed. A thrill of pride ran through me as we descended the staircase, for all eyes, especially those of the ladies, focused on the form of my husband. Unconscious of their regard, for he is in such matters a modest man, he led the way to the dining salon, where we found our friends waiting. Such a gathering on the first evening of our return to Egypt had become a pleasant little tradition. As I took my place, I was saddened to see that some of the familiar, friendly faces were missing. Gone forever, alas, until that glorious day when we shall meet again in a better world. I knew the Reverend Mr. Sace would sadly miss his friend Mr. Wilbur, 
who had passed on the year before. Their Dahabiyas, the Istar and the Seven Hathors, had been a familiar sight up and down the Nile. Now the Istar would sail alone until it passed beyond the sunset and joined the Seven Hathors where it glided on the broad river of eternity. Mr. Sace's pinched face showed his appreciation when I expressed this poetic sentiment. Poetry again. Let the average reader beware. However, Mrs. Emerson, we are consoled for our loss not only by the knowledge that our friends have simply gone on before us, but by the appearance of new workers in the fields of knowledge. There were certainly several unfamiliar faces. A young man named Davis, whom Mr. Newbury, the botanist who had worked with Petrie at Hawara, introduced as a promising painter of Egyptian scenes. A square-jawed, clean-shaven American named Reisner, who was serving as a member of the International Catalogue Commission of the Cairo Museum. And a Herr Busch, a former student of Ebers at Berlin. Emerson studied them with a predatory gleam in his eye. He was considering them as prospective members of our staff. Another stranger was older and of striking appearance. With golden locks and dark-fringed, brilliant grey eyes any woman might have envied. His features were entirely masculine, however... Indeed, the shape of his jaw was almost too rigidly rectangular. Though a stranger to me, he was not unknown to Emerson, who greeted him with a curt, "'Show your back. This is my wife.' I am accustomed to Emerson's bad manners. I gave the gentleman my hand, which he took in a firm but gentle grasp. "'This is a pleasure to which I have long looked forward, Mrs. Emerson.' Your husband neglected to mention my name. It is Vinci, Leopold Vinci, at your service. You could have had the pleasure earlier if you had chosen to, Emerson grunted, waving me into the chair a waiter was holding. Where have you been since that scandalous business in Anatolia? Hiding out? Our other friends are also accustomed to Emerson's bad manners, but this reference which meant nothing to me, evidently passed even his normal bounds of tactlessness. A shocked gasp ran round the table. Mr. Vincey only smiled, but there was a look of sadness in his grey eyes. Mr. Neville hastened to change the subject. I have just been privileged to see Mr. Walter Emerson's latest transcription from the Hieratic. He has turned the doomed prince into hieroglyphs for Mrs. Emerson. So that is to be your next translation of an Egyptian fairy tale? Newbury asked. You are becoming something of an authority on that subject, Mrs. Emerson. The um, poetic liberties you take with the original text are quite, um, quite... In that manner, I make them more accessible to the general public, I replied. And there is certainly much of interest in such stories. The parallels to European myth and legend are quite remarkable. You know the story, of course, Mr. Vinzi? My attempt to compensate for Emerson's bad manners was understood and appreciated. Mr. Vincey gave me a grateful look and replied, I confess I have forgotten the details, Mrs. Emerson. It would be a pleasure to be reminded of them by you. I would be Scheherazade then and amuse you all, I said playfully. There once was a king who had no son. We all know the story, Emerson interrupted. I would rather ask Mr. Reisner about his studies at Harvard. Later, Emerson. So, the king prayed to the gods and they granted his... It would be senseless to repeat Emerson's interruptions, which broke the smooth narrative I had intended to produce. I will therefore produce it here, for as the reader will discover, it had an unexpected and well-nigh uncanny influence on ensuing events. When the young prince was born, the seven Hathors came to decree his fate. They said, He shall die by the crocodile, the snake, or the dog. Naturally, the king was very sad at hearing this. 
He ordered a stone house to be built and shut the prince up in it, along with everything he could possibly want. But when the prince was older, he went up on the roof one day and saw a man walking along the road with a dog beside him, and he asked that a dog be procured for him. His father, who yearned to please the poor lad, caused a puppy to be given him. After the prince was grown, he demanded his release, saying, If it is my doom, it will come to me, whatever I do. Sadly, his father agreed, and the boy set forth, accompanied by his dog. At last he came to the kingdom of Naharin. The king had only one child, a daughter, and he had placed her in a tower whose window was seventy cubits from the ground, and told all the princes who wanted to marry her that she would be given to the one who first reached her window. Disguised as a chariot driver, the prince of Egypt joined the young men who spent all their days jumping up at the window of the princess, and the princess saw him. When finally he reached the window, she kissed and embraced him. But when the king of Naharin heard that a common chariot driver had won his daughter, he tried first to send the boy away and then to kill him. But the princess clasped the young man in her arms and said, I will not stay alive an hour longer than he. So the lovers were wed, and after some time had elapsed, the prince told his wife about the three fates. Have the dog that follows you killed, she exclaimed. But he replied, I will not allow my dog, which I raised from a puppy, to be killed. So she guarded him day and night, and one night... While he slept, she set out jars of beer and wine, and she waited, and the snake came out of its hole to bite the prince. But it drank the wine and became drunk, and rolled over on its back, and the princess took her axe and chopped it to pieces. "'And that is where it ends,' said Emerson loudly. "'Now, Mr. Reisner, I believe you began in Semitic.' That is not the ending, I said even more loudly. There is a confused passage that seems to suggest that the faithful dog turned on his master, and that in fleeing the dog, he fell into the clutches of the crocodile. The manuscript breaks off at that point, though. It is the mystery of the ending that intrigues you, I suppose, said Mr. Newbury. Was it the crocodile or the dog that brought the prince to his death? I believe he escaped those fates as he did the first, I said. The ancient Egyptians like happy endings, and the brave princess must have played a part in the solution. That is the true explanation for your interest, Mrs. Emerson, said Howard Carter, who had come all the way from Luxor to join the party. The princess is the heroine. And why not? I said, returning his smile. The ancient Egyptians were among the few peoples, ancient or modern, who gave women their due. Not as often as they deserved, of course. At this point, Emerson demanded the floor, and, having had my say, I yielded it. He explained the plans we had discussed earlier. It will take a great deal of money and produce few results, said Reverend Says. The public wants monumental statues and jewels. They are not interested in pottery scraps. But that should not be our concern, declared Howard. He was one of the youngest of the group, and he had not lost his boyish enthusiasm. It is a splendid idea, Professor, exactly what is needed. I don't mean to criticise Monsieur Loray, but you know how he went about locating the tomb last year, don't you? Sondage, pits, dug at random. I know what the word means, Emerson growled, pushing away his plate of soup. It is a disastrous technique. The whole area of the valley needs to be methodically cleared down to bedrock. He reared back as a waiter snatched the empty bowl and deposited the fish course in front of him. There is small hope of that, though, so long as the Antiquities Department keeps control over the valley and gives concessions only to its favourites. What about Maidum? the Reverend Sace suggested. The pyramid has never been completely cleared and there are certainly more mastabas in the cemeteries around it. Or Amana, said Mr. Newbury. You worked there some years ago, I believe. A thrill of emotion ran through me. Pyramids are my passion, as Emerson quaintly puts it. 
But the name of Amarna will always hold a special place in my heart, for it was there Emerson and I came to know and appreciate one another. I glanced meaningfully at my husband. He was looking meaningfully at Mr. Newbury, and I knew from the glint in his eye that he was about to say something provocative. Yes, we did, and I am giving the sight serious consideration. It is of great importance, for it offers clues to one of the most confusing periods in Egyptian history. The archaeological remains have gone to rack and ruin since we left. No one has done a cursed thing now, Emerson. You exaggerate, I said quickly. Mr. Newbury was there, and Mr. Petrie was there for one year. Typical of Petrie. Emerson abandoned his fish. Leaning back in his chair, he prepared to enjoy himself by goading his friends. I believe you also dropped in for a brief visit, Sace. The Reverend Sace was, I am sorry to say, one of Emerson's favourite victims. A pinched, meagre little man, he was regarded by many as an excellent scholar, though he had no formal training and never published anything. This failure would have been enough to inspire Emerson's contempt, and the Reverend's religious convictions, of which Emerson had none, irritated him equally as much. I was with Monsieur Daressy in 91, Sace replied guardedly. When he found the remains of Akhenaten, Emerson's lips stretched into the expression one may see on the face of a dog just before it sinks its teeth into one's hand. I read about that incredible discovery and was surprised that it was not given greater prominence. Did you actually see the mummy? Darissi mentions only scraps of mummy wrappings. There was a body, or the remains of one, Say said wearily. He had seen that smile on Emerson's face before. You examined it, of course, Sace flushed. It was in wretched condition, burned, torn to bits. Very distasteful, Emerson agreed gravely. What became of it? It is in the museum, I suppose. No, it is not. I have examined the journal d'entrée. There is no mention of it. I hope, Professor, you are not implying that my eyesight or my memory are deficient. I saw that, Mummy. I am sure you did. I saw it myself, seven years earlier. Emerson looked at me. He was enjoying himself so much, I hadn't the heart to reproach him. I decided a little friendly teasing would not do the Reverend any harm. We didn't bother looking for the cursed thing, did we, Peabody, after it was stolen from us? The villagers must have dumped it near the royal tomb after taking it apart looking for amulets. No loss. It was only another tedious late mummy, that of some poor commoner. Newbury was trying to hide his smile. We hadn't included the extraneous mummy in our publication report, since it had nothing to do with the history of the site. But many of our friends knew of our strange encounter with it. Carter, less tactful, exclaimed, Good heavens, I'd forgotten about your pervertetic mummy, Professor. Do you think it was the one Daresy found? I am certain of it, Emerson replied calmly. None of the fools who examined it, excuse me, Sace, I do not include you, of course, had the sense to see that it was of the wrong period. No doubt someone pointed this out to Daresy later, and he simply disposed of the embarrassing evidence and kept quiet. I am still of the opinion, Sace began angrily. Well, well, Emerson waved his opinion away. Amana does offer temptations. The royal tomb has never been properly investigated, and there are certainly other tombs in that remote wadi. He took a bite of fish. Mr. Vincey, who had been listening in modest silence, now spoke. I, too, have heard rumours of other tombs, but such rumours are common in Egypt. Have you any evidence? His voice was mild, and the question was certainly reasonable. 
I could not understand why Emerson shot him such a hard look. I don't deal in rumours, Vincy, as you should know. I knew of the royal tomb at least a decade before its official discovery. It was a testimonial to Emerson's reputation that no one expressed doubt of this statement. But Newbury exclaimed with unusual heat, You might have had the courtesy to inform your friends, Emerson. Petrie and I spent hours looking for the confounded place in the winter of 91, and I got myself in hot water when I wrote that letter to the Academy accusing Rabot of falsely claiming credit for discovering the tomb. What's a little hot water when the cause is just? demanded Emerson, who might be said to have spent most of his life up to his neck in boiling liquid. Rabot is the most incompetent, stupid, tactless nincompoop who ever called himself an archaeologist, except for Wallace Budge, of course. I do not announce discoveries until I am in a position to deal with them myself. The depredations of the natives are hard enough on the antiquities. The depredations of archaeologists are even worse. Heaven only knows what meaningful objects were kicked aside by Darisi and Sace when they... Sace began to sputter, and Mr. Reisner said quickly, Then you won't be returning to the Sudan. That region fascinates me. There is so much to be done there. It tempts me, Emerson admitted, but Meroitic culture is not my field. Curse it, I can't be everywhere. I had hoped to avoid mentioning the Sudan, for I knew what would follow. Archaeologists are no more immune to idle curiosity than the next man. A general stiffening of attention ran round the table, but before anyone could frame a question, we were distracted by the arrival of a short, stout individual who swept up to our table with the regal manner of a viceroy, which, in a professional sense, he was. "'Monsieur Maspero!' I exclaimed. "'How delightful! I didn't know you were in Cairo.' "'Only passing through, dear lady. I cannot stay. "'But upon hearing of your arrival, "'I could not deny myself the pleasure of welcoming you back "'to the scene of your many triumphs.' "'Ogling me in his amiable Gallic fashion, he continued.' You have the secret of eternal youth, chère madame. Indeed, you are younger and lovelier than you were that day of our first meeting in the halls of the museum. Little did I know what a momentous day it was. You may not think, gentlemen, that I resemble the little god of love, but I had the honor that day to play Cupid, for it was I who introduced Madame to the gentleman who was to win her heart and hand. With a grandiloquent flourish of his hand, he indicated Emerson, who responded to the amused smiles of the others with a stony stare. He had been extremely critical of Maspero when the latter was director of the Department of Antiquities, but he had detested the latter's successors even more. Now, he said grudgingly, You had better come back to the job, Maspero. The cursed department has fallen apart since you left. Grabeau was a disaster, and de Morgan. Ah, well, we will talk of that another time, said Maspero, who had learned from painful experience that it was necessary to cut Emerson short when he began talking about the failings of the Department of Antiquities. I am in haste. I must go on to another appointment. So, you must tell me at once, madame, what all Cairo aches to know. How fares the interesting young lady who owes you so much? Of all your triumphant adventures, this was surely the most magnificent. She is in excellent health and spirits, I said. How kind of you to inquire, monsieur. No, no, you cannot stop there. "'with conventional courtesy. "'You are too modest, madame. "'I will not allow it. "'We must hear the whole story. "'How you learned of her plight, "'what brilliant deductive methods you applied "'in order to locate her, "'the perils you faced on the dangerous journey.' "'Emerson's expression had petrified "'to such an extent his face might have been carved of granite.' 
The others leaned forward, lips parted and eyes aglow. They would be able to dine out on this story for the rest of the season, since no one had heard it firsthand. I hadn't looked forward to telling the tale to our professional colleagues. Unlike the general public, they had the expert knowledge to find the flaws in our little fiction. However, I had known the moment must come, and I had prepared for it with my usual thoroughness. You do me much credit, monsieur. I had no idea such a person as Miss Forth existed. As you must have heard, we went in search of her cousin, who had become lost in the desert after he set out to look for his uncle and aunt. Like many other rash travellers, they had vanished when the Mahdi overran the Sudan. I paused to take a sip of wine and select my words carefully. Then I resumed. Since the region has been pacified, there have been rumours that some of these people, in fact, survived. It was some such idle rumour that sent Mr. Forthright into the desert? Maspero shook his head. Rush and foolish. It was divine guidance that inspired him. Say said reverently, and led you to the rescue of this innocent child. I could have kicked the kindly old man. A remark like this was bound to break through Emerson's silence, for he particularly dislikes giving God the credit for his own achievements. Unfortunately, I couldn't kick Emerson, since he was seated across the table from me. Divine guidance inspired him to lose himself in the desert, said my husband. Having better sense, we did not rely on... Since I could not administer a warning kick on the shin, I had to find another way of stopping him. I knocked over my wine glass. The heavy damask tablecloth absorbed most of the liquid, but a few drops spattered my brand-new frock. What did you rely on? Carter asked eagerly. If it was not divine guidance, it was pure luck, I said, frowning at Emerson. We had the usual adventures, you know, the sort of thing, gentlemen, sandstorms, thirst, Bedouin attack, nothing to speak of. From displaced persons we met along the way, we heard of the missionaries. They belonged to some strange Protestant sect, like the Brothers of the New Jerusalem. You remember them, Reverend? And finally reached the remote village where they had miraculously survived 14 years of war and misery. Mr. and Mrs. Forth had passed on, but their child lived. We were fortunate enough to be able to restore her to her heritage. The waiter had supplied a fresh glass of wine. I took a hearty swig, feeling I deserved it. So you found no trace of poor Mr. Forthright? Newbury shook his head sadly. A pity. I fear his bones are whitening in some remote spot. I certainly hoped they were. The young villain had done his best to murder us. But did I not hear some story of a map? Mr. Vincey asked. My wine glass almost went over again. I managed to get hold of it. It was Maspero who came to the rescue. Laughing heartily, he said, Willie Forth's famous maps. We have all heard of them, have we not? Even I... Carter said, smiling. And I did not know the gentleman. He is something of a legend in Egypt, though. One of the lunatic fringe always to be found in archaeology, Newbury said disapprovingly. So his fantasies led him not to the city of gold he hoped for, but to a village of miserable mud huts and an early death. Maspero took his leave. For the rest of the evening, the discussion focused on purely archaeological matters. After we had returned to our rooms, Emerson wrenched off his stiff collar. Thank heaven that is over. I won't do it again, Amelia. This suit is as archaic as armour and almost as uncomfortable. The wine had left visible spots on my skirt. I replied gently, You won't have to wear evening kit to a fancy dress ball, my dear. I was thinking of something along Elizabethan lines. Those close-fitting hose would set off the handsome shape of your lower limbs. Emerson had removed his coat. 
For a moment, I thought he would throw it at me. Eyes blazing, he said in a muted roar, We are not going to a fancy dress ball, Amelia. I would as soon attend my own hanging. It is in four days' time. We can find something in the bazaar, I dare say. Please help me with my buttons, Emerson. These spots may come out if I sponge them at once. However, I was unable to tackle the spots that evening. By the time the buttons were undone, I had other things on my mind. Sometime later, as a pleasant drowsiness wrapped around my weary frame, I reflected with pardonable complacency upon the events of the evening. Over the course of the succeeding months, as the story passed from speaker to listener, it would be altered and embroidered beyond recognition. But at least the original fiction had been accepted by those whose opinions counted most. How ironic, I thought, that it was Willoughby Forth's reputation for eccentricity that was primarily responsible for saving his daughter from vulgar gossip and the lost oasis from discovery and exploitation. I was about to remark on this to Emerson when his regular breathing assured me he had fallen into slumber. Turning on my side, I rested my head against his shoulder and emulated his example. I have a methodical mind. Emerson does not. It required prolonged discussion to convince him we ought to sit down with a map of Egypt and make a neat list of prospective sites, instead of rushing around at random. The more I thought about it, the more his plan appealed to me. Although I had enjoyed our vagabond existence, never knowing from one year to the next where we would be the following season, and although no one accepts with greater equanimity the difficulties of setting up a new camp in a new location yearly, often in places where water and shelter were inadequate, insects and disease proliferated, and the chance of snatching a few moments alone with Emerson was slight, especially with Ramsay's always underfoot. Well... Perhaps I hadn't enjoyed it as much as I thought I had. Certainly the idea of a permanent habitation had considerable attraction. I found myself picturing how it would be. Spacious, comfortable living quarters, a photographic studio, an office for the keeping of records, perhaps even a writing machine and a person to operate it. I had mentally selected the pattern of the draperies for the sitting room by the time Emerson, brooding over the map, spoke for the first time. I don't believe we want to go south of Luxor, do we? Unless there is some site between there and Aswan that you yearn for? None that comes to mind. The Theban area offers a number of interesting possibilities, however. We had decided to breakfast in our room, for the sake of greater privacy, and also because Emerson did not want to get dressed to go downstairs. His shirt was open at the throat, and his sleeves had been pushed up to the elbows. The sight of him, lounging at ease, long legs stretched out, a pipe in one hand and a pen in the other, almost distracted me from the matter at hand. Unaware of my affectionate regard, he shoved the map at me. Have a look, Peabody. I have marked my choices. Add or subtract as you like. I think I had better subtract, I said, looking at the emphatic crosses that marked the map. We must narrow the possibilities down to half a dozen or less. Benny Hassan, for instance, would not be my first choice. Emerson groaned feelingly. The tombs have deteriorated badly since I first saw them. They need to be copied. That can be said of almost every site you have marked. So the discussion proceeded. After a refreshing hour or so, we had reduced the list to three. Maidum, Amana... And Western Thebes, and I had agreed to Emerson's suggestion that we inspect the sites before making a final decision. It is still early in the season, he reminded me, and we have not had the leisure to play tourist for several years. I would like to have a look at the tomb Lore found last year. He has left some of the mummies there, bloody fool that he is. Language, Emerson, I said automatically. It would be nice to see the dear old Valley of the Kings again. What do you say we start with, Maidum, since we are in the neighbourhood? Hardly in the neighbourhood, 
Admit it, Peabody. You favour Maidum because there is a pyramid. We must start somewhere. After Maidum, we could... A knock at the door interrupted me. The suffragi entered, carrying a bouquet of flowers. I had already received several floral offerings from our guests of the previous evening. Monsieur Maspero's was the largest and most extravagant. All the vases were in use, so I sent the servant out to find another, while I admired the pretty arrangement of roses and mimosa. "'No red roses?' Emerson inquired with a smile. "'I don't allow you to accept red roses from gentlemen, Peabody.' "'In the language of flowers, red roses signify passionate love. "'It was reassuring to hear him speak jestingly "'of a subject that had once driven him into a jealous rage. "'So I told myself, at any rate. "'They are white,' I replied rather shortly. "'I wonder who... ah, here's a card. "'Mr. Vincy. "'A gentlemanly gesture, upon my word.' I hardly had a chance to speak to him. By the by, Emerson, I've been meaning to ask you, what was the disgraceful business you referred to? The Nimrud treasure. You must have read of it. I do remember seeing newspaper accounts, but that was some years ago, before I took a personal interest in archaeology. The cash was a rich one. Gold and silver vessels, jewellery and the like. It was sold, as I recall, to the Metropolitan Museum. Correct. What the newspapers did not report, because they are well aware of the laws of libel, was that Vinci was suspected of being the agent through whom the museum acquired the collection. He was excavating at Nimrud for Schomburg, the German millionaire. You mean he found the gold and did not report the discovery to his patron or the local authorities? How shocking. Shocking indeed, but not necessarily illegal. The laws regarding the disposition of antiquities and the ownership of buried treasure were even more undefined then than they are today. In any case, nothing could be proved. If Vince did peddle the loot to the Metropolitan, he did it through an intermediary, and the museum was no more anxious than he to explain the transaction. I could see that Emerson was beginning to get restless. He tapped out his pipe, shuffled his feet, and reached again for the map. Nevertheless, I persisted. Then that is why I'm not familiar with Mr. Vince's archaeological career. The mere suspicion of such dishonesty ended that career, Emerson finished. No one would employ him again. It was a promising career, too. He began in Egyptology... Did good work at Komombo and Dendera. There was some talk, but why are we sitting here gossiping like a pair of old ladies? Get dressed and let us go out. He rose, stretching. The movement displayed his form to best advantage. The breadth of his chest and shoulders, the lean, sinewy shape of the lower portion of his frame. I suspected he had done it to distract me, for Emerson is well aware of my appreciation of the aesthetic qualities of his person. I persisted, however, inquiring, Were you by any chance the one who brought his malfeasance to light? I certainly not. In fact, I came to his defence, pointing out that other excavators, including certain officials of the British Museum, were equally unscrupulous in their methods of obtaining antiquities. My Emerson, what a specious argument. I'm surprised at you. The treasure was better off at the Metropolitan than in some private collection. An even less tenable argument. Emerson started for the bedroom. It was his little way of indicating he did not care to discuss the subject further. I had, however, one more question. Why did you bring up the subject in that rude way? The others were willing to let the past be forgotten. Emerson whirled, his manly countenance aglow with honest indignation. I, rude, you know nothing about the traditions of masculine conversation, Peabody. That was just a friendly jest. The succeeding days were very pleasant. It had been a long time since we had had the leisure to wander round Cairo renewing old acquaintances, to linger in the coffee shops, fardling with grave scholars from the university, and to explore the bookshops in the bazaar. 
We spent an evening with our old friend Sheikh Mohammed Basur and ate far too much. Not to have stuffed ourselves would have been a grievous breach of good manners, even though I knew I would have to put up with Emerson snoring all night as a result. He always snores when he has taken too much to eat. The Sheikh was disappointed to learn that Ramses was not with us and shook his head disapprovingly when I explained that the boy had remained in England to pursue his education. What useful matters can he learn there? You should let him come to me, Sitakim. I will teach him to ride and shoot and govern the hearts of men. Monsieur Loret, the director of the Department of Antiquities, was in Luxor, so we were unable to call on him as was proper. But we spent time with other colleagues, bringing ourselves up to date on the current state of archaeological excavation and the availability of trained personnel. One day, we lunched with the Reverend Sace on his dehabiyeh in order to meet a student of whom he had great hopes. The Ishtar was not nearly so fine a boat as the Philae, my own beloved dehabiyeh, but it recalled poignant memories of that never-to-be-forgotten voyage. I could not restrain a sigh when we took our leave, and Emerson glanced questioningly at me. Why so pensive, Peabody? Were you not impressed with Mr. Jackson's qualifications? He seems intelligent and well-trained. I was thinking of the past, my dear Emerson. Do you remember? Oh, your dahabir. They are picturesque but impractical. We can reach Luxor by rail in sixteen and a half hours. Shall we go to Maidum tomorrow? The nearest station is Rika. We can hire donkeys there. He went on chatting, seemingly unaware of my failure to respond. As we went along the corridor toward our rooms, I began to hear the sounds of what resembled a miniature war. Shouts, crashes, thuds. The door to our sitting room stood open. It was from this chamber that the noises came, and my astonished gaze fell upon a scene of utter confusion. Striped galabias billowed like sails in a storm as their wearers darted to and fro. Cries and fulsome Arabic curses reverberated. An even more fulsomely profane shout from Emerson, whose powers along those lines exceed any I have ever heard, rose over the uproar and stilled it. The men stood still, panting. I recognised our suffragi, who had evidently recruited several friends to assist him in whatever endeavour he was pursuing. As their robes fell into place, I saw the object of that endeavour. It had alighted on the back of the sofa where it stood at bay, fur bristling and tail lashing. For a moment a sensation of superstitious terror came over me, as if I beheld a supernatural emissary announcing disaster to one I loved. If the demonic black dog appeared to herald the death of a member of some noble families, what more appropriate bane of the Emersons could there be than a large, brindled Egyptian cat? Bastard! I cried. Oh, Emerson, don't be absurd, Peabody. Emerson, wise in the ways of cats, cautiously circled around the animal. Its head swivelled to follow his movements, and I saw its eyes. They were not golden like those of our cat Bastet, but a clear pale green, the colour of peridots. For one thing, Emerson went on, Bastet is at Chalfant with Ramses. For another, nice kitty then, good kitty. He bent down and squinted at the posterior of the feline. It is a male cat. Very definitely male. It was also bigger and darker in colour. Nor did its countenance exhibit the benevolence of bastards. I have seldom seen a more calculating look in the eyes of any mammal, human or otherwise. Where did it come from? I asked, and then repeated the question in Arabic. The suffragi held out his hands in appeal. They were bleeding from several deep scratches. The cat must have come in through the window. He had found it there when he entered to deliver a parcel and had tried in vain to evict it. So, you enlisted an army of heavy-footed friends to help you. 
I said caustically, looking from the smashed vases and scattered flowers to the shredded curtains. Go away, all of you. You are only frightening the poor creature. The wounded Safraji returned the animal stare with one almost as malignant. I must say it didn't look frightened. I was about to advance upon it. Emerson, I noticed, had prudently retreated. When the Safraji glanced at the open door and exclaimed, "'We have found him, Effendi. He is here.' "'So I see,' said Mr. Vincey. "'He shook his head. "'Bad cat. Naughty Anubis.' "'I turned. "'Good afternoon, Mr. Vincey. "'This is your cat?' "'His face, so melancholy in repose, brightened in a smile.' He wore a well-cut afternoon suit, which became his trim form very well. But I noticed that, though neatly brushed and pressed, the once expensive fabric was sadly worn. My friend, my companion, he said gently. But, oh dear, I see he has been very naughty indeed. Is he responsible for this chaos? It was not his fault, I replied, approaching the animal. Any creature, when pursued... Mr. Vincey's cry of warning came too late. I withdrew my hand, which was now marked by a row of bleeding scratches. Forgive me, my dear Mrs. Emerson, Vincey exclaimed. He passed me and scooped the creature into his arms. It settled down and began to purr in a deep baritone. Anubis is what one might call a one-person cat. I hope he didn't hurt you. What an asinine question, commented Emerson. Here, Peabody, take my handkerchief. Wait a moment. It was here, in my pocket. It was not in his pocket. It hardly ever was. I took the one Mr. Vincey offered me and wrapped it around my hand. It is not the first time I have been scratched, I said with a smile. No hard feelings, Mr. Vincey. And Anubis. Let me introduce you. Vincey proceeded to do so, addressing the cat as seriously as he would have done a human being. This is Mrs. Emerson, Anubis. She is my friend, and she must be yours. Let him sniff your fingers, Mrs. Emerson. There. Now you may stroke his head. Somewhat amused at the absurdity of the business, I did as he asked, and was rewarded by a renewal of the deep purr. It sounded so much like Emerson's softer tones, I couldn't help glancing in his direction. He was not amused. Now that that is settled, you will please excuse us, Vincey. We have just got back and want to change. Another example of masculine repartee, I assumed. I would have called it rudeness. I am very sorry. "'Mr. Vincey exclaimed. "'I came in the hope that you would take tea with me. "'I was waiting for you on the terrace "'when Anubis slipped his lead "'and I had to go in search of him. "'That is how it all came about. "'But if you have another engagement... "'I would be delighted to join you for tea,' I said. "'Mr. Vincey's sad grey eyes lit up. "'They were most expressive optics. "'Please yourself,' Emerson grunted. I have other things to do. Good day, Vincey. He opened the bedroom door and let out a profane exclamation. The exclamation, though not the profanity, was echoed by Mr. Vincey. Oh, dear. Was Anubis in that room as well? It appears he was, I replied, studying the crumpled linens and scattered papers with some chagrin. Never mind, Mr. Vincey. The Safraji and his friends did more damage than Anubis, I expect. They will curse it, shouted Emerson. He slammed the door. I gathered up my handbag and my parasol, and after directing the Safraji to tidy the rooms, I preceded Mr. Vincey into the hall. I need not apologise for my husband, I believe, I said. You know his brusque manner conceals a heart of gold. Oh, I know Emerson very well was the laughing reply. To be honest, Mrs. Emerson, I am pleased to have you to myself. I have... I have a favour to ask. 
I had a premonition of what that favour might be, but like the gentleman he was, Mr. Vincey waited to propose it until after we had found a table on the famous terrace and the waiter had taken our order. We sat in silence for a time, enjoying the balmy afternoon air and watching the picturesque procession of Egyptian life passing along the street. Carriages let off passengers and picked up others. Water carriers and vendors crowded around the steps. The tables were almost filled with ladies in light summer gowns and big hats, gentlemen in afternoon garb and the usual sprinkling of officers. From his pocket, Vincy had produced a lead and collar and fastened it on the cat. It submitted to this indignity more gracefully than its conduct had led me to expect, and squatted at its master's feet like a dog. I found Mr. Vincey a pleasant companion. Our mutual affection for the feline species provided a useful introductory topic of conversation. I told him of the cat Bastet, and he replied with accounts of Anubis's intelligence, loyalty, and courage. For a good many years... He has been not only my friend, but my best friend, Mrs. Emerson. People talk of the selfishness of cats, but I have not found human friends so loyal. I recognized this statement for what it was intended to be, a tentative reference to his unhappy history. But naturally I was too well bred to indicate I knew of that history. I replied with a sympathetic murmur, and a look that invited further confidences. A flush mantled his cheekbones. You must have guessed what I am about to ask, Mrs. Emerson. Your kindness and sympathy are well known. I had hoped... I am in need... I beg your pardon. It is difficult for me to sue for favours. I have not lost all my pride... "'Pray feel no self-consciousness, Mr. Vincey,' I replied warmly. "'Misfortune may come even to the worthy. "'There is no cause for shame in seeking honest employment.' "'How eloquently, and with what exquisite tact you express yourself,' Vincey exclaimed. "'I thought I saw a glimmer as of tears in his eyes. "'I looked away until he could conquer his emotion. "'It was as I had supposed.' Hearing of our plans for an enlarged permanent staff, he was seeking employment. Once the difficulty of this admission was over, he proceeded to recite his qualifications. They were impressive. Ten years of excavation, fluent Arabic, familiarity with the hieroglyphs, a good, sound, classical education. There is only one difficulty, he concluded, with a smile that showed even white teeth. Whither I go... Anubis goes. I could not abandon him. I would think less of you if you did, I assured him. That is not a difficulty, Mr. Vincey. You understand I cannot promise anything yet. Our plans are still in the process of being formulated. However, I will speak to Emerson, and, without wishing in any way to hold out false hopes, I have every reason to believe he will be favourably inclined to your offer. I cannot thank you enough. His voice broke. That is the truth, Mrs. Emerson. You have no idea... Enough said, Mr. Vincey. Touched by his sincerity, respecting his dignity, I pretended to glance at my watch. Dear me, it is getting late. I must hurry and change. Are you coming to the ball? I hadn't intended to. But if you will be there... Yes, indeed. I look forward to it. What costume are you wearing? Ah, that is the secret. I replied gaily. We are all to be masked and in disguise. Half the fun will be trying to recognise one's friends. I can't believe you have persuaded Emerson to attend, Vincy said. He used to roar like a chained bear at the very prospect of a social engagement. How you have civilised him. He roared a bit, I admitted, laughing. But I have found the perfect costume for him, one he cannot object to assuming. An ancient pharaoh. Relieved of his embarrassment, Vinci was ready to enter into the spirit of the thing. He would be a perfect Thutmose III, the great warrior king. 
Now, really, Mr. Vincey, can you picture Emerson appearing in public, attired only in a short kilt and a beaded collar? He is a modest man. Anyhow, Thutmose was only a few inches over five feet in height. He would look magnificent in armour. Suits of armour are not so easily come by in the bazaar. You won't trap me so easily, Mr. Vincey. I must be off now. And I, if I am to find some fancy dress of my own. He took the hand I had offered him, with a rueful look at the makeshift bandage around it. He raised it, bandage and all, to his lips. Emerson claimed he had forgotten about the fancy dress ball. Then he claimed he had never agreed to attend. After being driven back from both these positions, he retreated to a third line of defence, objecting to my ensemble. It began, If you think I am going to allow my wife to appear in such a costume, and ended, I wash my hands of the whole affair. Do as you like. You always do. In fact, I was rather pleased with my choice. I had dismissed the idea of some version of ancient Egyptian dress. There would be dozens of inappropriate variations of that by ladies who hoped to conjure up the seductive image of Cleopatra, the only queen known to the idle tourist. I had considered Boadicea, or some other prominent defender of women's rights, but it was not so easy to put together a costume in the limited time at my disposal. What I wore was not fancy dress. It would appear as such to the conventional travellers at Shepherds, however, for I had determined to take the last bold stride in my campaign of suitable working attire for archaeologically disposed ladies. My first experiences in Egypt, pursuing mummies and climbing up and down cliffs, had convinced me that trailing skirts and tight corsets were a confounded nuisance in that ambiance. For many years, my working costume had consisted of pith helmet and shirt waist, boots and Turkish trousers or bloomers. They had caused consternation enough when I first appeared in them, but eventually ladies adopted divided skirts and full trousers for sporting activities. They were a good deal more convenient than skirts, but they had certain disadvantages. On one memorable occasion, I had been unable to defend myself from attack because I could not locate my pocket and the revolver in it, among the voluminous folds of fabric. I had always envied gentlemen the abundance and accessibility of their pockets. My belt of tools, knife, waterproof container for matches and candles, canteen, notebook and pencil, among other useful objects, substituted for pockets to some extent, but the noise they made clashing together made it difficult for me to creep up on suspects unnoticed and the sharp edges on a number of them impeded the impetuous embraces to which Emerson is prone. I did not intend to abandon my chatelaine, as I jestingly called it, but pockets, large pockets, and many of them would allow me to carry even more essentials with me. The costume my dressmaker had produced, under my direction, was almost identical with the shooting suits gentlemen had been wearing for some years. There were pockets everywhere, inside the jacket and on its upper portion, and all over the skirts or tails of the said jacket. This object of apparel covered the torso and the adjoining area of the lower limbs. Beneath it were knickerbockers cut like a man's, except for being somewhat fuller in the upper part, of a matching fabric. They were tucked into stout laced boots, and when I had clapped a pith helmet on my head and put my hair up under it, I felt I was the very picture of a young gentleman explorer. Arms folded and head on one side, Emerson watched me assume this garb with an expression that left me in some doubt as to his reaction. The occasional quiver of his lips might have been amusement or repressed outrage. Pirouetting in front of the mirror, I addressed him over my shoulder. Well, what do you think? Emerson's lips parted. You need a moustache. I have one. I produced it from the lower left-hand pocket of the jacket and pressed it into place. It was a red moustache. I had been unable to find a black one. After Emerson had got himself under control, I asked him to study the effect again and give me his serious opinion. At his request, I removed the moustache. He claimed that appendage rendered serious consideration impossible. After circling me two or three times, he nodded. You don't make a very convincing young gentleman, Peabody. However, 
the outfit rather becomes you. You might consider wearing it on the dig. It would be much more convenient than those cursed bloomers. They have so many yards of cloth in them, it takes me forever to... There is no time for that, Emerson, I said, gliding away from the hand he had extended in order to make his point. Your costume is hanging in the wardrobe. With a dramatic flourish, I flung the wardrobe door open. A number of establishments in the souk sold various versions of native Egyptian robes, for they were popular with tourists. I had to search for some time before I found an ensemble that was not only completely authentic, but particularly suitable to Emerson's tall frame and individualistic character. Though he denies it, he has a secret penchant for disguises and a certain taste for the theatrical. I fancied this costume would appeal to him for the embroidered jibber and woven kaftan, the gold-trimmed hazam and loose trousers, might have been worn by a prince of the Tuareg, those extremely virile and violent desert raiders who are known to their despairing victims as the Forgotten of God. They are also called the Veiled Ones, because of the blue veils that provide protection against heat and blowing sand. It was this feature that had determined me to select the costume, for it would serve in lieu of a mask, which I felt sure Emerson would not consent to wear. The headdress, called a kafir, was a square of cloth bound in place by a rope. It framed the face becomingly, and, with the veil, would leave only his eyes exposed. Emerson studied it in silence. "'We will go well together,' I said cheerfully. My trousers and your skirts? The ballroom was decorated in the style of Louis XVI and featured a superb chandelier whose thousands of crystals reflected the lights in a dazzling shimmer. The brilliant and fantastical garb of the guests filled the room with colour. There were plenty of ancient Egyptians present, but some of the guests had been more inventive. I saw a Japanese samurai and a bishop of the Eastern Church, complete with mitre. My own dress provoked considerable comment, however. I had no lack of partners, and as I circled the floor in the respectful grasp of one gentleman or another, I was delighted at how neatly I could perform the vigorous steps of polkas and schottishes. Emerson does not dance. From time to time, I would catch a glimpse of him wandering around the perimeter of the room, or talking to someone who shared his disinterest in Terpsichorean exercise. Then I saw him no more, and concluded he had got bored and gone off in search of more congenial company. I was sitting in one of the little alcoves screened by potted plants, recuperating from my exertions, and chatting with Lady Norton, when he appeared again. "'Ah, my dear, there you are,' I said, glancing over my shoulder at the tall, veiled form. "'Permit me to present you to—' "'I was permitted to say no more. "'Arms like steel snatched me up out of my chair, "'stifled, breathless, enveloped in folds of billowing cloth. "'I was carried rapidly away. "'I heard a shriek from Lady Norton "'and exclamations of surprise and amusement from the other guests.' for my abductor's path led him straight across the ballroom toward the door. I was not amused. Emerson was not the man to play such a silly trick, and I had known, the moment the person touched me, that the grasp was not that of my spouse. He felt me stiffen, heard the sharp intake of my breath. Without slackening his pace, he shifted his hold in such a fashion that my face was crushed against his breast and my cry was muffled by folds of fabric. Astonishment and incredulity weakened my limbs. I could not believe what was happening. Could a person be abducted out of Shepherd's Hotel under the very noses of hundreds of watchers? The attempt might have succeeded by its very audacity. What else could the audience assume but that my notoriously eccentric spouse had entered into the spirit of the mask and was playing the role his costume had inspired? I heard one idiotic woman shriek, "'How romantic!' My struggles were taken for part of the charade, and they weakened as I grew faint from lack of oxygen. Then a voice rang out, a voice famous throughout the length of Egypt for its resonance and audibility. 
It reassured. It inspired me. My strength returned. My struggles were renewed. The grip that held me loosened. I felt myself flying through the air, reached out, groping and blinded, braced myself for the impact I knew must follow, and struck a solid but yielding surface with a force that drove the last of the straining breath from my lungs. I clutched at it. It recoiled from me with a grunt of effort and then, recovering, caught and held me. I opened my eyes. I hadn't needed to see him to know whose arms enclosed me. But the sight of the beloved face, crimson with collar, eyes blazing like sapphires, left me too weak to speak. Emerson drew a deep, shuddering breath. Damnation, he roared. Can't I leave you alone for five minutes, Peabody? Chapter Four no woman really wants a man to carry her off. She only wants him to want to do it. Why didn't you pursue the fellow? I demanded. Emerson kicked the bedroom door shut and dropped me unceremoniously onto the bed. He had carried me straight upstairs and he was breathing rather heavily. Our rooms were on the third floor, but I fancied it was exasperation rather than exertion that had quickened his breath. The tone in which he replied further strengthened this theory. Don't ask stupid questions, Peabody. He threw you straight at me, like a bundle of laundry. Would you rather I had let you fall to the floor? Even if I had been so cold-blooded, I reacted instinctively, and by the time I had recovered myself, he was long gone. I sat up and began to straighten my dishevelled hair. Somewhere along the way, I had lost my pith helmet. I reminded myself to search for it the next day. It was a new one, and very expensive. The implied reproach was unfair, Emerson. I apologise. It would take him only a minute to achieve anonymity by divesting himself of his robes. They were not an exact copy of yours, but they were close enough. Confounded fancy dress! Emerson had divested himself of his robe... He tossed it into a corner and plucked the headdress from his head. I let out a cry. Was that blood on your face? Come here and let me see. After some masculine grumbling, he consented to let me have a look. He likes being fussed over, but refuses to admit it. There was only a small trace of blood on his temple, but it marked a tender spot that would no doubt blossom into a purple bruise before morning. What the devil have you been up to? I asked. Emerson stretched out on the bed. I had a little adventure of my own. You don't suppose it was divine guidance that brought me to your rescue in the traditional nick of time, do you? I could believe in divine guidance, my dear. Are you not always at my side when danger threatens? Leaning over him, I pressed my lips to the wound. Ouch, said Emerson. What happened? I had gone out for a smoke and some intelligent conversation, Emerson explained. Out of the hotel? No one in the hotel, saving your presence, my dear, is capable of intelligent conversation. I thought Abdul or Ali might be hanging about. As I strolled innocently through the gardens, three men jumped me. Three? Was that all? Emerson frowned. It was rather odd, he said. The fellows were, I believe, ordinary Kyrene thugs. If they had intended to murder me, they might have done some damage, for, as you know, they all carry knives. They never use them, only their bare hands. Bare hands did not inflict this wound, I said, indicating his temple. One of them had a club. The confounded headdress was of some use. It deflected the blow. I became a trifle annoyed then, and after I had disposed of two of them, the third fled. I would have questioned them, but it occurred to me that you might be in similar straits, and that I had better see what you were up to. I got up and went to look for my medical kit. Why should you suppose that? Your enemies are not necessarily mine. And I must say, Emerson, that over the years you have attracted quite a number of... Where the devil did I put that box of bandages? The suffrage has mixed up the luggage. Nothing is where I left it. Emerson sat up. 
What makes you think it was the suffrage? I finally found the medicine box. It was in the original container, but not in the original place. Emerson, who had been searching his own luggage, straightened. Nothing appears to have been taken. I nodded agreement. He was holding an article I had not seen before. A long, narrow box of heavy cardboard. Has something been added? Be careful opening it, Emerson. No, this is my property. Ours, I should say. He removed the lid, and I saw a glitter of gold and a rich azure glow. Good heavens, I cried. It is the regalia Neferet carried away with her from the Holy Mountain. The royal scepters. Why did you bring them? One scepter was shaped like a shepherd's crook, symbolizing the care of the king for his people. The materials were gold and lapis lazuli in alternating rings. The other object consisted of a short staff made of gold foil and dark blue glass over a bronze core, from which depended three flexible thongs of the same materials, gold beads alternating with blue and ending in cylindrical rods of solid gold. The flail represented, as I have always believed, the other aspect of rule, power and domination. It certainly would have inflicted a painful blow if it had been made of more durable materials, as the original whip undoubtedly was. No such objects had ever been found in Egypt, though they were known from countless paintings and reliefs. We agreed, did we not, said Emerson, that it would be un. Conscionable to keep these remarkable objects from scholars. They are unique, and they are two thousand years old if they are a day. Treasured relics. They belong not to us, but to the world. Well, yes, we did agree in theory, and I am of the same mind still. But we cannot display them without explaining where we found them. Precisely. We will find them this season. I caught my breath. It is an ingenious idea, Emerson. Brilliant, even. No one is better able than you to arrange a convincing, if misleading, ambiance. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin and looked a trifle uncomfortable. Dishonesty goes against the grain, Peabody. I confess it. But what else are we to do? Thebes seems the most likely place for such a... Uh, discovery. The Kushite conquerors of the 26th dynasty remained there for some time. We must account in some way for the information about ancient Meroitic culture we acquired last winter. Sooner or later, one of us, or Walter, will let something slip. It is not humanly possible to write about the subject without displaying information we ought not to have. I agree. In fact, the article you sent to the Zeitschrift in June... Devil take it, Peabody! I said nothing revealing in that article. In any case, I said soothingly, it will not be published for some time. These scholarly journals are always behind schedule, Emerson agreed. So you are thinking along the same lines, Peabody? What lines? I began rummaging in my box of medical supplies. I am surprised at you, Peabody. Usually you are the first to find portents of danger all round. And although I admit there are a number of individuals who have reason to dislike us, recent incidents are beginning to suggest quite a different theory. He sat down on the edge of the bed. I brushed the hair from his brow and applied antiseptic to his wound. Absorbed in his theory... He ignored attentions he was not ordinarily willing to receive without complaint. Our luggage appears to have been searched. Theft was not the object. Nothing was taken. Tonight we were both attacked. Murder was not the object. We must assume, I think, that abduction of one or both of us was. For what purpose? Some of our old enemies may want to carry us off and watch gloatingly while hideous tortures are inflicted upon us. I suggested. Always cheerful, Peabody, Emerson said, grinning. What are you doing? I won't have any confounded bandages. I cut off a bit of sticking plaster. 
Out with it, Emerson. You are beating around the bush. Not at all. I am simply admitting that the evidence is inconclusive. It is suggestive, though, don't you think? I think this time it is your imagination that has got out of hand. I sat down next to him. Unless you know something you haven't told me. I don't know anything, Emerson said irritably. If I did, I would not be dithering like a nervous old spinster. All the same. We covered our tracks as well as we could, Peabody. But there are several weak spots in the fictional fabric we wove. A good hard shove at any one of them would leave a gaping hole of speculation. Are you by any chance referring to the Church of the Saints of the Son of God as a weak spot? Curse it, Emerson. I had to invent a religious sect. If we had claimed Neferet's kindly foster parents were Baptists or Lutherans or Roman Catholics, the most cursory inquiry would prove no such family existed. Especially if you had claimed they were Roman Catholics, Emerson said. Seeing my expression, he added hastily, It was very clever of you, my dear. Don't patronise me, Emerson. I cannot imagine what has got you into this morbid state of mind. The story I... we invented is no more unbelievable than many true. I do wish you would stop mumbling under your breath. It's very rude. Speak up. Map, said Emerson. Will it be fourths, Maps? You heard how Maspero and the others laughed at them the other night. The map, said Emerson loudly, that Reginald Forthright showed to half the blood... Blooming officers at Sanam Abu Dom. Everyone from General Rundle to the lowest subaltern knew when he went after his uncle that we had more to go on than vague rumours. He never came back, but we did, with Forth's daughter. How long do you suppose it will take some inventive journalist to concoct a thrilling scenario out of those facts? I'm only surprised your friend O'Connell hasn't already done so. His imagination is almost as rampageous as... The implication is insulting and undeserved, especially coming from you. I've never heard such... You are muttering again, Emerson. What did you say? With a shrug and a smile, Emerson turned and answered. Not the question, but the underlying emotion that had prompted it. And my other... I admit, unfair accusations. A soft answer turneth away wrath, as the scripture says. But Emerson's methods were even more efficacious. I had hoped to spend the rest of the week in Cairo enjoying the amenities of the hotel. But Emerson suddenly took it into his head to visit Maidum. I had no objection, though I wished he had given me a little more notice. We had spent the morning in the souk. After lunching at the hotel, Emerson left me reading and resting while he went off on some errand of his own. Upon his return, he calmly announced we would take the evening train. So hurry up and get your gear together, Peabody. I dropped my copy of Ehrman's Egyptische Grammatique. What gear? There is no hotel at Rika. Emerson began... I have a friend. I will not stay with any of your Egyptian friends. They are delightful people, but they have no notion of sanitation. I thought you might feel that way. I have prepared a little surprise for you, Peabody. What has happened to your sense of adventure? I was unable to resist the challenge. Or Emerson smile. As I packed a small bag with changes of clothing and toilet articles, my spirits began to soar. This was like the old days. Emerson and I, alone together in the wilderness. Once we had fought our way through the confusion at the railroad station and found seats on the train, Emerson relaxed. But none of my attempts at conversation seemed to please him. I hope that poor fellow who collapsed in the souk will be all right, was my first attempt. You should have let me examine him, Emerson. His um, friends were there to attend to him, Emerson said shortly. After a while, I tried again. Our friends will be surprised to find we have gone. It was good of so many of them to come round this morning to express their concern. Emerson grunted. 
I am inclined to believe Mr. Neville's theory was the right one, I went on. How amusingly he put it. Some young fellow flushed with wine and inspired by your charms, Mrs. E, playing a silly trick. And my charms inspired the attention of the three young fellows in the garden, said Emerson, with ineffable sarcasm. The timing of the two events may have been pure coincidence. Pure balderdash, growled Emerson. Peabody, why do you insist on discussing our private affairs in public? The only other occupants of the carriage were a group of German university students who were carrying on a loud conversation in their own language, but I took the hint. By the time we reached Rika, my enthusiasm had dimmed somewhat. Darkness was complete, and we were the only non-Egyptians to disembark there. I stumbled over a stone, and Emerson, whose spirits had improved in inverse ratio to the lowering of mine, caught my arm. There he is! Hi, Abdullah! I should have known, I muttered, seeing the white shape that hovered ghost-like at the end of the small platform. Quite, said Emerson cheerfully. We can always count on good old Abdullah, eh? I sent a message to him this afternoon. After the appropriate greetings had been exchanged, not only with Abdullah, but with his sons, Faisal and Selim, and his nephew, Daoud, we mounted the donkeys they had waiting and set out. How the devil the donkeys saw where they were going, I do not know. I certainly could not, even after the moon rose, for it was on the wane and gave little light. The gait of some donkeys is very uneasy when they break into a trot. I got the distinct impression these donkeys did not like being out at that hour. After a hideously uncomfortable ride across the cultivated fields, I saw the light of a fire ahead on the edge of the desert. Two more of our men were waiting for us. The little camp they had set up was better than Abdullah's usual efforts along those lines. I was relieved to see that there was a proper tent for us, and the welcome aroma of fresh-brewed coffee reached my nostrils. Emerson lifted me off my donkey. Do you remember, I once threatened to snatch you up and carry you off into the desert. I looked from Abdullah to Faisal, to Daoud, to Selim, to Mahmoud, to Ali, to Mohammed. They stood round us in an interested circle, their faces beaming. You are such a romantic, Emerson, I said. However, when I emerged from the tent the following morning, I was in a better humour, and the scene before me roused the old thrill of archaeological fever. Midum is one of the most attractive sites in Egypt. The remains of the cemetery are situated on the edge of the low bluff that marks the beginning of the desert. Toward the east, the emerald carpet of the cultivated land stretched out toward the river whose waters were stained rosy pink by the rays of the rising sun. On the bluff, rising high against the sky, was the pyramid. Though I must confess it does not look much like one. The Egyptians call it El Haram El Kadab, the false pyramid, for it more resembles a square tower of three diminishing stages. Once there were seven stages, like those of a step pyramid, the angles between them had been filled in with stone to give a smooth slope, but these filling stones and the upper stages had long since collapsed, forming a frame of detritus all around the giant tomb. Like the pyramids of Dashur and Giza, it was uninscribed. I have never understood why the kings who went to so much trouble to erect these grandiose structures did not bother to put their names on them for humility was not a notable characteristic of Egyptian pharaohs. It is also uncharacteristic of tourists, ancient or modern. As soon as the great art of writing was invented, certain individuals made use of it to deface monuments and works of art. Three thousand years before our time, an Egyptian tourist came to Medum to visit the beautiful temple of King Sneferu, and left an inscription, or graffito, to that effect on one of the walls of the temple. Sneferu was known to have had two such tombs. 
we had worked at one of them, the North Pyramid of Dashur. Petrie, who had discovered the graffito in question, decided that this must be Sneferu's second pyramid. Bah, said Emerson, one graffito does not constitute proof of ownership. The temple was already a thousand years old when the confounded scribbler visited it. The guides of that remote era were probably as ignorant as those of the present day. Sneferu's two pyramids are the ones at Dashur. When Emerson speaks in that dogmatic tone, few care to contradict him. I am one of those few. But since I agreed with his views, I did not do so on that occasion. For the next two days, we busied ourselves with the private tombs. There were several groups of them north, south and west of the pyramid. For the cultivated land eastward was, of course, unsuitable for tombs. We had ample help. I had never really expected to be alone with Emerson. The presence of strangers always attracts local villagers demanding bakshish or asking for work or simply satisfying their curiosity. They began wandering in while we were at breakfast the first day, and after interviewing them, Emerson set some to work under Abdullah's direction. I always say that if one cannot have a pyramid, a nice deep tomb is the next best thing. All the pyramids had cemeteries round them, tombs of courtiers and princes, nobles and high officials, who were given the privilege of spending eternity in proximity to the god-king they had served in life. These old kingdom tombs were called mastabas, because the superstructure resembled the flat-topped, sloping-sided benches found outside modern Egyptian houses. The superstructures, built of stone or mud brick, had often disappeared or collapsed into shapeless mounds, but they were not the parts that interested me. Under the mastabas were shafts and stairs descending deep into the rock beneath and culminating in the burial chamber. Some of the richer tombs had substructures almost as delightfully dark, tortuous and bat-ridden as those of the pyramids. Emerson very kindly allowed me to go into one such tomb, because he knew I would do it anyway. The steeply sloping entrance ramp was littered with debris and only four feet high. It ended in a shaft, which I was obliged to descend by means of a rope held by Selim, who, at Emerson's insistence, had followed me down. I usually employed Selim for such work, since he was the youngest and slimmest of the trained men. One was always encountering holes through which a larger body could not easily pass, and, of course, the low ceilings presented a difficulty for taller individuals. Emerson was not particularly fond of tombs like these. He kept banging his head and getting stuck in holes. But I must not allow my enthusiasm to lead me to a more detailed description, which might bore my duller readers, and which is not really relevant to the tale I am telling. Suffice it to say that when I emerged gasping for breath... The air in the lowest portions of such tombs is extremely hot and very close, and covered with a sort of paste compounded of perspiration, stone dust and bat droppings, I could hardly contain my appreciation. It was delightful, Emerson. To be sure, the war paintings are of poor quality, but I saw scraps of wood and linen wrappings among the debris in the burial chamber. I'm sure we ought... Emerson had been waiting at the entrance to pull me out. Having done so, he hastily backed away, wrinkling his nose. Not now, Peabody. This was intended to be a survey. We haven't the manpower or the time to excavate. Why don't you amuse yourself with the pyramid? So I did. It was quite a nice pyramid in its own way, though the passageways were not so extensive or interesting as the ones in the Giza and Ashur monuments. Like them, it had been opened by earlier explorers who found it had been completely looted in antiquity. On the afternoon of the second day came a further addition to what had now become something of a small mob, a pair of what Emerson refers to as cursed tourists. He unbent a trifle, however, when one of them introduced himself as Herr Eberfeld, a German scholar with whom Emerson had corresponded. He was a virtual caricature of a Prussian, monocled, stiff as a board, and very formal in his manner. Herr Schmidt... The young fellow with him was one of his students, a plump, pleasant chap 
who would have been quite handsome had it not been for the ugly dueling scar that disfigured one cheek. German students take great pride in these scars, which they consider evidences of courage rather than of stupidity, which in fact they are. I am told the students even employ various painful and unsanitary methods of preventing the wounds from healing, so that the scars will be as conspicuous as possible. Herr Schmidt's manners were as faultless as his face was not. He addressed me in broken but delightful English, and appeared more than ready to accept the cup of tea I offered. However, Emerson insisted on showing them around the site, and the young man obediently followed his superior. I had finished my tea and was about to go after them, when one of the workmen sidled up, glancing shyly at me from under his thick lashes. Like the other men, he had stripped off his robe while working and was attired only in a wrapped loincloth. His sleek, smooth body shone with perspiration. "'I have found the tomb, honoured Zit,' he whispered. "'Will you come before the others find it and claim a share of the bakshish?' I looked around. Emerson must have taken the visitors into the pyramid. They were nowhere in sight. Daoud was directing a group of workers who were investigating the tombs next to the causeway that led from the pyramid to the river. "'Where is it?' I asked. "'Not far, honoured Sit, near the tomb of the geese.' He was referring to one of the most famous tombs of Medum, from which had come the lovely painting now in the Cairo Museum. It was located in the Mastaba field almost due north of the pyramid. A crew under Abdullah was at work in the area, searching for other tomb entrances. This man must be part of that crew. His surreptitious manner and look of suppressed excitement suggested that he had come on something remarkable enough to merit a sizable reward. Naturally, he didn't want to share it with the others. Anticipation thrilled through my limbs as I pictured marvels equaling the geese or even the life-sized painted statues of a noble couple that had been found in another mastaba in the same cemetery. Rising, I gestured to him to lead on. The guttural chanting of Daoud's crew gradually faded as we scrambled over the fallen rocks and rough ground at the base of the pyramid. We were close to the northeast corner of the structure when my guide stopped. He held out his hand. "'Sit,' he began. "'No,' I said in Arabic. "'No bakshish until you have shown me the tomb.' He took a step toward me, smiling as sweetly as a shy maiden. Then I heard a sound like the sharp crack of a whip. A rolling rumble of falling stone followed as a rain of rocks and pebbles struck the ground behind me. My guide took to his heels. I could hardly blame him. Looking up in some annoyance, I saw a round, alarmed face peering down from the top of the slope, which was almost fifty feet above me at that point. Och, Himmel, Frau Professor! Verzeihen Sie bitte! I did not see you. Are you damaged? Are you fainting with fear? He came scrambling down the slope as he spoke, waving his arms to keep his balance and starting another miniature avalanche. Neither, I replied. No thanks to you, Herr Schmidt. What the dev... That is, what were you shooting at? For pity's sake, put your revolver away before you drill a hole through me or yourself. Colouring, the young man returned his weapon to its holster. It was eine Gazelle. Uh, how do you call it? Nonsense. It couldn't have been a gazelle. They are timid creatures who would not venture so close to humans. You tried to shoot some poor villager's goat, Herr Schmidt. Luckily for you, you missed it. The world's finest marksman could not hit such a distant target with a pistol. My lecture was interrupted by Emerson, who came rushing toward us, demanding to know who had shot at what and why. My explanation did nothing to relieve his tender anxiety. Turning to his German colleague, who had been close on his heels, he burst into a storm of complaint. Sie haben recht, Herr Professor, Schmidt murmured submissively. Ich bin ein vollendetes Kind für. You are making a great fuss about nothing, Emerson, I said. 
the bullet came nowhere near me. In short, no harm was done or intended, said Professor Eberfeld, coming to the defence of his colleague. Except that my guide was frightened away, I added. Let us see if we can find him and reassure him. He had found a new tomb which he was about to show me. But neither the guide nor the tomb he had mentioned was to be found, though we searched for some time. Perhaps he will return tomorrow, once he has got over his fright, I said at last. He was young, and appeared to be very timid. Our visitors did not linger. The boat they had hired awaited them, and they meant to return to Cairo that night. Watching the donkeys disappear into the darkening shadows of the east, Emerson stroked his chin, as was his habit when in deep thought. "'I think we have done enough here, Peabody,' he said. "'The Luxor-Cairo train stops at Rika in the morning. Shall we be on it?' I could see no reason why not. My first act upon reaching the hotel was to request the suffragi to run a nice hot bath for me. As I luxuriated in the scented water, Emerson looked through the letters and messages that had arrived in our absence and reported their contents to me, with appropriate comments. "'Will we dine with Lady Wallingford and her daughter? No, we will not. Captain and Mrs Richardson look forward to the pleasure of our company at their soiree. They will look in vain.' Mr. Vincey hopes we will do him the honour of lunching with him on Thursday. It is an honour he has not earned. The Solicitor General... Aha! A grain of wheat among all this chaff. A letter from Chalfont. Open it, I called. A ripping sound told me he had already done so. The epistle was a sort of round robin, begun by Evelyn and added to by the others. Evelyn and Walter's contributions were short, intended only to reassure us that all was well with them and their charges. Neferet's brief message was something of a disappointment to me. It sounded like a duty note from a child to a relation she does not much like. I reminded myself that I ought not to have expected anything else. She'd been taught to read and write English by her father, but she hadn't much occasion to practice that skill. It would be some time before she learned to express herself gracefully and at length. Ramsay's contribution made up for any deficiency in the latter quality, at least. I could see why he had asked to be the last to write, for his comments were, to say the least, more candid than those of his aunt. Rose does not like it here. She does not say that, but her mouth always looks as if she's been eating pickled onions. I think the difficulty is that she doesn't get on with Ellis. Ellis is Aunt Evelyn's new maid. She came from the gutter like the others. Emerson stopped to laugh, and I exclaimed, Good heavens, where does that child pick up such language? Out of the goodness of her heart, Evelyn employs unfortunate young women whose lives have not been what they ought, but the description gains in pungency what it lacks in propriety, said Emerson. He goes on. Rose says she doesn't hold this against Ellis. I certainly would not, though I am not precisely certain what the term implies. But I do not get on with Ellis either. She is always following Neferet trying to get her to change her clothing and curl her hair. Wilkins, our former butler, now employed by Evelyn and Walter, has not been unwell since we arrived. He seems very nervous. The least little thing makes him start. When I let the lion out of its cage yesterday... My body lost its purchase on the surface of the tub and my head went under water. When I emerged, sputtering and choking... I found that Emerson had continued reading. No danger, since, as you know, I'd been acquainted with the lion since it was a cub and had taken pains to renew the acquaintance whenever possible. Uncle Walter was not nervous, but his remarks were pejorative in the extreme and he set me an additional ten pages of Caesar to construe. He added that he was sorry I was too old to spank. He has agreed to build a larger cage for the lion. I will spare my reader Ramsay's detailed descriptions of the health and habits of the other servants. 
I hadn't been aware of the cook's fondness for gin, <clears throat> nor, I imagine, had Evelyn. He saved her for last. She has improved in health and spirit since we came here, I believe, though, in my opinion, as I later discovered, Ramses had scratched the last three words out, but Emerson read them anyhow. She spends too much time at her studies. I have come round to your view that men sana in corpore sano is a good rule, and have adopted it myself. Toward that end, I determined to take up the sport of archery. It is a sport in which young ladies are encouraged to participate. Aunt Evelyn agreed with me, and Uncle Water, who can be obliging when he chooses, set up the butts for us. I discovered that Neferet is already acquainted with that sport. She has agreed to instruct me. In return, I am teaching her to ride and to fence. He doesn't know how to fence, I exclaimed indignantly. <clears throat> said Emerson. I decided not to pursue the subject. I had suspected Emerson was taking fencing lessons on the sly. But he never likes admitting he needs instruction in anything, and his original motive for taking up this sport was not to his credit, for it arose out of jealousy of an individual concerning whom he had not the slightest cause to feel that emotion. I had to admit his skill had proved useful on several occasions thereafter, though. Apparently he had allowed Ramses to be instructed as well. He knew I would not have approved. The idea of Ramses wielding a long, flexible, sharp instrument made my blood run cold. Two more paragraphs describe Neferet's activities in far more detail than they merited. After Emerson had finished, he remarked, in terms fatuous with parental pride, "'How well he writes! Quite literary, upon my word!' It sounds as if things are going well, I replied. Hand me that towel, Emerson, will you please? Emerson handed me the towel. He then returned to the sitting room to peruse the remainder of the post. Well, where next? Emerson inquired, as we sat down to dinner that evening. Luxor or Amana? Have you eliminated Maidum? No, not at all. But I feel we ought to look at the other possibilities before we make a decision. Very well. What is your preference? It is a matter of complete indifference to me. Emerson peered at me over the top of the ornate menu the waiter had handed him. Are you annoyed about something, Peabody? Ramsay's letter, perhaps? You've scarcely spoken to me since I read it. What possible cause for annoyance could I have? I can think of none. He waited for a moment. When I did not respond, he shrugged. One of those irritating masculine shrugs that dismisses a woman's behaviour as incomprehensible and or irrelevant, and resumed the discussion. I suggest we go direct to Luxor, then. I am rather impatient to rid myself of certain objects as promptly as I can. That makes sense, I agreed. Have you any ideas as to where we might uh, discover them? We discussed alternatives while we ate. It was still early when we finished, and I suggested a stroll along the musky. We are not going out this evening, Emerson replied. I have something else in mind. I hope will please you. It did. But when Emerson had settled into his usual sleeping position, flat on his back, arms folded across his breast like a statue of Osiris, I could not help remembering an occasion when the sight of me rising from the bath had prompted comparisons with Aphrodite. This afternoon, he'd simply handed me a towel. The only invitation Emerson had not thrown away was one from Mr. George Mackenzie. He was one of those eccentric individuals more common in the old days of archaeology than they are today, gifted amateurs who had excavated and studied Egyptology without the restrictions of government regulation. Some of them had done admirable work, despite their lack of formal training, and Mackenzie's massive three-volume work on ancient Egyptian culture was an invaluable source 
for many of the reliefs and inscriptions he had copied in the 1850s had vanished forever. He was a very old man now, and seldom gave or accepted invitations. Even Emerson admitted this was a most flattering attention and an opportunity we ought not miss. He refused to wear evening dress, but he looked very handsome in his frock coat and matching trousers. I wore my second best gown of silver brocade woven with red roses and trimmed with silver lace at the bosom and the cuffs of the elbow length net sleeves. I hope I may not be accused of vanity when I say that all eyes turn toward us as we cross the terrace toward the waiting carriage. A brilliant sunset blazoned the western sky. The domes and minarets of old Cairo swam in a dreaming haze. Old Cairo was our destination. The medieval city with the beautiful four-story houses and palaces from which the cruel Mamluk warriors had tyrannized over the city. Many dwellings had fallen into disrepair and were now inhabited by the poorer classes, whole families to a room, the elaborately carved lattice work, which had concealed the beauties of the harem from envious eyes, had been stripped away, and the laundered galabias of the humble drooped disconsolately from the decayed screens of mushrabia alcoves. Mackenzie's house had belonged, it was said, to Sultan Kait Bey himself, and its architectural features were well preserved. I quite looked forward to seeing it. There are no street signs or house numbers in old Cairo. Finally, the driver stopped his horses and admitted what I had suspected for some time, to wit, that he had no idea where he was going. When Emerson indicated a street, or rather an opening between two houses just ahead, the driver declared he could not go there. He knew that street. It narrowed even farther as it proceeded, and there would be no place in which to turn the horses. "'Wait for us here, then,' Emerson said. "'As he helped me down from the carriage, "'he was unable to resist remarking, "'I told you not to wear that frock, Peabody. "'I thought it likely we would have to go part way on foot.' "'Then why didn't you say so?' I demanded, "'hitching up my skirts. "'You have been here before, haven't you?' "'Some years ago.' "'Emerson offered me his arm, and we started off. "'Down this way, I think.' Mackenzie sent directions, but they were not... Ah, yes, here is the Sabil he mentioned, first turning to the left. We hadn't gone far when the passage narrowed even more, till there was scarcely room to walk abreast. It was like proceeding through a tunnel, for the high secretive facades of the old houses rose sheer on either side, and their jutting balconies almost met overhead. I said uneasily, "'This cannot be right, Emerson. "'It is very dark and nasty here, "'and I haven't seen a soul since we left the fountain. "'Mr. Mackenzie wouldn't live in such a slum, surely?' "'There are no architectural class distinctions here. "'The mansions of the wealthy join the tenements of the poor.' "'But Emerson's voice reflected my own doubts. "'He stopped.' Let us go back. There was a coffee shop near the Sabil. We will ask directions there. It was too late. The narrow way was lighted only by a lantern some considerate householder had hung over a door a few feet behind us. But it cast sufficient light to allow us to see, in the shadows beyond, the hulking forms of several men. Their turbans showed pale in the darkness. Damnation, said Emerson calmly. Get behind me, Peabody. Back to back, I agreed, taking up that position. Cuss it! Why did I come out without my belt of tools? Try the door there, Emerson said. Locked. There are other men ahead, I added. At least two. And this is only a flimsy evening parasol made to match my gown. Not the one I usually carry. Good gad, Emerson exclaimed. Without your parasol, we dare not face them in the open street. A strategic retreat would seem to be in order. With a sudden movement, he whirled and kicked out at the door I had tried. The lock gave with a crack. The door swung back. Seizing me around the waist, Emerson thrust me within. 
Squeals and flutters greeted my abrupt appearance. The two men who had occupied the room fled, leaving the nargily they had shared bubbling gently. Emerson followed me and slammed the door. It won't hold them for long, he remarked. The lock is broken, and there is no piece of furniture heavy enough to serve as a barricade. There is surely another way out. I indicated the curtained doorway through which the men had gone. We will investigate that if we must. Emerson leaned against the door, his shoulders braced. I don't fancy more dark alleys, though, and I would rather not rely on the kindness of strangers, especially the sort of strangers that inhabit a warren like this. Let us consider other options, now that we have achieved a momentary... He broke off as a sound from without reached us through the flimsy panels of the door. I started, and Emerson swore. That was a woman's scream, or worse, that of a child. I flung myself at him. No, Emerson, don't go out there. It may be a trick. The cry came again, high, shrill, quavering. It rose to a falsetto shriek and broke off. Emerson tried to loosen my grip. I struggled to hold on, throwing my full weight against his. It is a ruse, I tell you. They know you. They know your chivalrous nature. Fearing to attack, they hope to lure you out of sanctuary. This is no simple attempt at robbery. We were deliberately led astray. My speech was not so measured, for Emerson's hands had closed bruisingly over mine, and he was employing considerable force to free himself. It was not until a cry of pain burst from my lips that he desisted. The damage is done. Whatever it was, he said breathlessly. She is silent now. I am sorry, Peabody, if I hurt you. His taut muscles had relaxed. I leaned against him, trying to control my own ragged breathing. My wrists felt as if they had been squeezed in a vice, but I was conscious of an odd, irrational thrill. Never mind, my dear. I know you didn't mean to. The silence without did not endure. The voice that broke it was the last I expected to hear. Bold, unafraid, official. The voice of a man giving crisp orders in faulty Arabic. Another ruse, I exclaimed. I think not, said Emerson, listening. That chap must be English. No Egyptian speaks his own language so badly. Have I your permission to open the door or crack Peabody? He was being sarcastic. Since I knew he would do it anyway, I agreed. By comparison to the darkness that had prevailed earlier, the street was now brightly lit by lanterns and torches carried by men whose neat uniforms made their identity plain. One of them came toward us. Emerson had been correct. His ruddy complexion proclaimed his nationality, just as his erect carriage and luxuriant moustache betrayed his military training. "'Was it you who screamed, madam?' he inquired, politely removing his cap. "'I trust you and this gentleman are unharmed.' "'I did not scream, but thanks to you and your men we are quite unharmed,' <laughs> said Emerson. "'What are you doing in this part of the city, Captain?' "'It is my duty, sir,' was the stiff reply. "'I am serving as an adviser to the Cairo Police Force. "'I might with better cause ask the same question of you.' Emerson replied that we were paying a social call. The incredulity this answer provoked was expressed not in speech, but in the young man's pursed lips and raised eyebrows. Obviously, he did not know who we were. He offered to escort us back to our carriage. "'Not necessary,' said Emerson. "'You seem to have cleared the way very neatly, sir. Not even a fallen body in sight. Did they all get away from you?' "'We did not pursue them,' was the haughty reply." The prisons are overflowing with such riff-raff, and we had nothing to charge them with. Screaming in public, Emerson suggested. The fellow had a sense of humour after all. His lips twitched, but he replied sedately. It must have been one of them who cried out, if the lady did not. They did not attack you, then? We cannot charge them with anything, I admitted. In fact, you could arrest us, Captain. We forced entry into this house and broke the door. 
The officer smiled politely. Emerson took a handful of money from his pocket and tossed it onto the table. That should take care of any complaints about the broken door. Come along, my dear. We are late for our appointment. We had taken the wrong turning at the fountain. The proprietor of the coffee shop knew Mr Mackenzie's house very well. It was only a short distance away. But somehow I was not surprised when his servant informed us that he was not expecting guests that evening. In fact, he had already retired. He was, the servant said reproachfully, a very elderly man. Chapter 5 Men are frail creatures, it is true. One does not expect them to demonstrate the steadfastness of women. Not so cursed elderly, he had forgotten where he lives, Emerson remarked. The directions are clear, left at the sabil. He tossed the crumpled paper onto the breakfast table. It fell into the cream jug. By the time I had fished it out, the writing was so blurred as to be indecipherable. I will take your word for it, I said, putting the soggy wad onto a clean saucer. Nor will I claim that even a young man might suffer a momentary lapse of memory or an inadvertent slip of a pen. The fact that the wrong turning led us into an ambush is proof positive that the misdirection was intentional. Have you ever done anything to offend, Mr Mackenzie? I presume, said my husband, distorting his handsome face into a hideous skull, that you are attempting to be facetious, Amelia. The invitation did not come from Mackenzie. He hadn't answered the question. It was a safe assumption that at some time or other he had offended Mr Mackenzie, because there were few people he had not offended. The reaction seemed somewhat extreme, however. How do you know it didn't come from him? I don't, Emerson admitted. I sent round this morning to inquire, but the messenger has not yet returned. He will deny it in any case. True. Emerson brooded like a pensive sphinx over the muffin he was buttering. There are some curious stories about Mackenzie. His age and the passage of time have given him an air of respectability he did not always deserve. In his youth, he swaggered around in Turkish costume, silken robes and a huge turban, and by all accounts behaved like a Turk in uh, other ways. I knew he was referring to women. Emerson is absurdly shy about such matters, with me at any rate. I had some reason to suspect he was not so reticent with other men, or with some women. Did he keep a harem? I inquired curiously. Oh, well, Emerson looked uncomfortable. It was not uncommon at that time for wild young men encountering a strange culture to adopt some of its customs. Early archaeologists were no more scrupulous about the monuments than they were about um, other things. Mackenzie's private collection of antiquities is said to be... He never married, I believe, I mused. Perhaps it was not women he favoured. There is one Turkish custom... Good God, Peabody! Emerson shouted, crimsoning. A well-bred woman has no business knowing about such things much less talking of them. I was speaking of Mackenzie's collection. But I was not to hear of Mr Mackenzie's collection at that time. The suffragi entered to announce a visitor. Mr Vincy and his cat came in together. The great brindled feline leashed and walking beside his master like... I was about to say a well-trained dog... But there was nothing of canine subservience in the cat's manner. It was rather as if he had trained Mr. Vincy to take him for a walk instead of the reverse. I offered Mr. Vincy coffee, which he accepted, but when I poured a little cream into a saucer for Anubis, he sniffed it and then gave me a contemptuous look before sitting down at Vincy's feet and curling his tail around his haunches. Mr. Vincy apologised at quite excessive length, for his pet's rudeness. Cats are never rude, I said. They act according to their natures, with a candour humans might well emulate. 
Many grown cats don't care for milk. This one certainly has the air of a carnivore, added Emerson. He is more courteous to cats than to people. He went on, Well, Vinci, what can we do for you? We were about to go out. Mr. Vincey explained that he had called to inquire whether I had fully recovered from my unfortunate adventure. I was about to reply when a fit of coughing and a pointed stare from Emerson reminded me that Vincey must be referring to the affair of the masked ball. For our most recent experience could not be known to him. I assured him I was in perfect health and spirits. Emerson began to fidget, and after a few more courteous exchanges, Mr. Vincey took the hint. It was not until he rose and picked up the leash that I realised the cat was not attached to the other end of it. The collar dangled empty. With an exclamation of amused chagrin, Mr. Vincey surveyed the room. Now where has he got to? He seems determined to embarrass me with you, Mrs. Emerson. I assure you he has never done this before. If you will forgive me. Puckering his lips, he let out a shrill, sweet whistle. The cat promptly emerged from under the breakfast table. Avoiding Vince's outstretched hand, it jumped onto my lap, where it settled down and began to purr. It was clear that efforts to remove it without damage to my skirt would be in vain, for Mr. Vincey's first attempt resulted in a low growl and a delicate but definite insertion of sharp claws. I scratched it behind its ear, releasing its grip. It rolled its head back and let out a reverberant purr. "'The creature demonstrates excellent taste,' said Emerson dryly. I have never seen him behave this way, Mr. Vincey murmured, staring. Almost I am emboldened to ask a favour of you. We are not adopting any more animals, Emerson declared firmly. He tickled the cat under its chin. It licked his fingers. Not under any circumstances whatever, Emerson went on. The cat butted its head against his hand. Oh, I would never give up my faithful friend, Vincy exclaimed. But I am about to leave Egypt, a short journey to Damascus, where a friend of mine has requested my assistance in a personal matter. I have been wondering where to find a temporary home for Anubis. I have not so many friends to impose upon. There was no self-pity in the last statement, only a manly fortitude. It moved me. Vanity also had some part in my response. The approval of a cat cannot but flatter the recipient. We could take charge of Anubis for a few weeks, couldn't we, Emerson? I find I miss the cat bastard more than I had expected. Impossible, Emerson declared. We are about to leave Cairo. We can't carry a cat to Luxor. Once the matter was settled, the cat made no further objection to being removed. It was almost as if it had understood and approved the arrangements. Mr. Vincey was leaving the following day. He promised to deliver Anubis next morning. This duly transpired, and that evening, Emerson and I, and the cat, took the overnight train to Luxor. The cat was no trouble. It sat bolt upright on the seat opposite ours, staring out the window like a polite fellow passenger, pretending not to eavesdrop on our conversation. This conversation was not, I am sorry to say, as free of acrimony as it might have been. I admit the fault was mine. I was in an irritable mood. This had nothing to do with my discovery, upon arriving at the station, that Emerson had, unbeknownst to me, invited Abdallah and Daoud to accompany us. Our experienced foreman could be of great assistance, especially at Luxor, where he had been born, and in which city he still had hordes of relations. There was no sensible reason why I should resent Abdullah's presence. After they had helped us with our baggage, he and Daoud went off to find their own places. I don't understand why you were in such a hurry to get off, I said. 
Mr. Vandergelt will be arriving in Cairo in a few days' time. We might have waited and travelled with him. You made that point earlier, Peabody. And I replied that I could see no sense in hanging around Cairo for an indefinite period. Vandergelt is a hopeless gad. He will want to attend dinner parties and make eyes at the ladies. Besides, he will travel south on his cursed Dahabia. It was kind of him to offer us his house while we are in Luxor. It costs him nothing. How ungracious you are! And so on. Nothing of further interest occurred, even after the porter had made up our berths, for the surroundings were not conducive to a display of conjugal affection, and Emerson claimed the cat was watching. It is on the floor, Emerson. It can't possibly see us. Or you it. I can feel it watching, said Emerson. However, I woke early to see the kiss of the sunrise summoning a rosy flush to the western cliffs, a sight that never fails to raise my spirits. An exchange of affectionate greetings with my husband, who took the precaution of draping a sheet over the sleeping cat before proceeding, completed the cure. We went directly from the station to the quay and hired a boat to take us and our gear across to the West Bank. Only an individual devoid of imagination and completely deficient in artistic appreciation could fail to be moved by the sight that met my eyes as I sat in the prow with the great sails billowing above and the morning breeze ruffling my hair. On the opposite bank... An emerald ribbon of fields and foliage bordered the river. Beyond lay the desert, the red land of the ancient texts, and beyond that pale and sterile stretch rose the cliffs of the high desert, through which the Nile had cut its path in prehistoric times. Gradually there appeared out of the mists shapes more visible perhaps to the imagination than the sight. Magic castles rising from the foam, as the poet has put it, the ruined but majestic walls of the ancient temples. Upon further investigation, I find the quotation is not entirely accurate. However, my version better captures the impression I was endeavouring to convey. Foremost among the temples, at least in my opinion, were the columned colonnades of Deir el-Bari, the mortuary temple of the great female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. Not far from it was a more modern structure, invisible to my eyes, but only too clear in my memory. Baskerville House, the scene of one of our most extraordinary detectival adventures. It was now a forlorn and abandoned ruin, for the present Lord Baskerville had declined to preserve it, and small wonder, considering the horrible fate his predecessor had met while in residence. He had offered it to Cyrus Vandergilt, but the latter's memories of the ill-fated house were no more pleasant than his. I wouldn't set foot in the consarn place for a million dollars, was how Cyrus put it in his quaint American idiom. Cyrus had built a house of his own near the entrance to the Valley of the Kings. Money was no object to him, and I must say that his home was more notable for extravagance than good taste. It stood on a towering eminence overlooking the valley. As our carriage approached, Emerson studied the turrets and towers and balconies in disgust, and remarked, It is a positive monument to extravagance and bad taste. I trust you won't take it as a model, Amelia. Mr. Vandergelt was inspired, I expect, by crusaders' castles. There are a number of them in the Middle East. That is no excuse. Well, I suppose I must put up with it. Personally, I did not find it difficult to put up with clean, comfortable rooms and excellent service. Cyrus kept a skeleton staff always in residence. The caretaker greeted us with the assurance that we were expected and that our rooms were ready. They were as elegantly appointed as in any modern hotel. Fine oriental rugs covered the floors... Windows and doors were fitted with netting to keep out insects, and the rooms were kept cool by a method known since the Middle Ages, porous earthenware jars in the mushrabia alcoves behind the windows. After 
asking when we would like luncheon to be served, the majordomo bowed himself out, and I began to strip off my travel-stained garments. Emerson prowled around, opening wardrobe doors and investigating cabinets. He gave a grunt of satisfaction. Van der Gelt is no fool, if he is an American. There is a good, solid lock on this cupboard, just what I hope to find. From the small travel case he had carried in his own hand from Cairo, he took the box containing the scepters and stowed it carefully away, putting the key in his trouser pocket after he had locked the cabinet. I heard the splash of water from the adjoining bathroom. The servants were not done filling the tub, so I wrapped myself in a robe and sat down to wait till they had finished. Cool drinks and an assortment of little cakes had been brought to us. I poured a glass of soda water. What a fuss you are making about those scepters. If I had had any idea they would prey on your mind as they seem to, I would have suggested we discover them last spring while we were at Napata. That is the most logical place for them to be found, after all. Do you suppose I did not consider that? I am not such a fool as you believe. Now, Emerson, be calm. I didn't mean to imply... Such a discovery at Napata would have drawn every treasure hunter in Africa and aroused the cupidity of the natives. They would have torn the pyramids to bits. There isn't much left of them now, I pointed out. Emerson ignored this. Pacing furiously, hands clasped behind his back, he went on. There was another consideration. I wanted the discovery to be separated in time from Neferet's reappearance. If these objects are found at Thebes, they cannot possibly be connected with Willie Forth's lost city. I saw the sense of his reasoning and candidly confessed as much. This put him in a better humour and, a tap at the door having announced that my bath was ready, I proceeded to take it. After luncheon, we assumed our working attire and set out for the valley, accompanied by Abdullah and Daoud and the cat. Abdallah was not a particular admirer of cats, and he viewed this one askance. Anubis responded, as cats will, by lavishing attention on poor Abdallah, twining around his ankles, leaping at him out of hiding in kittenish fashion, pretending, I believe he was pretending, to attack the hem of his robe. Abdallah tried several times to kick him. He did it when he thought I was not looking, but I was. Needless to say, his foot never connected. Though I would have preferred to dispense with Abdallah and Daoud, not to mention the cat, the expedition could not but delight me. To see Emerson in the costume that becomes him best, his waving black locks shining in the sun, his tanned and muscular forearms displayed by the rolled sleeves of his shirt, to walk stride by stride with him, agile in my comfortable trousers, to hear the musical clash of the tools depending from my belt and clasp the sturdy handle of my parasol. Mere words cannot capture the exhilaration of that experience. Instead of following the tourist road, we set off along a curving track that led northwest. The Valley of the Kings, Biban el Muluk, literally, Gates of the Kings, in Arabic, is not one valley, but two. The one most frequently visited is the Eastern Valley, where the majority of the royal tombs of the Empire are located. It has been popular with tourists and explorers since Greek times, and in our own time, it has become too crowded for comfort, thanks to such enterprising merchants as Mr. Cook, whose steamers brought hundreds of idle visitors to Luxor each season. It would require more than unsuitably clad, garrulous crowds to rob the eastern valley of its grandeur. But to my mind, the western valley is even more impressive. Valley is not really an appropriate word, suggesting as it does the green and fertile depression watered by a river or stream. These canyons, or wadis, as the Arabs call them, are as rocky and bare as the desert itself. We followed a twisting path that led through fantastic rock formations into a cup or bowl, floored with fine white sand and enclosed by rugged limestone cliffs. 
The only colour was that of the blue sky high above. No green growing thing, not even a weed or a blade of grass, refreshed the eye. Yet there was once water to spare in this arid amphitheatre. The wadis were cut through the soft limestone of the cliffs in prehistoric times, when the desert bloomed like the rose and floods cascaded down the Theban hills toward the river. They are still subject to rare but violent flash floods, which wash debris down the valleys and into the tombs. A scorpion scuttled away from my foot. The insect and a hawk hovering high above were the only other living creatures in sight. Though dark stains, clearly visible against the sun-whitened limestone, marked the nesting places of bats. The rock walls rose steep but not smooth. Hundreds, nay thousands of pockets and crevices, bays and caves turned the cliffs into a ragged fretwork of stone. The silence was absolute, for the sand muted even the sound of footsteps. One had an eerie reluctance to break that silence. I broke it, but not until after Abdallah and Daoud had gone off to investigate a promising crevice. Neither of them knew our real purpose that day. We hadn't taken our loyal men with us to Nubia. It would have been impossible to provide transport and supplies for a large group in that troubled region, and they knew no more of our activities the previous winter than was known to the general public. The chances of keeping a secret increase in inverse ratio to the number of people who are acquainted with that secret. The place is certainly remote and private enough for our purposes, I said. But is it a likely spot in which to find Kushite royal scepters? Egyptology is full of unsolved mysteries, Emerson replied. Sententiously, we will give our colleagues another and let them debate endlessly as to how these remarkable objects could have found their way to a crevice in the rock. Thieves' loot, I suggested, my imagination fired, hidden by an unscrupulous robber who didn't want his associates to share in the proceeds and who was prevented by accident or arrest from returning to get them. That will be the accepted explanation, no doubt. But where did the thieves find them? I can hear Petrie and Maspero arguing that question for the next twenty years. His eyes sparkled with enjoyment. I felt he was beginning to enjoy his trick a little too much. It is a pity we must do this, I said. Emerson wiped the grin off his face, as the expressive American phrase has it. You don't suppose I enjoy it, do you? He didn't give me a chance to reply, but went on. Truth is impossible in this case, nor does it always suffice to end foolish speculation. Don't forget the mummy in the royal tomb at Amana. I gave Newbury the facts of that matter the other night, but I don't suppose for a moment that will end speculation. Mark my words. Scholarly journals for years to come will repeat the rumour that Akhenaten's mummy was found at Amana. And furthermore... Yes, my dear, I said soothingly, for I recognise the symptoms of one who doth protest too much. Deceit was anathema to that clear, candid brain, but he was right. What else could he do? What will be your theory? I inquired. Another cache of royal mummies, my dear Peabody. Two have been located so far, as well as a collection of high priests from the later dynasties. However, we are still deficient in priestesses. Where are the burials of the gods' wives of Amun, the adorers of the god, who ruled in Thebes during the 25th and 26th dynasties? Several of them were Kushite princesses. Emerson turned, shading his eyes with his hand, and surveyed the cliffs that enclosed the valley like the splintered, broken sides of a gigantic bowl. This is not an unlikely location for the original tombs. No late tombs have been found here, I objected. And aren't we postulating a reburial? A group of mummies hidden away after their tombs had been violated by thieves? The other caches were located near Deir el-Bari. 
The other reburials were done in the 21st and 22nd dynasties, Emerson retorted. The Kushites didn't turn up until much later. What do you keep raising objections for? We've got to do something with the cursed things, and unless you can suggest a better alternative... In such stimulating, if morally questionable debate, we passed the next hours, inspecting the contours of the base of the cliffs, scrambling over rocky slopes. The heat was intense, and we consumed quantities of the cold tea Daoud carried with him. Anubis refused even the water we had also brought, but managed to knock Abdallah's cup out of his hand and deluge his skirts with tea. The cat went off after that to explore on his own, or, more likely, to hunt. Emerson had brought along copies of the plans of the valley made by earlier scholars. He enjoyed himself very much, finding errors in them. Abdallah and Daoud searched for signs of unknown tombs. Like most treasure hunts, it was both endlessly enticing and relatively hopeless, for the rock was as riddled with holes as a sieve. Some individuals have, or develop, a seemingly uncanny instinct for such things. Belzoni, the flamboyant Italian strongman who had been one of the first to work in the Valley of the Kings, had an extraordinary talent for locating hidden tomb entrances. He had been a hydraulics engineer and was one of the first to realise that the floods, which were more common in his day than now, could leave evidence of subsidence and displacement. Abdallah and Daoud were not engineers, but they were descendants of the master tomb robbers of Gurna, who have located more tombs than all archaeologists combined. Any hollow among the rocks might indicate a tomb entrance, or it might indicate only a natural hollow. We probed several such hollows and investigated a heap of stones like the one Belzoni had mentioned in his description of the discovery of the tomb of King Ai in this very valley, all without result, which was what we had expected. Shall we have another look at Ai's tomb? Emerson asked, indicating the opening that gaped forlornly above. The sight would only depress me. It was in wretched condition last time we visited it, and I'm sure it has deteriorated even more. But that can be said of every tomb and every monument in Egypt. It is difficult to decide where to concentrate our efforts. There is so much to be done. Not until sunset stretched glowing fingers across the sky did we turn our steps back toward the house. It rejoiced, I must add, in the resounding name of... House of the Doors of the Kings. But this appellation appeared only on Cyrus's notepaper. Europeans referred to it as Vandergeld's Place, and Egyptians as the Castle of the Americani. The main valley was deserted. Tourists and guides had left for the landing, where boats would carry them across to their hotels on the east bank. Shadows thickened. Emerson quickened his pace. I heard a rattle of pebbles and a strangled Arabic oath from Abdallah trotting behind us. It concluded the word for cat, so I deduced that Anubis had caused him to stumble. The animal's tawny grey fur blended so well with the twilight that he was almost invisible. He must have gone ahead after that, for he was waiting for us on the doorstep. You see, I exclaimed, my method was effective after all. <laughs> said Emerson. He had jeered at me when I rubbed the cat's paws with butter during luncheon in the time-honoured and traditional method of training it to stay in a new home. He had also pointed out that Vandergelt might not thank us if we turned Anubis into a permanent resident. I replied that we would deal with that difficulty when and if it arose. I had requested that dinner be served early, since I hoped to persuade Emerson into a moonlight stroll, without Abdallah and Daoud. However, when I proposed it, he declined. We retired to the library, therefore. Vandergelt had one of the finest collections of Egyptological works in the country. And Emerson took out his pipe. Peabody, he said, will you come here? 
He had seated himself on the sofa, a large structure in the Turkish style, with a quantity of soft pillows. I had chosen a straight-back chair and taken up a book. No, thank you, Emerson. I prefer this chair. Emerson rose. Picking up the chair with me in it, he carried it to the end of the sofa and set it down with a thud. I bow to your wishes, my dear Peabody. Oh, Emerson, I began. And then, as he loomed over me, fists on his hips and lips curving, I could not but smile. I got up and took my place on the sofa. That is better, said Emerson, joining me and putting his arm around my shoulders. Much more friendly. Besides, I don't want to be overheard. The cat jumped up onto the other end of the sofa and sat down. Its wide green eyes regarded us unwinkingly. Anubis is listening, I said. Be serious, Peabody. I want you to promise me something. I do not order you, I ask you. Certainly, my dear Emerson. What is it? Give me your solemn word that you will not go wandering around the cliffs or anywhere else alone. If you receive a message asking for your help or offering to show you where a valuable antiquity is hidden... Why, Emerson, you make me sound like some silly, gothic heroine instead of the sensible, rational woman you know me to be. When have I ever done such a thing? Emerson's lips parted, and indignation furrowed his noble brow. But experience had taught him that contradicting my statements led only to further argument, not to the agreement he wanted. Let me put it this way. You have an unnerving self-confidence, Peabody. When armed with your parasol, you consider yourself capable of defeating any number of adversaries. Have I your word? If you will give me yours, to the same effect... Emerson's brows drew together. I went on. You have an unnerving self-confidence, Emerson. You consider yourself capable... Laughing, Emerson stopped my speech in a manner I find particularly pleasant. It was a rather short embrace, however. The unwinking stare of the cat seemed to disturb him, for he glanced uneasily at it before speaking again. The cases are hardly the same, Peabody but I am willing to take some precautions. I hope you do not suppose I declined your invitation to walk in the moonlight because the idea was unpleasant to me. No, we are not going out at night until this matter is settled. What matter? Oh, come, Peabody. You are usually the first to find ominous portents and harbingers of disaster in the accidents that befall us. At the time we first discussed the situation, the evidence was inconclusive. But it is beginning to mount up. The search of our room. Three attempts at assault or abduction in less than a week. Three? I can only think of two. Emerson removed his arm and leaned forward, reaching for his pipe. The incident at Medum had certain interesting features. At first I couldn't think what he meant. Then I laughed. That foolish young German shooting at a gazelle? I told you, Emerson, the bullet came nowhere near me. Consider as well that only a madman would try to murder me in broad daylight, with witnesses all around. Success would have been tantamount to suicide for the killer. That hasty temper of yours would have moved you to exact retribution on the spot. Oh, it is too absurd. I am rather inclined to regard the young man as a guardian angel, Emerson said slowly. What became of the workman who promised you an unknown tomb, Peabody? You never saw him again. He was frightened. Bah! It seems to be you, my dear, these unknown individuals are after. The three men who attacked you in the garden... I told you they were uncommonly gentle, Emerson said impatiently. That attack may have been designed to make sure I was out of the way when my double made off with you. There must be some underlying motive for all these events, and I can't think of anything we have done recently to inspire the interest of the criminal element, except find Willie Forth's lost city of gold. Surely you are jumping to unwarranted conclusions, Emerson. 
You or I might be able to weave together vague hints and scattered clues and arrive at the correct conclusion that Willoughby Forth's fantasies were true and that we had located his treasure hoard. But who else is capable of such brilliant reasoning? Slowly, Emerson's head turned, exactly as Bastet's head turns when she is planning to jump on some unconscious victim. He looked straight into my eyes. No, Emerson, I exclaimed. It can't be. We haven't seen or heard from him for years. Only a man, said Emerson, who has far-flung sources of information covering the world like a spider's web, I believe you once said, who is familiar with the world of archaeology, its practitioners, its history and its legends, who has good cause to hate one of us, and even better cause to... My abductor was not the master criminal, Emerson. I could hardly be mistaken. After all, I was in intimate, if unwilling, proximity to the fellow for quite some time. It was not, I admit, the most tactful thing I could have said. Emerson's response consisted of a string of expletives, including several that were unfamiliar to me. It took me considerable time and effort to calm him. My efforts succeeded so well that I was forced to remind him, after an interval, that the windows were uncurtained and that the servants had not gone to bed. Let us set them an example, then, said Emerson, drawing me to my feet. As we proceeded up the stairs, he said thoughtfully, Perhaps you are right, Peabody. I am still inclined to see the dread hand. Another of your literary phrases, is it not? The dread hand of Sethos everywhere. I may be mistaken as to the identity of our opponent, but my theory as to the motive behind these attentions is unshaken. It would take an archaeologist or a keen student of archaeology to put those clues together. I am sure it was not Mr. Budge who tried to carry me off, Emerson. My little joke had the desired effect. With a smile, Emerson led me into our room and closed the door. For the next three days, we worked in the West Valley. They were halcyon days. Nothing disturbed the peaceful productivity of our work except an occasional archaeological visitor who had heard of our presence and, as Emerson put it, came to find out what we were up to. And the cat Anubis, who seemed intent on driving Abdullah to a felina side. I endeavoured to comfort our afflicted foreman. He likes you, Abdullah. It is quite a compliment. The cat bastard never paid you such attentions. Rubbing his head, which had come into painful contact with a rock when the cat had suddenly jumped onto his shoulder, Abdallah remained unconvinced. She is not an ordinary cat, as we all know. Does not she speak with the young master and heed his commands? This one is a servant of evil as the cat Bastet is the servant of good. Its very name is a bad omen. Was not Anubis the god of cemeteries? Emerson's vigilance gradually relaxed as the days passed without any alarming incident. For all its isolation, the West Valley was safer than any city. No one could approach without being observed long before he came close to us. At the end of the third day... Emerson announced that we had almost completed the task for which we had come. We had corrected numerous errors in the existing plan of the valley and located several promising sites that warranted further investigation, including one that offered a suitable hiding place for the scepters. Abdullah was pleased to learn we were nearly finished. Map-making was not a favourite activity of Abdullah's. Like his master, he preferred to dig. How much longer? he asked, as we started back. A week at the outside, Emerson replied. Glancing at me, he added provocatively, Vandergelt Effendi is coming soon. I want to be out of his house before he arrives. 
We had received a telegram from Cyrus the day before, announcing his imminent arrival in Cairo, and saying that he looked forward to seeing us shortly. Perhaps, said Abdallah, hopefully, the cat will stay here with the Effendi. That is a difficulty, Emerson agreed. We will be camping out at Amana. We cannot be bothered feeding and caring for him. A rattle of rock and a pathetically abbreviated squeak nearby preceded the appearance of Anubis, with a limp brown shape in his mouth. You needn't worry about feeding him, I said. Abdallah said something under his breath. Daoud, a big silent man whose placidity was seldom ruffled, glanced uneasily at the cat. His fingers twitched in a ritual gesture designed to ward off evil. The cat disappeared with its prey, and we went on in silence for a time. Then Abdallah said, There is a fantasia tonight at the house of the brother of my father. It is in honor of my visit to the home of my ancestors. But it would be a greater honor if the father of curses and you, Sit Hakim, would come. It would honor us. Emerson replied, as courtesy demanded. What do you say, Peabody? The idea appealed to me. I was anxious to meet Abdallah's uncle, who had a certain reputation in the Luxor area. Born and raised in Gurna, the notorious village of hereditary tomb robbers on the West Bank, he had acquired, by means no one cared to investigate, wealth enough to purchase a fine house on the East Bank outside Luxor. Family pride would require him to hire the finest entertainers for his fantasia. The entertainment at these celebrations consists primarily of music and dancing. In the beginning, I had found Egyptian music painful to my ears. The singers' voices slide up and down a rather limited scale, and the musical instruments are primitive by Western standards. As with most art forms, however, prolonged exposure increases appreciation. I could now listen with relative enjoyment to the nasal singing and the accompaniment of flute and zither, tambourine and zemmer, a form of oboe. The insistent rhythm of the drums, of which there were many varieties, had a particularly interesting effect. I accepted the invitation with proper expressions of gratitude. Taking Emerson's arm... I let the others draw ahead before I said in a low voice, Have you cancelled your interdict against evening activities then? Nothing has occurred since we arrived in Luxor. I have made certain it would not, Emerson replied haughtily. However, this is not the sort of evening activity I was concerned about. I defy the boldest of abductors to snatch you away when you have three such defenders. Seeing my expression, for he knows how I dislike being regarded as a helpless female, he added, We might have dinner at the hotel and drop in on the performance later. Carter is in Luxor. I would like to have a chat with him and prepare him for the great discovery we are about to make. So it was arranged. We sent a message across to Howard, inviting him to dine with us at the Luxor Hotel. And as the sun was setting, we stepped on board the falaka that would take us across the river. Abdallah and Daoud looked like emirs in their best robes and most enormous turbans. The former's long white beard had been laundered till it shone like snow. It was incumbent on us to put on an equally impressive show. Emerson accepted the necessity of this, though he remarked grumpily as I was tying his cravat that he felt like a little boy being taken to visit wealthy godparents. The gangplank, which served as an oar in times of diminished wind, had been pulled in, and we were gliding away from the quay when a long, sinuous form leapt into the boat. In the gathering dust, it was difficult to make out immediately what it was. Emerson let out an oath and tried to push me down onto the filthy bottom of the boat, and Abdallah would have toppled off the seat if Daoud had not caught him. I resisted Emerson's efforts, for I had, of course, immediately identified the latest passenger. It is only the cat, I said loudly. 
Abdullah, for pity's sake, stop thrashing around. You will muss your beautiful robe. Abdullah had never cursed in my presence. He did not do so now, but he sounded as if he were strangling on repressed epithets. Damnation, said Emerson. What a nuisance. I refuse to take a cat to dine at the Luxor, Amelia. Throw it overboard, Abdallah offered. I ignored this suggestion, as Abdallah no doubt expected I would. We haven't time to take it back to the house. Perhaps the boatman has a bit of rope we can use as a lead. I don't approve of dragging cats around on a lead as one does a dog, Emerson declared firmly. They are independent creatures who do not deserve such treatment. The cat walked along the bench, balancing like an acrobat, and settled down next to him. Such a fuss over a cat, Emerson grumbled, scratching Anubis under his chin. If he wanders away, he will simply have to fend for himself. Emerson and I often attract considerable attention when we appear in public. I hope I may not be accused of vanity when I say that on this occasion it was no wonder all eyes were drawn to us, as arm in arm we swept into the dining salon of the hotel. Emerson's splendid height and ruggedly handsome features were set off by the stark black and white of his evening dress, and he walked like a king. I fancy I looked rather well myself. However, I suspected that some of the wide-eyed stares focused on us and the smothered laughter that rippled through the room were occasioned by something other than admiration. Anubis had refused to stay in the cloakroom. He stalked along behind us with a dignity equal to Emerson's, tail erect, eyes straight ahead. His expression also bore a striking resemblance to that of Emerson. The phrase, well-bred sneer, comes to mind. He was better behaved than some of the guests. A party of young male persons, they did not merit the name of gentlemen, at a nearby table had clearly taken too much to drink. One of them leaned so far out of his chair to watch the cat that he fell to the floor. His companions were more amused than embarrassed by this performance, with cheers and comments and the accents of brash young America. They hauled him upright and restored him to his place. Matter boy, Fred, said one of them. Show these folks how a sport takes a fall. Howard arrived in time to see the end of this performance. Perhaps Mrs. Emerson would like to move to another table, he suggested, eyeing the raucous party askance. Mrs. Emerson is not to be disturbed on account of rowdies, said Emerson, beckoning the waiter. He addressed this individual in tones loud enough to be heard throughout the dining salon. Kindly inform the manager that if he does not remove the people over there at once, I will remove them myself. The young men were duly removed. There, you see, said Emerson, smiling at Howard in a kindly fashion. That is the way to deal with such things. We had to explain Anubis who made his presence known to Carter by sniffing loudly at his trouser leg. I suppose the sound and the accompanying sensation must have been a trifle startling to one who was unaware that there was a cat under the table. Once the situation was made clear, Howard laughed and shook his head. I should have learned not to be surprised at anything you and the professor do, Mrs. Emerson. It is like you to take charge of poor Vincy's pet... He is fanatically attached to it, and it does not get on with most people. Since you refer to him as poor Vincy, I take it you are of the opinion that he was treated unjustly? I inquired. Howard looked a little uncomfortable. I don't know the truth of the matter. I doubt that anyone does. He is a pleasant chap, very likeable. I know nothing to his discredit except... But that is just gossip, and not the sort of thing I should mention in your presence, Mrs. Emerson. Ah, I said, motioning to the waiter to refill the young man's glass. Cherchez la femme, or is it les femmes? The plural, decidedly, said Howard. 
He caught Emerson's eye and added quickly, Idle gossip, as I said. Uh, tell me how you are getting on in the valley. Any new tombs? For the rest of the meal, we confined ourselves to professional gossip. Emerson enjoyed himself, tantalising our young friend with mysterious hints and refusing to elaborate on them. Howard was about to explode with curiosity when Emerson took out his watch and begged he would excuse us. One of our friends is having a fantasia in our honour, he explained, stretching the truth a little. We must not be too late. We parted at the door of the hotel. Howard set off on foot, whistling cheerfully, and we bargained for a carriage. The main street of Luxor, lined with modern hotels and ancient ruins, runs along the river. Behind it is a typical village, with streets of bare dirt and clustered huts. No premonition of disaster troubled my mind. I was more concerned about my thin evening slippers and trailing skirts, and with the distance we had to travel. This does not prove, as some claim, that such forebodings are only superstition. It proves that on some occasions they fail one. I could have wished mine had chosen another occasion on which to fail. We left the lights of the hotels behind us and turned onto a narrow lane between fields of sugar cane, higher than a tall man's head. The leaves whispered softly in the night breeze. From time to time, lights from country houses twinkled through the stalks. The night air was cool and refreshing, the mingled odours that mark an Egyptian town, the smell of donkeys, charcoal fires and lack of sanitation, faded to be replaced by a more salubrious scent of green growing crops and fresh earth. The carriage was open. The night air cooled my face. The rhythmic clop of the horse's hooves, the creak of the leather seats blended into a magical mood of romance. I leaned against Emerson's shoulder. His arm was around me. Not even the fixed regard of the cat on the seat opposite could mar the moment. The drive was popular with visitors to Luxor, for it was one of the few country roads wide enough to take carriages. We met one or two others and had to pull off to let them by. The driver glanced back, cursing in Arabic. I could not see what was behind us, but I had already heard the sounds, the pound of galloping hooves and a blurred chorus of voices. Someone was overtaking us, and presumably they meant to pass us, for the noise swelled rapidly. Good God, I exclaimed, trying to look over the high back of the seat. It is just a party of young idiot tourists, Emerson said. They race on this stretch all the time. He leaned forward and tapped the driver's shoulder. Let them go by, he said in Arabic. There is a space there ahead, beyond the wall. The driver obeyed, pulling over in the nick of time, and the other carriage thundered past. Shouts and cheers and a snatch of raucous song hailed us, and someone waved a bottle. Then the carriage lights disappeared around a curve in the road. They will have themselves in the ditch if they go on at that pace, Emerson said, settling back. We proceeded on our way, coming at last into a more thickly settled area. It was a strange blend of humble huts and walled houses, with open fields between. Not far now, said Emerson. I gad I was right. There is the carriage that passed us, in the ditch. "'Shall we not stop and offer assistance?' I asked. "'Why the devil should we? Let them walk back, it will sober them.' He had already ascertained, as had I, that the horse was not injured. It stood patiently by the road while the men tried to right the carriage. They were laughing and cursing. It was clear that no one had been hurt. We had left them some distance behind when suddenly the cat sat up on the seat and stared intently at the side of the road.' We were passing a large building of some sort. It looked like an abandoned warehouse or factory. Before I could see what had attracted the cat's attention, it gathered itself together and sprang out of the carriage. Confound the confounded beast, Emerson shouted. Oh, cuff driver, stop at once. Oh, dear, 
We will never find it in the dark, I lamented. Here, Anubis. Here, kitty, kitty. Two eerily glowing orbs appeared at ground level. There he is, Emerson said. That is a door behind him. He is looking for mice, no doubt. Stay here, Peabody. I'll go after him. Before I could stop him, he had jumped out of the carriage. Then, when it was too late, the recognition of peril struck me like a blow in the face. For as Emerson reached down to take the cat into his arms, the door behind it swung open. I saw Emerson fall forward and heard the sickening thud of the club that had struck his bowed head. Wild with apprehension as to his fate, I could not go to his assistance, for I was fully occupied in fending off the two men who had rushed at the carriage. The driver was face down in the road. A third man held the head of the terrified horse. My evening parasol, curse my vanity, broke as I brought it down on the turban of one of my assailants. It did no more than annoy him. Hard hands captured mine and dragged me out of the carriage. I screamed, something I seldom do, but the situation seemed to warrant it. I did not expect a response. It was with incredulous relief that I heard, through the extremely filthy bag that had been pulled over my head, an answering voice. No voices. Rescue was approaching. I renewed my struggles. The man who held me had to release one of my hands in order to hold the bag in place, and I clawed blindly but effectively at his face. He cried out and called me something rude in Arabic. "'Choke the witch and keep her quiet!' exclaimed another voice. "'Hurry there!' He broke off with a pained grunt, and the man who held me let me go so suddenly that I fell to the ground. The bag was twisted around my head. I could not get it off. When hands seized me again, I struck out as hard as I could. "'Ouch!' was the response. "'A good familiar English, ouch!' I ceased my resistance and concentrated on removing the bag. A voice continued plaintively. Confound it, ma'am, that's not a ladylike thing to do to a fellow when he's only trying to help. I did not reply. I did not thank him or stop to see who he was. Leaping to my feet, I snatched a lantern from the hand of another individual who stood nearby and dashed toward the door of the warehouse. It gaped open and empty. The darkness within was not complete. Moonlight entering through holes in the ruined roof streaked the floor. Calling and rushing back and forth, I swept every foot of that floor with the lantern beam before I was forced to admit the truth. The place was deserted. There was no trace of Emerson, except for a damp spot where some liquid, darker and more viscous than water, had soaked into the dirty floor. Chapter 6 I do not scruple to employ mendacity and a fictitious appearance of female incompetence when the occasion demands it. I fear my behaviour thereafter did me no credit. The sight of the cat strolling toward me sent me into a frenzy. I snatched it up and shook it, and I think I shouted at it, demanding to know what it had done with Emerson. This action appeared to surprise it. Instead of struggling and scratching, it hung limply in my hands and let out an inquiring mew. When its mouth opened, I saw there was something caught on one tooth. It was a shred of dirty cotton that might have come from a native robe. After a time, I heard one of my rescuers remark in a worried voice, Say, boys, the lady's gone off her head. She'll hurt herself tearing around like that. How about I give her a little suck on the jaw? You can't suck a lady, you lummox, was the equally worried reply. Damned if I know what to do. The words penetrated the fog of horror that had enveloped me. Shame overcame me common sense returned. I was shaking from head to foot. The lantern swayed in my hand, but I believe my voice was fairly steady when I spoke. I am not tearing around, gentlemen. I am searching for my husband. He was here. He is not here now. They have carried him off. 
There is another door. They must have gone that way. Pray don't stop me. For one of them had taken hold of my arm. Let me go after them. I must find him. My rescuers were none other than the young Americans who had behaved in so ungentlemanly a manner at the hotel. They had been in the carriage that had passed us. Falling into the ditch must have sobered them, for they were quick to understand and respond to my plea, and very kind in their peculiar American fashion. Two of them immediately went off to follow the trail of the kidnappers, and another insisted I return to the carriage. "'You can't go running around the fields dressed like that, ma'am,' he said, when I would have resisted. "'Leave it to Pat and Mike. They're as good as coonhounds on a trail. How about a nip of brandy? For medicinal purposes, you know.' Perhaps it was the brandy that cleared my head. I prefer to believe it was the resurgence of my indomitable will. Though every nerve in my body ached to join the search, I saw the strength of his argument. And it then occurred to me that there was better help close at hand. One of the young men, there were five of them in all, agreed to go to the house of Abdallah's uncle and tell our rice what had transpired. It was not long, though it seemed an interminable interlude to me, before Abdallah and Dawood were with me. I came perilously close to breaking down when I saw Abdallah's familiar face, distorted by worry and disbelief. Emerson had seemed to him like a god, immune to ordinary danger. Assisted by the young Americans and a posse of their relatives, Abdallah and Dawood searched the fields and the nearby houses, ignoring the legitimate complaints of their occupants. But too much time had passed. He had been carried off and by now could be miles away. The dusty road kept its secret. Too much traffic had passed along it. Dawn was pale in the sky before I could be persuaded to return to the castle. The driver had only been struck unconscious. Restored by brandy and bakshish, he turned the horse and the carriage. Dawood and the cat went with me. Abdallah would not leave the spot. I believe I had the courtesy to thank the Americans. It was not entirely their fault if they regarded the business as an exciting adventure. I find it difficult to recall my sensations during the succeeding days. Events stand out in my memory, sharp and clear as detailed engravings. But it was as if I were enveloped by a shell of clear, cold ice that impeded neither vision nor touch nor hearing, but through which nothing could penetrate. When the news of Emerson's disappearance became known, I was overwhelmed with offers of assistance. This should have touched me. It did not. Nothing could touch me then. I wanted action, not sympathy. The local authorities were hustled and badgered into a show of efficiency uncommon to them. They arrested and questioned every man in Luxor who had cause to hold a grudge against my husband. The list was fairly extensive. At one time, half the population of Gurna, whose inhabitants resented Emerson's war against their tomb-robbing habits, were in the local prison. Hearing of this from Abdallah, several of whose distant kin were among the prisoners, I was able to bring about their release. Abdallah had his own methods of dealing with the men of Gurna, and I knew Emerson would himself have interfered to forbid the kinds of interrogation the local police employed. Beating the soles of the feet with splintered reeds was a favourite method. Our friends rallied round. Howard Carter visited me almost daily. Despite the differences of opinion that had often marked his relationship with Emerson, Neville was the first to offer his crew to help in the search. Telegrams arrived from Cairo, and from Cairo came, in person, Cyrus Vandergeld. He had abandoned his beloved Dahabiyyeh. He had not even waited for the regular train. Ordering a special, he had set out as soon as it was ready, leaving his luggage behind, and his first words to me were words of comfort and reassurance. Don't you fret, Mrs. Amelia. We'll get him back if we have to tear this two-bit town apart. Some good old American know-how is what is wanted here, and Cyrus Vandergelt, USA, is the man to supply it. The years had been kind to my friend. 
There might be a few more silver threads in his hair and goatee, but their sun-bleached fairness looked just the same. His stride was as athletic and vigorous, the clasp of his hand as strong, and his wits as keen as ever. He brought to our problem a cynical intelligence and a knowledge of the world no one had been able to supply. When, in answer to his questions, I described the imprisonment of the Gurner thieves, he shook his head impatiently. Sure, I know those Gurner crooks detest my old pal, but this isn't their style. They're more inclined to throw knives or rocks. This smacks of something more sinister. What have you and the professor been up to lately, Mrs. Amelia? Or has that young rascal Ramses pulled another shady deal? I was tempted to tell him what I suspected, but I did not dare. I cleared Ramses, as was only proper, but replied that I could not explain the event. Cyrus was too shrewd to accept this, nor, perhaps, he knew me so well he sensed my hesitation. He was also too much of a gentleman to question my word. Well, I'll tell you what I think. He isn't dead. They'd have found the... Uh, found him by now. This has got to be a question of ransom. Why else would they hold him prisoner? There are other reasons, I replied, repressing a shudder. Now put that out of your head, Mrs. Amelia. Money is a lot more powerful incentive than revenge. I'll bet you you'll get a ransom note. If you don't, why, we'll offer a reward. It was something to do, at least. The following day, every tree and wall in Luxor bore the hastily printed placards. For reasons of my own which I could not explain to Cyrus, I did not expect results, and indeed the message that arrived that evening was only indirectly related, if at all, to the offer. It was carried by a ragged fella, whose willingness to be detained supported his claim of innocence. He was a messenger only, the man who had given him the letter with a modest tip and an assurance of greater reward upon delivery had been a stranger to him. Few people are good observers, but it seemed evident from the messenger's confused description that there had been nothing distinctive about the man's dress or appearance. We sent the messenger away with promises of untold riches if he was able to supply any further information. I thought he was honest, but if he was not, we were more likely to win him over by bribes than by punishment. Cyrus and I had been in the library. After the messenger had gone, I sat turning the letter over and over in my hands. It was addressed to me in large printed letters. The envelope bore the name of one of the Luxor hotels. If you would like to be alone when you read it, uh, Cyrus began. He had asked my permission to smoke and held one of his long, thin cheroots. That is not why I hesitate, I admitted. I am afraid to open it, Cyrus. It is the first ray of hope I have beheld. If it proves false... But such cowardice does not become me. With a firm hand, I reached for a letter opener. I read through the letter twice. Cyrus held his tongue. The effort must have been difficult. For when I looked at him, he was leaning forward, his face drawn with suspense. Silently... I handed him the letter. I might have given it to an individual I trusted less than I did my old friend without fear of betraying the deadly secret. It was the most suavely villainous, discreetly threatening epistle I have ever read. I felt contaminated by the mere touch of the paper. Your husband is disinclined to confide in us, it began. He claims his memory is faulty. It seems incredible that a man could forget so remarkable a journey in so short a period of time. But recent experiences may well have had an adverse effect upon his mind as well as his body. I do not doubt your recollection is more accurate and that you would be more than pleased to share it with us in writing or in person. I will be sitting on the terrace of the Winter Palace Hotel tomorrow evening at five, in the hope that you will join me for an aperitif.
Let me add only that, as one of your greatest admirers, I would be gravely disappointed if you sent a substitute. Cyrus flung the paper to the floor. Amelia! he cried in poignant accents. You aren't going, are you? You wouldn't be such a blamed fool. Why, Cyrus, I exclaimed. My friend shook out an enormous snowy white linen handkerchief and mopped his forehead. Pardon me, I took a liberty. By using my first name, dear Cyrus, no one is better entitled than you. You have been a pillar of strength. No, oh, but see here, Cyrus insisted. You're as smart at reading between the lines as I am. I don't know what it is this dirty yellow dog wants. But sure as shooting, he isn't going to exchange poor old Emerson for anything in writing. How do you know you were telling the truth? This is just a trick to get a hold of you. Emerson's a tough nut and stubborner than any mule. You couldn't get him to talk if you stuck his feet in the fire or pulled out his... Oh, shucks, honey, I'm sorry. They aren't going to do anything like that. They know it wouldn't work. But if they had you in their filthy hands, he'd spill the beans all right. As would I, rather than be forced to watch while they... I could not complete the sentence. You've got the idea. This ugly cuss needs both of you. That was a cute stunt of Emerson's, pretending to have amnesia. But it won't hold up for five seconds after he sets eyes on you. You can't take the chance, Amelia. It's for Emerson's sake as well as yours. They won't damage him permanently so long as you're on the loose. I realize that, my dear Cyrus. But how can I not go? It is our first, our only lead. You noted that the... Dirty yellow dog seems a fitting description. That he gave no clue as to how I might identify him. That implies that he is someone I know. Cyrus slapped his knee. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You're the sharpest little lady of my acquaintance. But we've got to give this a lot of thought, Amelia. If I were running this scam, I wouldn't be at the Winter Palace. I'd have some innocent bystander pass you a note instructing you to go someplace else, someplace not so safe. You'd do it, too, wouldn't you? I could not, did not deny it. But, I argued, if I were accompanied, not by you, Cyrus, you are too recognizable, but by Abdullah and his friends. Abdullah is as easily recognizable as I am. And be sure, my dear that you would be led on and on by one means or another until you were beyond the reach of friends. I bowed my head. I don't believe I had ever felt such an agonizing sense of helplessness. By risking capture, I would endanger not only myself but Emerson. Our unknown enemy would have no recourse but to murder us once we had told him what he wanted to know. Only by remaining free could I preserve a life dearer to me than my own. And the loathsome letter had given me that much comfort, at least. He lived. Cyrus's voice broke in on my painful thoughts. I haven't asked for your confidence, Amelia, and I won't. But if you could tell me what it is this devil wants, I might be able to come up with an idea. I shook my head. It wouldn't help. And it might endanger you as well. Only two other people... It was like a hammer smashing through the shell of frozen calm that had enclosed me. My only excuse is that I had been so absorbed with Emerson I had neglected other, if lesser, responsibilities. They now came crashing in upon me. With a shriek that echoed among the rafters, I leapt to my feet. Ramses and Neferet! Oh, heaven, what have I done! or, to be more accurate, neglected to do. A telegram. Cyrus, I must send a telegram at once. I was rushing toward the door when Cyrus caught me up. Taking me by the shoulders, he strove to restrain me. Don't go riding off in all directions. You shall send your telegram. Sit down, compose it, while I find a man to take it over to Luxor. Leading me to the desk, 
he thrust pen and paper into my hands. Desperation and remorse gave me the strength to write. When Cyrus returned, I had finished the message. I handed it to him. Without looking at the paper, he took it to the servant waiting at the door. "'We'll be in London tomorrow," he said, returning. "'If it travelled on the wings of the wind, it could not arrive too soon for me,' I cried. "'How could I have failed to realise? "'But it was not until now that I knew for certain.' "'I prescribe a little brandy,' Cyrus said. "'I believe I had to stop to collect myself before I went on. "'I believe I would prefer a whisky and soda, please.' When Cyrus brought it to me, he dropped onto one knee like a medieval page serving his master. You're not only the sharpest little lady I know, but the coolest and the bravest, he said gently. Don't give way now. I reckon I have an idea now what this is all about. You and Emerson, young Ramses, and the girl, Willie Forth's daughter, isn't she? Mm hmm. Say no more, Mrs. Amelia, my dear. And don't worry about the kiddies. If half of what I've heard about that son of yours is true, he can take care of himself. And the girl, too. I always say there is nothing like a whiskey and soda to calm the nerves. After a few sips, I was able to speak more composedly. What a comfort you are, Cyrus. No doubt you are right. All the same, I don't know how I'm going to endure the suspense until I hear from them. It will take at least three days to get a reply. But a benevolent providence spared me that suspense. No doubt it felt I had quite enough to bear already. When Cyrus's servant returned from Luxor, he carried another telegram with him. I had already retired to my rooms, but I was not asleep. Cyrus himself brought the message to my door. How long it had been sitting in the telegraph office, I never determined. Egyptians do not share our Western concern about haste. It was addressed to Emerson, but I did not let that deter me from opening it, for I had seen whence it came. Warning received and acted upon, Walter had written. All is well. Guard yourselves. Letter follows. Guard yourselves. I handed it to Cyrus. He had refused the chair I offered him and stood by the door, hands behind his back, looking extremely uncomfortable. What Puritans these Americans are, I thought, in amusement. Only affectionate concern could have brought him to the room of an unchaperoned married lady after nightfall. And I in déshabille, too. I had snatched up the first garment that came to hand when I heard his knock. It was a particularly frivolous, ruffled, beribboned, lace-trimmed peignoir of yellow silk. The message made Cyrus forget the ruffles and ribbons. Thank heaven, he said sincerely. That relieves one source of anxiety. All is well, he says. Evidently I am more skilled at reading between the lines than you, Cyrus. Why does he repeat, guard yourselves? Something must have happened. Now, that's just your mother's anxiety, my dear. You don't know what Emerson said in his message. He must have sent a telegram to his brother some days ago, warning him of danger. Apparently that is the case. He did not tell me he had done so. No doubt he supposed I would jeer at his concern, as I did on the occasions when he tried to convince me of our peril. How cruelly heaven has punished me for failing to heed him. Cyrus's eyes followed me as I paced back and forth, the skirts of my robes swirling around me. "'I will take what comfort I can from Walter's reassurance,' I went on. "'There is nothing more I can do.' "'Get some sleep,' Cyrus said kindly. "'Don't worry. I'll do whatever I can to serve you.' "'But it was not he who served me best.' Needless to say, I did not sleep. I lay awake as I had done every night since it happened. Not tossing and turning, for that is an exhibition of weakness I do not allow myself, but trying to discover a possible course of action. At least this night I had new information to consider. 
I went over and over every word, every phrase, every comma, even, in that malevolent missive. Every word and every phrase contained sly threats, all the more terrifying for being left to the imagination of the reader, especially an imagination as active as mine. The man who had composed them must be a veritable fiend. And an arrogant fiend. He hadn't even bothered to conceal his nationality. His English was as good, his syntax as elegant as my own. I felt confident he was not a guest at the hotel. Anyone could have stolen stationery from the writing room. As for his aim in proposing a rendezvous, well, Cyrus's reasoning was irrefutable. It agreed with my own. Even if I were cared enough to break my word and betray a helpless people in exchange for my husband's life. But, oh, reader, you know little of the human heart if you suppose that honour is stronger than affection, or that cool reason can overcome loving fear. If the villain had stood before me at that moment with one hand outstretched and the other holding the key to Emerson's prison, I would have thrown myself at his feet and begged him to take what he wanted. Emerson's suspicions had been logical, but unsubstantiated. The letter had turned them from surmise into certainty. It was the location of the lost oasis the fiend was after. But what, precisely, would satisfy his demands? A map? The map? Either he knew it existed, or had deduced that it must. The journey we had made led into the waterless, featureless desert, and only a madman would set out unless he had precise directions. The dirty yellow dog must know we had followed a map of some kind. To the best of my knowledge, only one copy was still in existence. There had been five to begin with. And to complicate the matter still further, two of the five had been deliberately, fatally inaccurate. I had destroyed mine, one of the false maps. Ramsay's copy, the one we had used to reach the oasis, had been lost or mislaid during our rather precipitate departure from the place. Emerson's copy had disappeared even before we left Nubia. That left two, one accurate, one false. The other false copy had belonged to Reggie Forthright. He had left it with me when he set off on his expedition into the desert, and, as he had requested, I had passed it on to the military authorities, together with his last will and testament, before he went into the desert. Presumably, these documents had been sent to his sole heir, his grandfather, when he failed to return. This copy of the map did not concern me for it would only have led the one who followed it to a very dry, prolonged and unpleasant death. The original copy of the map had been in the possession of Lord Blacktower, Reggie's grandfather. It was now in Emerson's strong box in the library at a manor house. Blacktower had given it up, along with the guardianship of Neferet, at Emerson's emphatic request. I had urged that it be destroyed, but Emerson had overruled me. One never knew, he had said. There might come a time, he had said. Had it come. For the second, and I am happy to say last time, my integrity wavered under the impact of overpowering affection. I had to bite down hard on the linen pillowcase before reason again prevailed. I could not trust the honour of a man who clearly had none. Nor would he trust mine. He could not afford to release his hostage until he was certain the information I had given him was accurate. And how could he know that until he had made the journey and returned? I could not have retraced our route or remembered the compass readings. But I did not doubt that Emerson could. He had held the compass and followed the directions. The villain did not need a map if he could force Emerson to speak. No. The rendezvous was a ruse. Our only hope was to find Emerson and free him before... Where could he be? Somewhere in the vicinity of Luxor still, I felt sure. 
The search had been intensive and was proceeding, but it could not penetrate into every room in every house, especially the houses of foreign residents. Egypt enjoyed the blessings of British law, which proclaims that a man's home is his castle. A noble ideal, and one with which I thoroughly agree in principle. Noble ideals are often inconvenient. I well remembered the story of how Wallace Budge had smuggled his boxes of illegal antiquities away while the police waited outside his house, unable to enter until the warrant arrived from Cairo. We needed a warrant, and for that we must have grounds. That was what my devoted friends were trying to obtain. Talking with their informants in the villages, following up gossip about strangers in the city, investigating rumours of unusual activity, and I pinned my hopes on their endeavours. I had especially counted on Abdullah and his influence with the men of Gona, who were reputed to know every secret in Luxor. But as I lay sleepless in the dark, I had to confess I was sorely disappointed in him. I had seen very little of him in the past few days. I knew one reason why he avoided the house. He looked like a white-bearded, turban John Knox when he saw me and Cyrus together. Not that Abdullah would have insulted me by supposing I had the least interest in another man. He was jealous of Cyrus on his own account, resenting anyone who wanted to assist me and Emerson in the slightest way, and resenting Cyrus all the more because his own efforts had proved futile. Poor Abdullah. He was old, and this had been a terrible blow to him. I doubted he would ever fully recover. God forgive me for such doubts, for it was Abdullah who served me best. Cyrus and I were seated at luncheon next day, discussing how we should deal with the matter of the proposed rendezvous, when one of the servants entered and said that Abdullah wanted to speak with me. Have him come in, I said. The servant looked scandalized. Servants, I have found, are greater snobs than their masters. I repeated the order. With a shrug, the man went out and then returned to report Abdullah would not come in. He wished to speak to me in private. I can't imagine what he has to say that he could not say in front of you. I said, rising. Cyrus smiled. He wants to be your sole prop and defender, my dear. Such loyalty is touching, but blamed aggravating. Go ahead. Abdullah was waiting in the hall, exchanging sour glances, and I think low-voiced insults with the doorkeeper. He would not speak until I had followed him out onto the veranda. When he turned to face me, I caught my breath. His sour frown had vanished to be replaced by a glow of pride and joy that made him look half his age. I have found him, Sid, he said. You must not tell the Americani. Abdullah took hold of my sleeve and held me back when I would have rushed back into the house with the news. Drawing me farther away from the door, he went on in an urgent whisper. He would not let you go. It is dangerous, Sitakim. I have not told you all. Then for God's sake, tell me. Have you seen him? Where is he? Abdullah's story gave me pause and forced me to curb my raging impatience. He did not need to caution me that we must move with the utmost discretion, especially since he had not yet set eyes on his master. But what other closely guarded prisoner could there be so close to Luxor? The house is outside the town, near to the village of El Bayadie. It is rented by a foreigner, an Alemani, or Ferran Sawi, a tall black-bearded man, an invalid, it is said for he is pale and walks with a cane when he goes out, which is not often. His name is Schlange. Do you know him, Sit? No, but it is surely not his real name, nor perhaps his true appearance. Never mind about that now, Abdallah. You have a plan, I know. Tell me. 
His plan was the very one I would have proposed myself. We could not demand entry to the house until we were certain Emerson was there, and we could not be certain until we had ended it. So, we will go ourselves, said Abdallah. You and I sit, not the Americani. He went on to list all the reasons why Cyrus should not make one of the party. Obviously, he was reluctant to share the glory, but his arguments had merit. The strongest of them was that Cyrus would try to prevent me from going, and that was unthinkable. I would go mad if I had to sit waiting for news, like some feeble heroine of romantic fiction, and I could trust no one but myself to act with the ruthlessness and determination the situation might well demand. I arranged to meet Abdallah in an hour, in the garden behind the house, and assured him I would find a way of deceiving Cyrus. Do I sound calm and collected? I was, then. I knew I had to be... When I returned to the table where Cyrus awaited me, I gave one of my most convincing performances, a brave, sad smile of forced cheerfulness. He is still pursuing idle rumours, I said, taking up my napkin. I am sorry I was so long, Cyrus, but I had to comfort him and make him feel his efforts were useful. Poor Abdallah. He takes this very much to heart. We returned to discussing our plans, only his part in them, had he but known, for the afternoon. I allowed myself to become increasingly agitated as he continued to insist I not keep the appointment. Someone must go, I cried at last. I could not bear it if we failed to pursue even the frailest hope. Why, sure, my dear. I have it all figured out. I'll go in person to direct operations. As soon as you promise me, you'll not leave the house till I get back. Very well. I yield only because I must, and because I know it is the safest course for him. I shall go to my room now, Cyrus, and stay there with the door locked until you return. I think I may take a little something to make me sleep. Otherwise the minutes will drag too slowly. Godspeed and... Good fortune, my friend. Cyrus patted me clumsily on the shoulder. Handkerchief to my eyes, I fluttered out of the room. When I reached my room, I found Anubis stretched out on the bed. How he had got there, I did not know. He came and went as he pleased, as mysteriously as the afreet the servants believed him to be. Abdallah hated him as much as he feared him, blaming the poor creature for Emerson's capture. Of course, that was nonsense. Cats cannot be held guilty for their actions, since they have no morals to speak of. If I had been given to superstitious fancies, I would have imagined Anubis regretted his inadvertent involvement in the disaster. He spent a good deal of time wandering about the house as if in search of something, or someone and he was often in my room, tolerating and even inviting my caresses. The feel of a compliant cat's fur has a surprisingly soothing effect. After greeting the cat in an appropriate, if hurried, manner, I hastened to change. I dared not wait until after Cyrus had left the house. Abdallah and I had to cross the river and travel a considerable distance and I wanted to reach the suspected house before nightfall. A surreptitious entry into unfamiliar territory is hazardous in the dark. It took only a few minutes to rip off my ruffled gown and replace it with my working costume. I reached automatically for my belt. A voice audible only to my inner ear stopped me. You jangle like a German brass band, Peabody, it reminded me. Sternly repressing the emotion that threatened to overcome me, I abandoned my belt, slipping revolver and knife into my handy pockets. I locked my door, making certain Anubis was inside, and went onto the balcony. The cursed vine I had counted upon to assist my descent proved to be too far away. I had to hang by my hands and drop a considerable distance. Fortunately, there was a flower bed below. Cyrus's petunias and hollyhocks cushioned my fall nicely. 
Abdallah was waiting. I did not question or commend at that time the arrangements he had made. The donkeys, the falaka ready to sail, the horses waiting on the other side. One thought permeated every cell in my frame. Soon I would see him, touch him, feel his arms around me, for as I am sure I need not say, I did not mean to content myself with a cautious reconnoitre and strategic withdrawal. My fingers touched the pistol in my pocket. If he was there, I would have him out, that day, that instant, no matter what or who stood between us. The path Abdallah took followed an irrigation ditch through fields of cabbages and cotton. Half-naked workers straightened and stared after us as we galloped past. Children playing in the courtyard of a house waved and called. Abdallah slackened speed for neither man nor beast, when a careless billy goat, whose goatee and long face gave it a certain resemblance to my friend Cyrus, wandered out into the road, Abdallah dug his bare heels into the horse's flank and soared over the goat. I followed his example. He drew rein at last amid a huddle of huts, where another path crossed ours. Following his example, I dismounted. The place was strangely deserted, only a few men drinking coffee at tables under a rude shelter were to be seen. One of them came to us and handed Abdallah a bundle of cloth before leading the horses away. We must go on foot from here, said Abdallah. Will you wear this, Sit? He shook out the bundle, a woman's enveloping robe of somber black with an accompanying burko, or face veil, after I had put it on, he nodded approval. It is good. You must walk behind me, Sit, and not stride like a man. Can you remember? His bearded lips were twitching. I smiled back at him. If I forget, Abdallah, you must beat me. But I will not forget. No. Come, then. It is not far. As we walked, I glanced at the sun... After so many years in Egypt, I had learned to read its position as readily as the hands of a clock. Even now, Cyrus's agents must be in their positions on the terrace of the Winter Palace Hotel. Was he there, the unknown villain who had laid such a dastardly plot? I prayed he was. If he was absent from his house, our mission of rescue would be easier. My heart gave a great leap when I saw a high, mud-brick wall ahead. Palms and dusty-leaved acacias surrounded it, and the tiled roof of a house showed over the top. It was a sizable establishment, an estate in Egyptian terms, house, gardens, and subsidiary buildings surrounded by an enclosure wall for privacy and protection. Abdallah passed it without breaking stride. I shuffled humbly after him, my head bowed and my heart thudding. Out of the corner of my eye I noted that the wall was high and the wooden gate was closed. When we reached the end of the wall, some sixty feet farther on, Abdallah darted a quick glance over his shoulder and turned aside, pulling me after him. The wall continued now at right angles to the road. Another turn brought us to the third side of the enclosing wall, and after a short distance, Abdallah stopped, gesturing. His meaning was plain, and I could only approve his decision. Behind us, a field of sugar cane formed a green wall that hid us from casual passers-by. We were now at the back of the estate, as far from the main house as was possible. Mud brick the ubiquitous building material of Upper Egypt is convenient but impermanent. The bricks and their plastered outer surface had crumbled, leaving chinks and crevices. I will go first, he whispered. No, you will not, I replied. We must reconnoitre before we attempt to enter. And I am younger. That is, I am a lighter weight than you. Give me a hand up. I threw off the muffling black robe and veil. No disguise would save us if we were discovered inside. I put the toe of my boot into a convenient hole. Abdallah, who had learned early on that it was a waste of time to argue with me, cupped his hands under the other boot and lifted me till I could see over the wall. 
I had hoped to see a garden, with shrubs and trees that could offer concealment. No such amenities appeared, only a bare open space littered with the usual household discards. Scraps of broken pots, rusty bits of metal, rotting melon rinds and orange peel. Of such detritus are formed the kitchen middens dear to the hearts of archaeologists. And they are still in the process of formation in Egypt, for householders commonly dump their trash casually in their yards. This was as nasty a place as any I had seen. Clear evidence that the present occupant of the house was a transient, unconcerned about sanitation or appearance. The only unusual feature was the absence of animal life. No chickens scratched in the dirt, no goats or donkeys nibbled at the scanty weeds. An open shed roofed with bundles of reeds had once served as an animal shelter, to judge by the scattered straw and other evidence. A row of straggling, dusty, tamarisk trees half hid the back of the mansion. There was one other structure visible. A small, windowless building some ten feet square. Unlike the rest of the place, it showed signs of recent repair. There were no gaps in those walls. Every chink had been filled with fresh plaster that showed pale against the older grey-brown surface. The flat roof was solid, not the usual covering of reeds overlaid with mortar. Something of value must be within, or the owner of the property would not have taken such precautions. Hope renewed weakened my limbs. Abdallah gave a pained grunt as my weight pressed heavily on his hands. I was on the verge of completing the ascent, for exultation had momentarily overcome prudence, when a dampening thought occurred to me. Surely something so valuable would not be left unguarded. I could only see the back and one side of the building. There were no windows, but there must be a door on one of the walls I could not see. I motioned to Abdullah to lower me. He was glad to do so, I believe. He was perspiring heavily, and not only from my weight. Suspense gnawed at his vitals as it did at mine. Quickly I described what I had seen. We must assume there is a guard, I whispered. Can you move like a shadow, Abdullah? The old man's hand went to the breast of his robe. I will deal with the guard, Sit. No, no, not unless we must. He may cry out and summon others. We will have to get on the roof. There is an opening of some kind there. I will go first, said Abdullah, his hand still at the breast of his robe. This time I did not argue. The evening breeze had arisen, rustling through the cane and stirring the leaves. The small sounds blended with the equally soft noises we could not avoid making. But they were few. For all his size, Abdullah glided up the wall and over it like the shadow I had mentioned. He was waiting to lift me down when I reached the top. Without pausing, we crept toward the building. It was low, a kennel for a dog or some other beast. Abdullah lifted me up and followed me onto the roof. There was a guard. Silently, though we had moved, something must have alerted him. I heard a mutter and the rustle of fabric as he rose, and then the soft pad of bare feet. We flattened ourselves behind the low parapet and held our breaths. He went round the perimeter of the building, but it was a perfunctory performance, and he did not look up. People seldom do when they are searching. Finally, he settled down again and lit a cigarette. The smoke rose in a thin grey curl, "'wavering in the breeze like a writhing serpent. "'Then and only then did we dare crawl toward the opening. "'It was closed by a rusted grill whose crossbars were set so close together "'that a finger could barely be inserted in the gaps. "'I have not described my sensations, nor will I attempt to do so. "'The greatest of literary giants could not begin to capture their intensity.' I pressed my face to the rusty metal surface of the grill. The interior of the place was not entirely dark. There was another opening, a narrow slit over the door on the wall opposite the one we had climbed. Through it, enough light entered to enable me to see the interior of the reeking den. 
The walls were bare and windowless. The floor was of beaten earth. There was no rug or carpet, only a flat, square shape that might have been a piece of matting. The furnishings consisted of a table, holding a few jars and pots and other objects I could not identify. A single chair, shockingly out of place in that setting, for it was a comfortable armchair of European style, upholstered in red plush, and a low bed. On it lay the motionless form of a man. Abdullah's face was so close to mine, I felt his breath hot against my cheek. Then the sinking sun sent a golden arm through the gap over the door, illuminating the interior. I had not needed light to know him. I would have known that outline, that presence, in the darkest night. But if there had been breath in my lungs, I would not have been able to restrain a cry when I saw the familiar features. Familiar, yet so dreadfully changed. The beard, banished by my decree, had returned, blurring the firm lines of jaw and chin, spreading up his cheeks toward his hairline. His closed eyes were sunken, and his cheekbones stood out like spars. His shirt had been opened, bearing his throat and breast. The memory of another time, another place, assaulted me with such force my brain reeled. Was this how a mocking providence had answered my unspoken appeal for a return to those thrilling days of yesteryear, when Emerson and I had been all in all to one another? Before Ramses? So had he appeared on that never-to-be-forgotten day, when I entered the tomb at Amarna and found him fevered and delirious. I had fought death to save him then, and won. But now... He lay so still, his features pinched and immobile as yellowed wax. Only eyes as desperately affectionate as my own could have marked the almost imperceptible rise and fall of his breast. What had they done to reduce a man of his strength to such a state in only a few days? The dying light, glinting off an object on the table, gave me the answer. It was a hypodermic needle. Scarce had the horror of that sight penetrated my mind when I saw something else. I had observed that his arms were stretched over his head in a stiff, unnatural position. Now I realised why. From the manacles on his wrists, a chain looped over and through the bars of the headboard of the narrow bed. I cannot explain why that detail affected me so powerfully. It was certainly a reasonable precaution... In fact, anyone who wished to keep Emerson in a place where he did not care to remain would have been a fool to neglect such restraints. Nevertheless, it did upset me a great deal, and perhaps the intensity of my outrage accounts for what, as I am told, happened next. I had been vaguely aware of voices at the door. The guard had been joined by another man. They were talking loudly, and I suppose telling improper stories, for there was a good deal of raucous laughter. The sounds faded into a dim insect buzzing. A black cloud enveloped me, and a roaring fury filled my ears. I came back to my senses to find Abdullah's alarmed face nose to nose with mine. One of his hands was clamped over my mouth. The guards have gone to fetch beer, but they will return. He hissed. Do you hear me, Sid? Has the demon departed? I could not speak, so I blinked at him. Finger by finger, watching me nervously, he loosened his grip. I became aware of a sharp shooting pain in my hands. Looking down, I saw that I had seized the heavy grill and lifted it up out of the framework on which it rested. My fingers were torn and bleeding. Abdullah was muttering in Arabic, spells and incantations designed to ward off the powers of evil. The uh, demon has gone, I whispered. How oh, very curious. This is the second time such a thing has happened, I believe. I laughed at Emerson when he told me of the first occasion. I must tell him 
and apologise for doubting him when he... when we... To my consternation, I found I could not control my voice. I lowered my head onto my folded arms. A hand, gentle as a woman's, stroked my hair. My daughter, do not weep. Dost thou believe I would dare to call myself a man and a friend if I left him to lie there? I have made a plan. Abdullah had never spoken to me except with formal respect, nor used a term of endearment. I had known the depth of his regard for Emerson. Love would not be too strong a word, had not that word been corrupted by European romanticism. But I had not been aware that in his own fashion, Abdallah loved me too. Infinitely moved, I replied in kind. My father, I thank thee and bless thee. But what shall we do? He is drugged or sick. He cannot move. I had counted on his strength to help us. I feared we would find him thus, Abdallah replied. One does not chain the lion without clipping his claws, or cage the hawk without... Abdallah, I love and honour thee as a father, but if thou dost not get to the point, I am going to scream. The old man's bearded jaws opened in a smile. The Sith is herself again. We must go quickly, before the guards return. My men wait at the crossroads. What men? Daud and the sons and grandsons of my uncles. They all have many sons, Abdallah added proudly. The sun is setting. It is a good time to attack at nightfall. It didn't occur to me for a moment to protest this dangerous and illegal procedure, but when he tugged at my sleeve, I resisted. I cannot leave him, Abdallah. They may carry him away or kill him if they are attacked. But sit... Emerson will have my heart to eat if you... So long as he is alive to eat it. Hurry, Abdallah, and take care, my dear friend. His hand gripped mine for a moment, and then he was gone. I twisted around to watch and saw him vanish over the wall as silently as he had come. I had, of course, no intention of remaining on the roof. My normal strength might not have sufficed to lift the grill. Fortunately, that little matter had been taken care of. One side of the heavy metal square now rested on the lip of the opening. I had only to push it aside. The opening was, I thought, just large enough to admit my body. It would have to, for I meant to get in by one means or another. Before I could carry out this scheme, I heard the men returning... Their voices were more subdued this time, and after a moment another voice broke in. It spoke Arabic, but I knew from the accent and the tone of command that the speaker was not an Arab. Fear, for my husband, not for myself, and fury strengthened every sinew. He was here, the leader, the unknown villain who had perpetrated this foul deed. The group paused outside the door, and I hesitated. Hands clenched on the metal, scarcely feeling the pain of my bleeding fingers. I must not act prematurely. They had no reason as yet to suspect rescue was imminent. Then the speaker switched to English. Wait here until I come for you. I want him wide awake and rational when he sees you. To my astonishment, the voice that responded in the same language was that of a woman. I tell you, he is not so easily deceived. He will know I am not... That, my dear, is the point of this exercise, to test the truth of his claim of amnesia. In that costume and in the gloom, with a gag hiding the lower part of your face, you look enough like her to deceive an affectionate spouse. For long enough, at least to win a betraying cry of alarm from him. That will tell me what I want to know. And if he believes you are she, I will have at least the means of persuading him 
to tell me what I want to know. A wordless murmur from the woman brought a mocking laugh from the leader. The threat will be enough, I believe. If not, well, my dear, I won't damage you any more than I can help. Every violent emotion I had repressed during the days of waiting now boiled within me, with raging curiosity added to the mix. I had an inkling of what the villain planned, and I was on fire to see my double. His despicable trick might succeed, if the copy was faithful enough. The door swung open, admitting a glow of light. It did not come from the sun, which was now below the horizon. The man who entered carried a lamp. You may believe, reader, I studied his face intently. His voice had been familiar, but the features I saw did not match the appearance I expected. They were distorted by shadows and masked by a heavy black moustache and imperial. It might be he. I could not be certain. Putting the lamp on the table, he bent over Emerson and shook him roughly. There was no response. Straightening, the monster swore under his breath and turned toward the door. I told you to keep out. The woman's voice was almost inaudible. He lies so still. The last dose of opium must have been too strong. Never mind. I'll have him awake and cursing in a moment. We picked up the needle and plunged it into a bottle. The whisper came again. You use too much. He will die. Not until it suits my purpose, was the calloused response. Now get back. He'll come round before long. I forced myself to watch and remain passive. The needle went into a vein with a careless skill that suggested some medical expertise. I made a note of this, even while my skin crawled with loathing and hatred. Whatever the substance was, it was effective. Moments later, Emerson stirred. His first word was a feeble but heartfelt oath. Tears came to my eyes, and I promised myself I would never again complain of any language he chose to employ. His adversary laughed. Awake, are we? Another word or two, if you please. I want to be certain you are able to appreciate the treat I have for you. Emerson obliged with a pithy description of his captor's presumed parentage. The fellow laughed again. Excellent. I presume you are still unwilling to admit me to your confidence? Your conversation has become tedious, said Emerson. How many times must I repeat that I haven't the faintest idea what you are talking about? Even if I were able to supply the information you want, I would not. I have taken a dislike to you. Give up any hope of rescue. The other man's voice hardened. His toe nudged the square object, which I now saw to be a wooden hatch or cover. Have you also forgotten what lies beneath this? Again you repeat yourself, was the bored reply. I don't know where you get these melodramatic notions. Out of some novel, I suppose. This comment seemed to madden the villain. He darted forward. For a moment I thought he would strike his helpless prisoner. Mastering himself with an effort that made his upraised hand quiver, he hissed. The well is at least forty feet deep. If anyone attempts to force his way in here, the guard will see that you have the opportunity to measure its precise depth. Yes, yes, you said that, Emerson yawned. Very well. Let us see if I have found a means of persuading you to change your mind. Leaving the lamp on the table, he went to the door. 
Emerson's eyes followed him. The pupils were so dilated they looked black instead of blue. After a moment, the door opened again, and the man entered, pushing a slighter form before him. She would have deceived me. The costume she wore was an exact copy of my old working uniform. Turkish trousers, boots and all. Even a belt hung with tools. Her hair was the same jet black. It tumbled over her shoulders, as if it had been loosened in a struggle. Her supposed captor's arm pinned hers to her sides and held her back out of the light, so that her features would have been hard to make out even if a white cloth had not covered the lower part of her face. "'A visitor to see you, sir,' said the unknown, in a mocking parody of a butler's announcement. "'Haven't you an affectionate greeting for your wife?' Emerson's face was impassive. Only his eyes moved, from the top of the woman's head to her boots and back again. "'She does appear to be female,' he said, in an offensive drawl. "'Hard to tell at first in that outlandish garb. "'You claim you don't recognise your own wife?' "'I don't have a wife,' Emerson said patiently. I seem to have forgotten a good many things, but of that I am certain. You contradict yourself, Professor. How can you be certain if you claim to be suffering from amnesia? A gasp of laughter came from Emerson's cracked lips. Whatever else may have slipped my mind, I could hardly forget something so monumentally stupid. Never in my weakest moment would I be damned fool enough to saddle myself with a wife. Narrowing his eyes, he went on. Is she, by any chance, the female who brought me food and water yesterday? Or the day before? Can't remember. His eyes closed. The woman had bowed her head. In shame, I hoped... The man who held her loosened his grasp. She shrank back against the wall and pulled the gag from her face. He is fainting, she whispered. Let me give him something, water at least. Fists on his hips, the villain studied her with a sardonic smile. Oh, woman, in our hours of ease, uncertain, coy and hard to please. When pain and anguish wring the brow, a ministering angel thou. Minister, then. If he dies before I can get that damned woman into my hands, I'll have no means of persuading her to talk. He turned to the door, adding over his shoulder, Don't be long. She waited until the door had slammed before relaxing. A long sigh issued from her lips. I have never understood the female sex, said a voice from the bed. Why do you tolerate such treatment? She spun around to face him. You are awake? I thought so. You only pretended... Not entirely, said Emerson. She knelt by the bed, holding a cup of water to his lips and supporting his head while he drank thirstily. He thanked her, in a stronger voice. She lowered his head gently onto the hard mattress and stared at her stained fingers. "'It will not heal,' she murmured. "'Does it pain you?' "'I have the devil of a headache,' Emerson admitted. "'And your poor hands?' Her fingers slid slowly up his right arm and touched the swollen, bloody flesh of his wrist. It would be pleasant to stretch a bit. His voice had changed. I knew that purring note, and a shiver ran through me. I dislike even now admitting the emotion that prompted it. I believe it is not necessary for me to do so. Emerson went on in the same tone. If my arms were free, I could better express the appreciation I feel for your kindness. 
she let out a little laugh, in which coquetry and defiance were mingled. Well, why not? You cannot pass the guards. You are not strong enough. And if you think you can win freedom by holding me hostage, you deceive yourself. No English gentleman would harm a woman. He knows that. The key to his manacles were on the table. I appreciated the refinement of cruelty that left freedom in sight but unattainable. As she bent over him to unlock them, a tress of her hair brushed his face. Well, I would like to believe I could have held firm, even in the face of what was obviously about to transpire. But I had seized the edge of the grill with both hands, and my muscles were tensed when there was an outcry from the direction of the house. Voices shouting, the rattle of gunfire. My faithful Abdullah and his valiant friends had arrived. Rescue was at hand. The time for action had come. One heave of my shoulders pushed the grill aside. I inserted my feet into the opening and... and stuck at a region I prefer not to specify. There was not a moment to lose. Gritting my teeth, I squeezed myself through, landing with bent knees, upright and ready. Pulling out my pistol, I levelled it at the door. In the nick of time, and I might not have been in time owing to that moment of delay, had she not flung herself at the yielding door. Her strength was not great enough. Even as I aimed my pistol, she was crushed behind the opened panel. The sounds of combat rose in pitch, and a dark form rushed in, intent on obeying his leader's dastardly command. There was no time for a reasonable discussion. I fired. I could hardly avoid hitting him, for his body filled the doorway, but the wound was not mortal. His cry, as he recoiled, held more surprise than pain. Cass it, I thought, and fired again. I believe I missed him entirely on that occasion. However, the effect was gratifying. With another howl, he fled. These hired thugs are never reliable. I now turned my attention to the woman, who had emerged from behind the door and stood watching me. It gave me an odd sensation to see her, the shadowy image of myself. Emerson had swung his feet to the floor and sat up. Further effort was obviously beyond him. His face was ashen, and his arms hung awkwardly at his sides. The very act of moving them must have been unutterably painful. He looked from me to the woman at the door and back to me, but he did not speak. "'Let me go,' she whispered. "'If your people catch me, I will go to prison, or worse. "'Please sit. I have tried to help him.' "'Go then,' I said. "'Close the door after you.' "'With one last flashing look at Emerson, she obeyed. "'Then, at last, at last, I could go where I yearned to go. "'I rushed to his side and knelt beside him.' Emotions stifled breath and speech. He stared blankly at me, a faint frown furrowing his brow. One female in trousers is confusing enough, but two is a bit much for a man in my condition. If you will excuse me, madam, I believe I will take advantage of my freedom from restraint to... Oh, damnation! It was his last word, a bitter acknowledgement of his inability to do as he had planned. He fell to his knees and collapsed face down onto the floor. I was too numbed by shock to prevent it. The pistol dropped from my nerveless hand, but I was holding it levelled at the door and cradling Emerson's unconscious head in the other arm when Abdallah's shout informed me that our saviours had arrived. He burst through the door and stopped short, horror replacing the triumph on his face. You weep, it. Allah be merciful. He is not... No, Abdallah. No. It is worse than that. Oh, Abdallah. He does not know me. Chapter 7 Marriage should be a balanced stalemate between equal adversaries. 
Of course, I did not mean what I said to Abdullah. There may be conditions worse than death, but there are few, if any, as irreversible. Gladly would I have searched the length and breadth of Egypt for my husband's dismembered body, as Isis did for Osiris. Cheerfully I would have taken up my Orphean lyre and descended into the nethermost pits of Hades to fetch him back, had such deeds been possible. Unfortunately, they were not. Fortunately, they were not necessary. There was a light at the end of this Stygian tunnel. So long as he lived, anything was possible. And if a thing is possible, Amelia P. Emerson will tackle the job. It took a while to sort things out. My first task was to comfort Abdullah. He sat down on the ground and blubbered like a child, with relief and with distress at seeing his hero laid so low. Then he wanted to rush out and kill a few more people, but there were none. Our victory had been complete, and since our men had not been concerned with taking prisoners, the survivors of the battle had run or crawled or crept away. Among the fugitives, I was chagrin to learn, was the leader. But we will find him, said Abdallah, grinding his teeth. I saw him in the fight before he ran away. It was a bullet from his weapon that wounded Daoud. I will remember him, and Emerson will know. He broke off with a doubtful glance at me. Yes, I said firmly. He will. Now, Abdallah, stop ranting and be sensible. Daoud is not seriously injured, I hope. And your other men? Miraculously, none of our defenders had been killed, though several had been wounded. Daoud, who soon joined us, bore his bloody sleeve like a badge of honour and insisted on helping to carry the litter on which Emerson was borne away. I hated to move him, but the alternatives would have been more dangerous. We could not remain there, and the village offered no accommodations in which I would have put a sick dog. Emerson was deeply unconscious and did not stir, not even when the cart Abdallah had commandeered jolted along the path to the river bank. It goes without saying that I did not leave his side for an instant. Though I hadn't brought my medical kit... My expertise, derided though it often had been by Emerson, assured me that his heart beat strong and steady, and his breathing, though shallow, showed no evidence of distress. The drugs he had been given were enough to account for his present state, though I had reason to suspect he had been kept short of food and water as well. His injuries were superficial, except for the wound on the back of his head. That concerned me most for it must be connected with his loss of memory. What I had taken to be a clever ruse to avoid questioning was the terrible truth. He hadn't been delirious or off his head. His remarks had been rational, his mind clear, except in one rather important particular. As we approached the castle, I saw that it was lit from cellar to attics. I ran on ahead, in order to lose as little time as possible in making Emerson comfortable. When I reached the gate, Cyrus was waiting. I will not endeavour to reproduce his remarks. American profanity is apparently unrelated to the mother tongue or to any other language known to me. Determined as I was to make myself heard, I could not stop the flow of his eloquence. Not until the litter-bearers came in sight with their precious burden did Cyrus break off, with a sound that must have hurt his throat. Taking advantage of his momentary paralysis of speech, I said, "'No questions now, Cyrus. Help me get him to bed, and make sure the doctor is admitted at once. I sent Dawood to fetch him when we passed through Luxor.' After I put my stricken spouse to bed, for I would permit no other than myself to perform that tender duty, Cyrus joined me. Arms folded, he stood looking down at Emerson. Then he leaned forward and lifted one sunken eyelid. Drugged? Yes. What else is wrong with him? I had done all I could. 
tucking in the last end of the bandages I had wrapped around his lacerated wrists, I sat back and nerved myself to admit the painful truth. Apparently they realised, as anyone who knows Emerson must realise, that torture would only stiffen his resistance. He is not seriously injured, except... We agreed, you remember, after we had read the message, that he must be pretending to have amnesia. He was not pretending, Cyrus. He... He did not know me. Cyrus sucked in his breath. Then he said... Opium produces strange delusions. He was perfectly rational. His replies were sensible. Sensible for Emerson, that is. Hurling insults and sarcastic remarks at a man who holds one a chained prisoner is not perhaps very wise. Cyrus let out a brief bark of laughter. Sounds like Emerson, all right. Still, there can be no mistake, Cyrus. Would that there were... Not only did he look me straight in the face and call me madam, but earlier he said... He said... He would never be damned fool enough to saddle himself with a wife. Cyrus's efforts to comfort me were interrupted by the arrival of the doctor. He wasn't the pompous little Frenchman with whose medical inexpertise I had been forced to deal on a previous occasion but an Englishman who had retired for reasons of health to a warmer clime. Evidently the desired effect had been achieved, though his beard was grey and his body cadaverously thin. He moved with the vigour of a young man, and his diagnosis assured me that we were fortunate to have found him. We could only wait, he said, for the effects of the opium to dissipate. Though the dosage had been large, the patient hadn't been under its influence for long. There was every hope, given his splendid physique, that the process of recovery would be neither prolonged nor unduly arduous. The only serious injury was the wound on the back of the head. But this concerned Dr. Wallingford less than it had me. "'There is no fracture of the skull,' he murmured, probing the area with sensitive fingers. A concussion, perhaps. We cannot assess that until the patient has recovered consciousness. His loss of memory, I began. My dear lady, it would be a wonder if his memory were not confused after such a blow on the head and daily doses of opium. Be of good heart. I have no doubt he will make a full recovery. He left after promising to return the following day, and after giving me directions, I did not need, but which further reassured me, since they agreed in every particular with my own intentions. Keep the patient warm and quiet. Try to get him to take nourishment. Chicken broth, I murmured abstractedly. A murmurous musical mew sounded as if in agreement. The cat Anubis had entered, as silently as the shadow he resembled. I stiffened as the animal jumped onto the bed and inspected Emerson from feet to head, pausing to sniff curiously at his face. Abdallah's antipathy toward the beast was based on ignorance and superstition, but, weary and worried as I then was, I found myself beginning to sympathise with him. Had the bearded blackguard who held Emerson captive been Anubis's master? I hadn't been able to make out his features. The voice had reminded me of Vince's, but I could not be certain even of that, for its sneering tone had been quite unlike the gentle, well-bred accents of the man I had known so briefly. Anubis returned to the foot of the bed, where he lay down and began washing his whiskers. I relaxed, feeling a little foolish. Cyrus returned after showing the doctor out. He announced that the cook was boiling a chicken and asked what else he could do to help me. Nothing, thank you. He's taken a little water. That is a good sign. I am very impressed with Dr. Wallingford. He has an excellent reputation. But if you would like to send to Cairo... Um... We will wait a while, I think. I expect you are full of questions, Cyrus. I will answer some of them now, if you like. I know most of the story. I gave myself the pleasure of a little chat with Abdullah. Seating himself in an armchair, Cyrus took out one of his cheroots and asked my permission to smoke. By all means, 
Emerson loves his nasty pipe. The smell of tobacco smoke may rouse him. I hope you were not too hard on Abdullah. I couldn't ball him out, could I, for succeeding when I failed? Nor for letting you bully him into going along? You've got him right under your little thumb, Amelia. It was his devotion to Emerson that inspired him. But, yes, I think he is fond of me, too. I never realized that. It was a touching moment when he opened his heart to me, as he had never done before. Hmm, said Cyrus. I suppose I can't persuade you to get some rest while I keep an eye on my old pal. You suppose correctly. How could I sleep? Go to bed, Cyrus. You must be tired. I didn't ask if your mission to the hotel was unsuccessful. I'm plumb wore out, it's true. But what did it was coming back here and finding you gone. I was afraid the message had been a stunt to get me out of the way so they could carry you off. I don't want to spend another couple of hours like those. Dear Cyrus, but all's well that ends well, you see. Let's hope so. Cyrus crushed out the cheroot. His hand was a trifle unsteady, and this evidence of affectionate concern moved me deeply. Well, I'll leave you to your vigil. Call me if... Oh, shucks, I almost forgot. Mail came this afternoon. There's a letter for you from Chalfont. The promised letter, I cried. Where is it? Cyrus indicated a pile of letters on the table. The one on top was the one I wanted. Its bulk suggested that the writer had quite a story to tell. And so it proved. A brief note from Walter introduced the missive. I have decided to let young Ramses have his say. His epistolary style has a panache mine lacks. You know your son well enough not to be misled by his tendency toward exaggeration. Have no fear for us. We have taken all precautions, as you will see. It is for you, dear brother and sister, that we are anxious. Please keep us informed. There followed several pages closely written in a hand with which I was only too familiar. I can do no better than copy out this extraordinary document in its entirety, for it is impossible to summarize Ramses. Dearest Mama and Papa, it began, I trust this finds you well. We are all well. Aunt Evelyn assures me my hair will soon grow back. After I had recovered from the effect of this startling statement, I read on. Your telegram was of great assistance in preventing a more serious event than actually occurred, but I already had reasons for suspecting that a game of some sort was afoot. While making my usual rounds of the estate in order to run off poachers and look for traps, I came upon a roughly dressed individual who, instead of running away when I challenged him, ran at me with the evident intention of taking hold of me. Retreating, as discretion seemed to indicate for he was approximately twice my bulk. I led him through a thorn thicket and left him hopelessly entangled in the branches my lesser height and greater knowledge of the terrain enabled me to avoid. He was shouting loudly and profanely as I departed the scene, but when Uncle Walter and I and two of the footmen returned, he had fled. Uncle Walter, I regret to report, scoffed at my claim that the fellow's behaviour roused the direst suspicions as to his motives for being there. After Papa's telegram arrived, however, Uncle Walter was gentlemanly enough to apologise and intelligent enough to reconsider the case. After a council of war, we determined to take defensive measures. As I pointed out, it was safer to err on the side of excess than to fail from lack of caution. Aunt Evelyn wanted to call the constable. She is a very kind person, but not practical. Uncle Walter and I persuaded her that we had no grounds for requesting official assistance and that in order to convince officialdom of the validity of our reasons for concern, we would have to disclose matters we had sworn to keep secret. Our defensive force, therefore, consists of the following. Number one, Gargery. He was very pleased to be asked. Number two, Bob and Jerry. As you know, they are the strongest of the footmen and familiar with our habits. You will recall that Bob was of great assistance in our attack on Maldi Manor, 
when I was fortunate enough to effect your escape from the dungeon. Number three, Inspector Cuff. I should say former Inspector Cuff, since he has retired from the force and is growing roses in Dorking. I spoke to him personally on the telephone, a most useful device, we must install one at Amana House. And after he stopped sputtering and listened to what I had to say, he was persuaded to join us. I believe he is bored with roses. Do not fear, Mama and Papa, we did not disclose the secret. I flatter myself that the inspector has enough confidence in my humble self to believe my assurance that the matter is serious. Uncle Walter's confirmation was of some small assistance in this regard. It was fortunate, or if you will permit me to say so, far-sighted, that these measures were instituted, for Inspector Cuff, the last to arrive, had not been in the house twenty-four hours before the anticipated attack occurred. It came about in this wise. Finally, I thought, turning the page, and ground my teeth when instead of telling me what I ached to know, Ramses went off on another tangent. If I have not mentioned Neferet, you may be certain it is not because she was inactive or deficient in courage and intelligence. She is... Here, several words had been scratched out. Either Ramsay's vocabulary had been inadequate to express his feelings, or he had repented of having expressed those feelings so openly. She is a remarkable person. She... But perhaps an account of what occurred will demonstrate her qualities more effectively than mere words of mine could do. I had anticipated, erroneously as it turned out, but not without reason, that Neferet would be the person most in need of protection. For if Papa's hints in his telegram and my own deductions based on those hints were correct, she was the one most directly connected with the aforesaid secret. It is true that my theory ignored the fact that the dishevelled gentleman had apparently been intent on seizing me. So perhaps chivalry had clouded my ordinarily acute reasoning powers. I once remember thinking that being a little gentleman seemed more trouble than it was worth. The incident I am about to relate confirmed that opinion, as you will see. I certainly hope so, I muttered, wishing I had the little gentleman with me, so I could shake him and force him to get to the point. Neferet had set out in the carriage that day, as usual, to go to the vicarage for a Latin lesson and religious instruction. She was attended not only by Gargery, who insisted on driving, but by Bob and Jerry as well. Uncle Walter felt this would be protection enough, but I had a certain foreboding, such as Mamma often has, about the expedition. So I took one of the horses and went after them, remaining at a discreet distance, for I had reason to suppose that Gargery, Bob, Jerry, and perhaps Neferet herself would object to this procedure. They had let their guard down, as they later admitted, when they were almost at their destination. After passing along that deserted stretch of road, you remember it, where ambush might be expected and where nothing of the sort ensued, they were within a hundred yards of the first house of the village when another carriage appeared around the curve in the road, coming toward them at a considerable speed. Gargery drew to one side to let them by. Instead of doing so, the driver pulled up and even before the wheels had stopped rolling, men burst out of the carriage. I saw everything that transpired, for the road ran straight at that point, and nothing impeded my vision. I am sure I need not tell you I reacted promptly and swiftly, urging my steed to a gallop. Before I was able to reach the scene of action, Gargery had taken a cudgel, his favourite weapon, from under his coat, and smashed it down on the head of the individual who was attempting to pull him from the seat. Bob and Jerry were grappling with three other miscreants. A fifth man tugged at the door of the carriage. A cry burst from me at this terrible sight, and I fear I so forgot myself as to kick poor Mazeppa in an attempt to induce greater speed. This turned out to be unwise as well as unkind. Unaccustomed to such treatment, Mazeppa came to a sudden halt, and I fell off. I landed on my head. Undaunted, despite the blood that flowed freely from the wound, I was crawling toward the scene of battle when rough hands seized me and a voice shouted, I've got him, come on lads, hold him off. Or words to that effect. The lads held them off with such success 
that my captor reached the criminal's carriage and transferred his grip to the back of my neck and the seat of my trousers, preparatory, one must suppose, to pitching me inside. At that moment, when all seemed lost, I heard an odd whistling sound, followed by a soft thud. The man, in whose grip I hung helpless and dizzy, for a blow on the head, as you know, has the effect of disorienting the recipient to a considerable degree, shrieked aloud and dropped me. I am happy to report that discretion prevailed over the lust for battle that had brought me to my predicament. I rolled under the carriage, out the opposite side, and into a convenient ditch. I was plucked from this refuge a few moments later by Gargery, in time to see the miscreant's vehicle retreating in a cloud of dust. My knees were a trifle unsteady, so Gargery very kindly held me up by my collar, while my eyes sought the object of my chief concern. Nafaret, I gurgled. I had swallowed a quantity of rather muddy water. She was there, leaning over me, an angelic vision. Ramses had crossed this out, but the words were legible. Her face, pale with concern. For me. Dear brother, she cried in poignant accents, you are wounded, you are bleeding. And with her own hand, careless of the mud and gore that stained her spotless white gloves, she parted the hair on my brow. It was not my injury, but the sight of what she held in her other hand that struck me dumb. A state, Mama might claim, that is uncommon with me. The object was a bow. Swooning, I was carried away by Gargery, and we soon found ourselves safe at home. Unfortunately, I came back to my senses before the doctor stitched up my head. It was cursed painful. That was when some of my hair was cut off, but Aunt Evelyn says it will soon grow back. Everyone else was unhurt, except for bumps and bruises. It was Neferet herself, as you may have deduced, who saved the day. The villain who was attempting to open the carriage door went sprawling, his nose bloodied, when she slammed it into his face. And the villain who carried me off was deterred by an arrow, directed with a skill worthy of Robin Hood himself, if the legend is to be trusted which I doubt it is. The bow she had concealed under her heavy cloak, the weather being quite chilly, was the one she had brought with her from Nubia. Unlike the composite bows carried by the military, hers is a single-staff weapon only 29 inches long employed ordinarily for hunting. But why, one might ask, had she deemed it expedient to carry such a weapon? I did, in fact, ask and she answered the question after my affectionate friends had gathered around my bedside for a council of war. I have kept a weapon close at hand ever since the professor's telegram arrived, she explained coolly. He is not a man to start at shadows, and although I am deeply grateful for the loyal protection of our friends, it is not in my nature to cower in a corner while others risk their lives in my defence. The professor made it clear that Ramses and I were the ones in danger, not of assassination, but of abduction. We know what the abductors want. Who could give them that information? Only your mother and father, Ramses. They alone know the way to the place the villains seek. I could retrace my steps, I began, with some indignation. She raised a finger to her lips. I know that, dear brother, but in this world children are treated like pet animals, without sense or memory, and you are one of the few who could do what you claim. I could not. If they want you, it can only be as a hostage to wring information from those who love you. And you, I hasten to assure her. Those who threaten us may reason so. Fear not, I will defend myself. I carry a knife as well as a bow, and will use either if I must. Her face grew grave. It is not for us, I fear, but for the Professor and Aunt Emilia. They have not our strong protectors. They are in the greatest danger. Her wise words made me realize, dear Mamma and Papa, that in my concern for her I had not given enough attention to your predicament. I should be at your side. I proposed this to Uncle Walter, but he absolutely refused to buy a steamship ticket for me, and since I only possess one pound eleven shilling sixpence, I cannot carry out the transaction without his financial assistance. Please telegraph at once and tell him to let me come. I am reluctant to leave Neferet, but the duty and, of course, affection of a son supersedes all other responsibilities. Besides, she has Gargery and the others. 
Besides, she does very well without me. Please telegraph immediately. Please be careful. Your loving, and at this point in time extremely anxious, son, Ramses. P.S. Gargery was very disappointed that he could not rescue Neferet like Sir Galahad. P.P.S. If you telegraph immediately, I can be with you in ten days' time. P.P.P.S. Or thirteen at the most. P.P.P.P.S. Please be careful. It would have required a great deal to turn my attention from Emerson at that moment. But this astonishing epistle almost succeeded. I recalled having mentioned to Ramses on one occasion that literary flourishes were best restricted to the written form. Obviously, he had taken the suggestion to heart, but his questionable literary devices, swooning indeed, what had the child been reading, did not conceal his genuine emotion. Poor Ramses. To be rescued instead of rescuer, to fall off a horse, to be dragged out of a ditch and held up like a sack of dirty laundry, dripping with muddy water before the eyes of the girl he yearned to impress. His humiliation had been complete. And he had taken it like a man and an Emerson. He had only praise for her whose achievements had cast his into the shade. And how touching to a maternal heart was that piteous admission. She does very well without me. Poor Ramses, indeed. As for Neferet, her behaviour confirmed my initial impression of her character and convinced me that she would be a worthy addition to our little family. She had acted with the same vigour and independence I would have displayed, and as effectively. I am not accustomed to cower in corners, either. The very idea of Ramses at my side trying to protect me chilled the blood in my veins, and I only hoped Walter could prevent him from robbing a bank or playing highwaymen in order to get the money. Not that I doubted the sincerity of his protestations. I must remember to telegraph next day, though how precisely to couch the message presented some difficulty. To inform without alarming them... At that moment, the rustle of linen brought me flying to Emerson's side. He had turned his head. It was only a slight movement, and he did not stir again, but I hovered over him the rest of the night, counting every breath and tracing every line of that beloved face with gentle fingers. The beard would have to go, of course. Unlike his hair, Emerson's beard is very stiff and prickly. I objected to it as well on aesthetic grounds, for it hid the admirable contours of his jaw and chin, as well as the cleft in the latter organ. In time of emotional distress, the mind tends to focus on petty details. That is a well-known fact, and accounts, I believe, for my failure to consider several problems rather more important than Emerson's beard. They were brought to my attention the following morning when Cyrus entered to fetch me a breakfast tray and inquire how we had passed the night. I persuaded him, without difficulty, to join me in a cup of coffee and entertained him by reading excerpts from Ramsay's letter. "'I must telegraph at once to reassure them,' I said. "'The question is, how much shall I tell them? "'They know nothing of what has transpired.' "'My dear Amelia!' Cyrus who had been chuckling and shaking his head over the letter, immediately sobered. If they don't know already, they soon will. We made no secret of his disappearance. Heck, we plastered the whole town with notices. Unless I miss my guess, the English newspapers will get wind of the story from their Cairo correspondence. And then we'll be in the headlines. You and your husband are news, you know. The seriousness of the matter was immediately apparent to me. With Cyrus's help, I determined on a course of action. We must telegraph at once, assuring our loved ones that Emerson had been found and that we were both safe and well, and warning them not to believe anything they read in the newspapers. For I shudder to think what garbled versions of the facts those confounded journalists will report, I said bitterly. Cuss it, Cyrus! I ought to have anticipated this. I have had enough unpleasant encounters with the gentlemen of the press." You had other things on your mind, my dear. The most important thing is to get poor old Emerson back on his feet and in possession of his senses. He'll take care of the reporters. 
No one does it better, I replied, with a lingering glance at the still face of my spouse. But the danger is not over. The man responsible for this dastardly act got clean away. We dare not assume he will abandon the scheme. We cannot relax our vigilance for an instant, especially while Emerson lies helpless. Don't worry about that. Cyrus stroked his goatee. Abdullah's relatives have surrounded the place like a band of Apaches besieging a fort. They've already manhandled my cook and beat up a date peddler. With my mind at ease on this point, and the telegram having been dispatched, I could return my attention to where my heart already lay. It was a trying time, for as the effects of the opium wore off, other, more alarming symptoms appeared. They were due, Dr. Wallingford thought, to the other drugs Emerson had been given, but treatment was impossible, since we did not know what they were. Abdallah had returned to the prison to find the place swept clean. The police denied having taken anything away, and I was prepared to believe them, since they would not have had the sense to search the scene of the crime. It was evident that the kidnapper had returned to remove any evidence that might incriminate him. This was an ominous sign, but I had no leisure to consider the ramifications or contend with the reporters who, as Cyrus had predicted, besieged us clamouring for news. Dr Wallingford moved into one of the guest rooms and concentrated on his most interesting patient. His full attention was required, for coma was succeeded by delirium, and for two days it required all our efforts to prevent Emerson from harming himself or us. At least we know his physical strength is not seriously impaired, I remarked, picking myself up off the floor where Emerson's flailing arm had flung me. It is the unnatural strength of mania, declared Dr. Wallingford, rubbing his bruised shoulder. Nevertheless, I find it reassuring, I said. I have seen him this way before. It is my own fault. I ought to have known better than... Get hold of his feet, Cyrus. He's trying to get out of bed again. Anubis had prudently retired to the top of the dresser, where he squatted, watching with wide green eyes. In the brief lull that followed Emerson's fit of agitation, I became aware of a low rumbling sound. The cat was purring. Abdullah would have taken it for another sign of diabolical intelligence, but I felt a strange, irrational surge of renewed hope as if the creature's purr were a good omen, rather than the reverse. I needed all the encouragement I could find during the dreadful hours that followed. But finally, after midnight on the third night, I dared to believe the worst was over. At last, Emerson lay still. The rest of us sat round the bed, nursing our bruises and catching our breath. My eyes blurred, I was giddy and light-headed from lack of sleep. The scene was unreal like a two-dimensional photograph of some past event, the smoky lamplight casting its shadows over the strained faces of the watchers and the emaciated features of the sick man, the silence unbroken except for the rustle of leaves outside the open window and Emerson's slow, regular breathing. My senses did not dare to register that sign at first. When I rose and tiptoed to the bed, Dr Wallingford came with me, his examination was brief. When he straightened, his tired face wore a smile. It is sleep. Sound, natural sleep. Get some rest now, Mrs. Emerson. He will want to see you smiling and well when he wakes in the morning. I would have resisted, but I could not. Cyrus had to half carry me into the adjoining dressing room, where a cot had been placed for me. The unconscious mind in which I firmly believe, despite its questionable status, knew I could now abandon my vigil, and I slept like the dead for six hours. Waking, filled with energy, I bounded from bed and rushed to the next room. At least such was my intention. I was brought to a sudden stop by an apparition that appeared before me, shockingly pale, dreadfully dishevelled, wild-eyed and unkempt, it was several seconds before I recognised my own image reflected in the mirror over the dressing table. 
A quick glance into the adjoining chamber assured me that Emerson still slept and that the good doctor, eyeglasses askew and cravat loosened, dozed in the chair next to the bed. Hastily I set about making a few essential repairs, smoothing my hair, pinching colour into my cheeks, assuming my most elaborately ruffled and beribboned dressing gown. My hands shook. I was as tremulous as a young girl, preparing for an assignation with her lover. Sounds from the next room brought me flying to the door, for I recognised the querulous grunts and groans with which Emerson was wont to greet the day. If he was not himself again, he was producing a good imitation. Cyrus, who must have been listening outside the door, entered when I did. Dr Wallingford waved us back. Leaning over the bed, he said, "'Do you know who you are?' He was weary, poor fellow, or no doubt he would have found more felicitous phraseology. Emerson stared at him. "'What a damned fool question!' he replied. "'Of course I know who I am. "'More to the point, sir, who the devil are you?' "'Please, Professor,' Wallingford exclaimed. "'Your language. There is a lady present.' Emerson's eyes swept the room in a slow survey and came to rest on me, where I stood with hands clasped to my breast in order to still the tell-tale flutter of the ruffles that betrayed my wildly beating heart. If she doesn't care for my language, she can leave the room. I did not invite her. Cyrus could contain himself no longer. You blame fool, he burst out, clenching his fists. Don't you recognize her? If she hadn't dropped in uninvited a few days ago, you wouldn't be alive and blaspheming this morning. Another confounded intruder, Emerson muttered, glowering at Cyrus. He looked back at me, and this time there could be no mistake. The brilliant blue orbs were clear and conscious, and cool with indifference. They narrowed, and his brows drew together. Wait, though. The features are familiar, though the costume is not. Is she the unsuitably attired female who popped into my pleasant little room last night like a cork forced into a bottle and then proceeded to pepper the empty doorway with bullets? Females should not be allowed to handle firearms. It wasn't last night, it was three days ago, snapped Cyrus, his goatee quivering. She saved your life with that pistol, you... you... He broke off with an apologetic glance at me. A gleam of white teeth appeared amid the tangle of Emerson's beard. I do not know you, sir, but you appear to be a hot-tempered fellow, unlike myself. I am always calm and reasonable. Reason compels me to confess that the doorway may not have been empty, and that this lady may have rendered me some small assistance. Thank you, madam. Now go away. His eyes closed. A peremptory gesture from the doctor sent both of us from the room. Cyrus, still quivering with indignation, put a protective arm around me. Gently but decisively, I removed it. I am quite composed, Cyrus. I do not require to be soothed. Your courage amazes me, Cyrus exclaimed. To hear him deny you, to sneer at your devotion and daring. Well, you see, I said with a faint smile. It isn't the first time I have heard such remarks from Emerson. I had hoped, Cyrus, but I had not really expected anything else. Having nerved myself to expect the worst, I was prepared for it. In silence, he placed his hand on my shoulder. I allowed it to remain, and neither of us spoke again until the doctor emerged from Emerson's room. I'm sorry, Mrs. Emerson, he said gently. "'Pray don't be disheartened. "'He has not forgotten everything. "'He knows his name and his profession. "'He asked after his brother, Walter, "'and declared his intention of proceeding at once to his excavations.' "'Where?' I asked intently. "'Did he say where he intended to work this season?' Amana was the reply. "'Is that important?' "'It was at Amana that he was working when we became well acquainted. Hmm, yes. You may have found the clue, Mrs. Emerson. 
His memory of events is clear and precise up to a period approximately 13 years ago. He remembers nothing that has happened since that time. Since the day we became acquainted, I said thoughtfully. The doctor put his hand on my other shoulder. Men seem to think this gesture has a soothing effect. Don't despair, Mrs. Emerson. He is out of danger, but he is still much weaker than his um, peremptory manner might lead you to believe. It may be that his memory will return as his health improves. And maybe it won't, muttered Cyrus. You're pretty doggone nonchalant about it, Doc. Is there anything you can do? I'm not a specialist in nervous disorders, was the huffy reply. I would certainly welcome a second opinion. No offence meant, Cyrus said quickly. I guess we're all pretty tired and short-tempered. A specialist in nervous disorders, you said. Hey, wait a minute. His face lit up and he stopped twisting his goatee, which had gone quite limp under his attentions. I guess the good Lord must be on our side after all. One of the world's greatest experts in mental disorders is on his way to Luxor at this very moment. If he's not already here. Talk about the luck of the devil. What is his name? The doctor asked skeptically. Schadenfreude. Sigismund Schadenfreude. He's a crackerjack, take my word for it. The Viennese specialist? His theories are somewhat unorthodox. But they work, Cyrus declared enthusiastically. I was a patient of his myself a few years ago. You, Cyrus? I exclaimed. Cyrus looked down and shuffled his feet like a guilty schoolboy. You remember Amelia? That business with Lady Baskerville? I gave my heart to that woman and she smashed it to smithereens. I went around like a droopy ear and hound dog for quite a while. But then I heard about Schadenfreude. He set me straight in a matter of weeks. I am very sorry, Cyrus. I had no idea. Water over the dam, my dear. I've been footloose and fancy free ever since. I told Schadenfreude when we parted company to let me know if he was ever in Egypt and I'd show him what an archaeological dig was like. He must have arrived in Cairo right after I left. Got his letter a few days ago. Paid no attention to it at the time. Other things on my mind. But if I remember rightly, he planned to be in Luxor sometime this week. What do you say I run over and see if he's available? Of course, the matter was not so easily arranged as Cyrus's sympathetic enthusiasm led him to hope. It was evening before he returned, towing the famous Viennese physician along like a pet dog. Schadenfreude was a curious figure very thin in the face and very round in the stomach. His cheeks so pink they looked rouged. His beard so silvery bright it suggested a halo that had slipped its moorings. Myopic brown eyes peered uncertainly through his thick spectacles. There was nothing uncertain about his professional manner, however. A most interesting case, to be sure, he declared. Herr Vandergelt has given me some of the particulars. You have not forced yourself upon him, Gnädige Frau. I stiffened with indignation. But a wink and a nod from Cyrus reminded me that the famous doctor's imperfect command of English must be responsible for this rude question. He has slept most of the day, I replied. I have not insisted upon my relationship with him, if that is what you mean. Dr. Wallingford felt that might be unwise at this stage. Sehr gut, sehr gut. Schadenfreude rubbed his hands together and showed me a set of perfect white teeth. I will alone the patient examine. You permit, Frau Professor. He did not wait for my permission, but flung the door open and vanished within, closing said door with a slam. Peculiar little guy, isn't he? Cyrus said proudly, as if Schadenfreude's eccentricities proved his medical prowess. Uh, quite, Cyrus. 
Are you certain? My dear, he's a wonder. I'm a living testimonial to his talents. Schadenfreude was inside quite a long time. Not a sound emerged, not even the shouts I fully expected to hear from Emerson. And I was getting rather fidgety before the door finally opened. Nein, nein, gnädige Frau, said Schadenfreude, holding me back when I would have entered. It is a discussion we must have before you speak so much as a single word to the afflicted one. Lead us, Herr van der Gelt, to a place of discussion and supply, bitte. Something of refreshment for the lady. We retired to my sitting room. I refused the brandy the doctor tried to press upon me. The situation was too serious for the temporary consolation of spirits, and he applied himself to the beer he had requested with such gusto that when he emerged from the glass, his moustache was frosted with foam. However, when he began to speak, I had no inclination to laugh at him. Many people at that time were sceptical about the theories of psychotherapy. My own mind is always receptive to new ideas, however repellent they may be, and I had read with interest the works of psychologists such as William James and Wilhelm Wundt. Since some of their axioms, particularly... Herbart's concept of the threshold of consciousness, agreed with my own observations of human nature, I was inclined to believe that the discipline, when refined and developed, might offer useful insights. Here, Dr. Schadenfreude's theories were certainly unorthodox, but I found them horribly plausible. The immediate cause of your husband's amnesia is physical trauma, a blow on the head, has he often suffered injury to that region? Why, not to an excessive degree, I began. I don't know about that, Cyrus demurred. I can remember at least two occasions during the few weeks we were together at Baskerville House. There's something about my old pal that makes people want to beat him over the head. He does not avoid physical encounters when he is defending the helpless or righting a wrong, I declared. Also... But the blow was only the catalyst, the immediate cause. It broke not only his head, but the invisible membrane of the unconscious mind. And from this rent, this weakened part of the fabric, rushed fears and desires long suppressed by the conscious will. In short, in lay terms, gnädige Frau und Herr van der Gelt, he has forgotten the things he does not want to remember. You mean, I said painfully, he does not want to remember me. Not you as yourself, Frau Emerson. It is the symbol he rejects. When a man gets to talking about his own subject, he is inclined to be verbose. I will therefore summarize the doctor's lecture. I must warn the reader that some of his statements were quite shocking. Man and woman, he declared, were natural enemies. Marriage was at best an armed truce between individuals whose basic natures were totally opposed. The need of woman, the homemaker, was for peace and security. The need of man, the hunter, was for the freedom to prey upon his fellow men and upon women. The doctor put this more politely, but I caught his meaning. Society aimed to control these natural desires of man... Religion forbade them, but the walls of constraint were constantly under attack by the brute nature of man, and when there was a rent in the fabric, the brute burst forth. Good gracious, I murmured, when the doctor paused to wipe his perspiring brow. Cyrus had gone beet red and was biting his lip to repress strangled notes of indignation and denial. Oh, gone it, Doctor. I have to object to your language in the presence of Mrs. Emerson and to your slur upon the masculine gender. We aren't all uh, ravening beasts. You did say ravening, didn't you? Ravening and lusting, said Schadenfreude happily. Yes, yes, that is the nature of man. Some of you repress your true nature successfully, mein Freund. But beware. The greater the control, the more the pressure builds. 
and if there is a rent in the fabric of the walls. Boom! Cyrus jumped. Now see here, Doc. Be calm, Cyrus, I urged. The doctor is not being rude. He is being scientific. I am not offended, and indeed I find some sense in his diagnosis. However, I am not so much interested in a diagnosis as in a cure. To employ your own metaphor, Doctor, and a striking one it is, how do we force the um, beast back behind the wall, and what kind of plaster do we use to mend it? Schadenfreude beamed approvingly at me. You have an almost masculine directness, Frau Emerson. The procedure is obvious. One does not employ brute force against brute force. The ensuing struggle might wound both combatants mortally. Striking as the metaphor is, I would prefer a more practical suggestion, I said. What am I to do? Would hypnosis... Schadenfreude shook a playful finger at me. Ah, Frau Emerson, you have been reading the works of my more imaginative colleagues. Breuer and Freud are correct in stating that the operative force of the idea which was not abreacted by allowing its strangulated effect to find a way out in speech or action must be relived, brought back, in other words, to its status nascendi. But hypnosis is only a showman's toy that may do more harm than good by substituting the practitioner's own preconceptions for the psychical processes of the patient. I believe I have rendered accurately the general sense of his discourse. He had to pause for breath at this point, not surprisingly, and when he went on, it was in more specific terms. The memory is like a lovely flower, gnädige Frau. It cannot be brought into existence fully formed. It must grow slowly and naturally from the seed. The seed is there in his mind. Return him to the scenes he does remember. Do not force memories upon him. Do not insist on facts he honestly, sincerely believes to be false. This would be disastrous in his case. For if I read his character correctly, he is the sort of man who will insist on doing precisely the opposite of what you have told him to do. You got that right, Cyrus agreed. But your suggestions are still too general, I complained. Are you saying that we ought to take him back to Amana? Nein, nein, you take him nowhere. He goes where he wishes to go, and you accompany him. Amana was the place he kept mentioning. An archaeological site, is it? It's just about the most remote, desolate site in Egypt, Cyrus said slowly. I don't think it would be such a smart idea for, for various reasons. The doctor folded his delicate hands across his rounded stomach and smiled placidly at us. You have no choice, my friend Fendergeld. Short of imprisonment, which is against the law, your only alternative is to have him declared incompetent. No reputable physician would sign such papers. I would not. He is not incompetent. He is not insane within the legal definition of the word. If it is the unavailability of medical attention at this place, uh, Amana, that concerns you, do not be concerned. Physically, he is on the road to recovery and will soon be himself again. There is no danger of a recurrence. There was danger, however, though not of the sort of recurrence the good doctor meant. After he had departed, Cyrus burst out. I'm sadly disappointed in Schadenfreude. Of all the insulting theories, he never told me I was a ravening beast. He is an enthusiast. Enthusiasts tend to exaggerate. But I am forced to agree with some of his theories. What he said about marriage being a truce. Hmm. That's not my notion of what the wedded state ought to be. But I guess you know more about the condition than a sorry old bachelor like me. 
but I'm dead set against him, aren't I? You and Emerson would be like ducks in a shooting gallery out in that wilderness. I disagree, Cyrus. It is easier to guard oneself in a howling wilderness than in a teeming metropolis. In some ways, maybe, but... Now, Cyrus, argument is a waste of time. As the doctor said, we have no choice. It will be good, I mused, to see dear Amana again. Cyrus's stern face softened. You don't fool me, Amelia. You're the bravest little woman I know. And that stiff upper lip of yours is a credit to the whole British nation. But it isn't healthy, my dear, to suppress your feelings this way. I've got a pretty broad shoulder if you want one to cry on. I declined the offer, with proper expressions of gratitude. But if Cyrus had seen me later that night, he would not have had such a high opinion of my courage. Huddled on the floor of the bath chamber, with the door locked and a towel pressed to my face to muffle my sobs, I wept until I could weep no more. It did me good, I suppose. Finally, I rose shakily to my feet and went to the window. The first pale streaks of dawn outlined the eastern mountains. Drained and exhausted, I leaned on the sill looking out, and as the light strengthened, I felt a slow renewing trickle of the courage and hope that had temporarily abandoned me. My fists clenched, my lips tightened. I had won the first battle against all odds. I had found him and brought him back to me. If other battles had to be fought, I would fight and win them too. Chapter 8 When one is striding bravely into the future, one cannot watch one's footing. Years had passed since I last beheld the plain of Amana, yet in eternal Egypt a decade is no more than the blink of an eye. Nothing had changed. The same wretched villages, the same narrow strip of green along the river bank, the same empty, arid plain behind, enclosed by frowning cliffs, like the fingers of a cupped, stony hand. It might have been only yesterday that my eyes last rested upon the scene, and this impression was further strengthened by the fact that I saw it from the deck of a dahabiyeh. Not my beloved Philae, on which I had travelled during my first visit to Egypt, but an even grander and more luxuriously appointed sailing vessel. These graceful floating apartments, once the most popular means of travel for well-to-do tourists, were fast disappearing. Cook steamers plied the river. The railroad offered quick, if uncomfortable, travel between Cairo and Luxor. The spirit of the new century was already upon us. And although modern devices were no doubt more convenient, it was with a sigh that I contemplated the loss of dignity, leisure and charm the Dahabiyas had amplified. A few traditionalists clung to the old customs. The Reverend Mr. Sace's boat was still a familiar sight along the river, and Cyrus also preferred the comfort of a dahabiya when travelling and when visiting sites where suitable accommodations were lacking. In fact, there was not a clean, much less comfortable hotel to be found between Cairo and Luxor. 
Visitors who wished to stay at Amana overnight had to camp out or request the hospitality of the local magistrate. This individual's house was only a little larger and hardly less filthy than those of the Fellaheen, so I was extremely pleased when Cyrus announced he had ordered his rice to bring his dahabiyah to Luxor so that we might travel on it to Amana. I had seen the Valley of the Kings, as his boat was named, before, so you may conceive of my surprise when I beheld a new and astonishing sailing vessel awaiting us at the dock the day we left Luxor. Twice the length of the other boat, gleaming with fresh paint, it bore the name of Nefertiti in elaborate gilt lettering on the prow. I figured it was time the old valley was retired, Cyrus said negligently, after I had expressed my admiration. Hope the decor meets with your approval, my dear. I had one suite fixed up to suit a lady's taste, in the hope that one day you might do me the honor of sailing with me. I concealed a smile, for I doubted I was the only Lady Cyrus had hoped to entertain. He was, as he had once said, a connoisseur in the most respectable sense of female loveliness. Certainly no female could have been other than delighted at the facilities this rough-hewn but gallant American had provided. From the lace-trimmed curtains of the wide windows to the daintily appointed dressing room adjoining the bath, everything was of the finest quality and most exquisite taste. The other guest rooms, for the boat had eight, were equally splendid. After a silent, contemptuous survey of the accommodations, Emerson selected the smallest of the chambers. He had not accepted this means of transport without a considerable fuss. The arguments of Dr Wallingford, who insisted that a few more days' recuperation would be advisable, had their effect. So did the arguments of Cyrus, who had presented himself to Emerson as the financier of that season's work. It was in matters such as these that my afflicted husband's loss of memory served to our advantage. He knew there were gaps in his memory. The, to him, overnight whitening of Abdullah's grizzled beard would have been proof enough had there been no other evidence. He dealt with this difficulty, as I might have expected Emerson to do, by coolly ignoring it. However, he was thus forced to accept certain statements as true, because he could not assert they were false. It was quite the usual thing for wealthy individuals to finance archaeological expeditions. Emerson disapproved of the practice, and said so, rather emphatically. But being unaware of his own financial situation, he was forced in this case to agree. Did I hope that the tranquil voyage, the moonlight rippling along the water, would bring back fond memories of our first such journey together? The journey that had culminated in that romantic moment when Emerson asked me to be his? No, I did not. And it is just as well I didn't, for my dream would have been doomed to disappointment. In vain did I flaunt my crimson flounces and my low-cut gowns but I thought it would not hurt to try. Emerson fled from them like a man pursued by pariah dogs. The only time he condescended to notice my existence was when I wore trousers and talked of archaeology. I wore my new working costume at luncheon the day after we left Luxor, the crimson gown having had the aforesaid result the previous night. I was late joining the others, for I had, I admit, gone through my entire wardrobe before deciding what to wear. Cyrus got to his feet when I entered. Emerson was slow to follow his example, and he gave me a long look from boots to neatly netted hair before doing so. This is just the sort of inconsistency I object to, he remarked to Cyrus. If she dresses like a man and insists on doing a man's work, why the devil should she expect me to jump to my feet when she enters a room? And, he added, anticipating the reproof that was hovering on Cyrus's lips, why the devil can't I speak as I would to another fellow? You can say anything you like, I replied, thanking Cyrus with a smile as he helped me into my chair. And I will say what I like, so if my language offends you, you will have to put up with it. Times have changed, Professor Emerson. Emerson grinned. Professor, eh? Never mind the academic titles. They aren't worth um, considering. 
Times certainly have changed, if, as van der Gelt here tells me, I have employed a female for the past several years. An artist, are you? Women had occasionally served in that capacity on archaeological digs. They were generally considered unfit for more intellectually taxing activities. I decided not to remind Emerson of the two ladies who had excavated the Temple of Mut at Karnak a few years earlier, for even at the time he had been critical of their methods. But to do him and them justice, he was equally critical of the efforts of most male archaeologists. Calmly, I replied, I am an excavator, like yourself. I am a fair draftsman, I am acquainted with the use of surveying instruments, and I can read the hieroglyphs. I speak Arabic. I am familiar with the principles of scientific excavation, and I can tell a pre-dynastic pot from a piece of maidum ware. In short, I can do anything you or any other excavator can do. Emerson's eyes narrowed. That, he said, remains to be seen. To my affectionate eyes, he was still painfully thin, and his face had not regained its healthy tan. Not much of it was visible. He had irritably refused to trim his beard, and it had spread up his cheeks and formed a jetty bush around jaws and chin. It looked even worse than it had when I first met him. But his eyes had regained their old saffarine fire. They shot a challenging look at me before he applied himself to his soup and relapsed into ominous silence. No one broke it. Emerson might not be entirely himself again, but there was enough of him to dominate any group of which he made a part. And the two young men who were at the table with us shrank into near invisibility in his presence. I beg leave to introduce to the reader Mr. Charles H. Holley and Monsieur René Darcy, two of Cyrus's assistants. If I have not presented them before, it is because I had never met either of them. They were of the new generation of archaeologists, and this was Charlie's first season in Egypt. A mining engineer by profession, he was a ruddy-cheeked, cheerful young man with hair the colour of Egyptian sand. At least, he had been cheerful until Emerson got at him. René, as pale and soulful-looking as a poet, was a graduate of the Sorbonne and a skilled draughtsman. The ebon locks that fell gracefully over his brow matched the moustache that drooped with corresponding grace over his upper lip. He had a very pleasant smile. I hadn't seen the smile since Emerson got at him. Emerson had quizzed them like students at a viva voce examination, criticising their translations of hieroglyphic texts, correcting their Arabic, and deriding their stumbling descriptions of excavation technique. One could hardly blame them for not coming off well under that blistering interrogation. I had heard distinguished scholars stutter like schoolboys when Emerson challenged their theories. The poor lads could not know that, and they took pains to avoid my husband thereafter. Neither of them knew the secret as Ramses would have called it, but they were aware of the fact that the peril from which Emerson had escaped might still pursue us. Cyrus assured me they were devoted to him, and good men in a fight, as he put it. Not until he had finished eating, with good appetite, I was happy to see, did Emerson speak again. Throwing down his napkin, he rose and fixed a stern look on me. Come along, Miss um, Peabody. It is time we had a little chat. I followed him, smiling to myself. If Emerson thought to catch me out or intimidate me as he had the poor young men, he was in for a salutary shock. The reader may be surprised at my calm acceptance of a situation that should have induced the strongest feelings of anguish and distress. Fortitude in the face of adversity has always been my way. Tears and hysteria are foreign to my nature. Could I ever forget that supreme accolade I had once received from Emerson himself? One of the reasons I love you was that you are more inclined to whack people over the head with your parasol than fling yourself weeping onto your bed like other women. I had had my night of weeping. Not on a comfortable bed, but on the hard floor of the bathroom at the castle. 
huddled in a corner like a beaten dog. Never doubt that there were other moments of pain and despair, but what purpose would a description of them serve? None were as severe as that first uncontrolled outburst of anguish. I had purged myself of useless emotions that terrible night. Now every nerve, every sinew, every thought was bent on a single purpose. It was as if I had forced myself to lose those same years Emerson had lost, to return in my mind to the past. In this, I was following the dictates of Dr. Schadenfreude. You, he had informed me, on the eve of our departure, you, Frau Emerson, are the crux. My initial impression has been confirmed by all that I have seen since. It is from the bonds of matrimony that his memory retreats. In all else, he is receptive. He accepts with relative equanimity what he is told. On that subject alone, he remains obdurate. Follow him into the past. Recapture the indifference with which you once regarded him. Act upon it. And then... Act upon what follows. Cyrus had become sadly disenchanted with Dr. Schadenfreude since that distinguished gentleman expressed his views on marriage and the reprehensible habits of the male sex. Like most men, Cyrus was a secret romantic and hopelessly naive about people. Women are more realistic, and I, I believe I may say without fear of contradiction, and a supreme realist. The doctor's advice appealed to certain elements of my character. I enjoy a challenge. The more difficult the task, the more eager I am to roll up my sleeves and pitch in. I had won Emerson's heart before, against considerable odds, for he had been a confirmed misogynist, and I am not and have never been beautiful. If the spiritual bond between us, a bond transcending the limits of time and the flesh, was as strong as I believed, then I could win him again. If that bond existed only in my imagination, I would not, could not concede it was so. So, with limbs a tingle and brain alert, I followed him to the saloon, which also served as a library and Cyrus's study. It was a symphony in crimson and cream, with touches of gold. Even the grand piano had been gilded, one of Cyrus's few descents into execrable transatlantic taste. Emerson flung himself into an armchair and took out his pipe. While he was messing with it, I took up a manuscript from the table. It was the little fairy tale I had been reading in Cairo. I had taken it up again in order to distract my mind. It is my turn to be tested, I presume, I said composedly. Shall I translate? This is the Doomed Prince, a tale with which you are no doubt familiar. Emerson glanced up from poking at his pipe. You read hieratic? Not well, I admitted. This is Wal uh, Maspero's hieroglyphic transliteration. And without further ado, I began. There was once a king to whom no son was born, so he prayed the gods he served for a son, and they decreed that one should be born to him. Then the Hathors came to decree his destiny. They said, He shall die by the crocodile or the snake or the... An invisible hand gripped my throat. Superstition is not a weakness to which I am prone, but the parallel suddenly struck me with such force I felt like the unhappy parents hearing the doom prophesied for their child. At the beginning of our acquaintance at Amana, Emerson and I had faced an adversary I had described as a veritable crocodile, waiting on the sandbank to destroy the lover seeking his sweetheart. Now another enemy threatened us, a man who had used the name Schlange, in German, Schlange means snake. Nonsense, said the rational part of my much-tried brain. Fanciful you may be, but this is the grossest kind of pagan morbidity. Dismiss it. 
Let common sense prevail over the affectionate fear that has weakened the ratiocinative process. Unaware of the painful struggle going on under his very eyes, Emerson said sarcastically, Is that the extent of your preparation? I can go on if you like. Never mind. I did not request a private interview in order to review your qualifications. If Vandergelt can be believed, I have already accepted them. You have. And you were present on the presumed expedition concerning which my gentle host was so curious. I was. It did take place. It did. At least she doesn't talk as incessantly as most women, Emerson muttered to himself. Very well, then, Miss uh, Peabody. Where the devil did we go, and why? Vandergeld claims to be ignorant of those facts. I told him. Emerson's eyebrows performed a series of alarming movements. Will he forth? It seems only yesterday I spoke with him. You say he is dead. And his wife. The details do not matter, I continued, for I was not anxious to recall some of those details. What does matter is that someone has learned that Mr. Forth's lost civilization is not a fantasy, and that we alone can lead him to it. We swore we would never disclose its location. Yes, yes, you explained that. Forgive me, Emerson continued, with poisonous politeness, if I express a certain degree of scepticism about the whole affair. I told Willie Forth he was mad, and thus far I have seen no evidence that contradicts that judgment. You and your dear friend Vandergelt might have invented this story for reasons of your own. You still bear the evidence of someone's interest in your affairs, I said indignantly. Your bruised head and that horrible beard. What does my beard have to do with it? Emerson clutched protectively at the appendage in question. Leave my beard out of this, if you please. I grant you that someone appears to be taking an impertinent interest in my personal affairs. But he was not as specific as you. How could he be? He knows nothing about the place except that it holds incredible riches. Do you always interrupt people when they are talking? No more than you. If people go on and on... I never interrupt, Emerson shouted. Pray allow me to finish the point I am endeavouring to make. Pray make it, I snapped. Emerson drew a deep breath. There are a number of individuals who hold grudges against me. I am not ashamed of that. Indeed, it is a source of modest pride to me, for in all cases their resentment stems from my interference with their illegal or immoral activities. I am also, as you may have observed, close-mouthed, discreet, taciturn. I don't tell people everything I know. I don't trumpet my knowledge to the world. I never speak unless... Oh, good gad! I exclaimed, jumping to my feet. I quite agree with the premise you are suggesting. At such a necessary length. There are undoubtedly dozens of people who would like to murder you for dozens of different reasons. You want evidence that this particular individual is after one particular piece of information? I will give you evidence. Come with me. He had no choice but to obey or leave his curiosity unsatisfied, for I was on my way to the door even as I spoke. Stamping heavily and muttering under his breath, he followed me until I reached my room and flung the door open. Here, he exclaimed, starting back. I refuse to. Exhilarated, amused and exasperated, I got behind him and gave him a shove. If I make a rude advance, you can scream for help. When you see what I have to show you, you will understand why I prefer not to remove it from this room. Sit down. Eyeing the canopied bed as if it might extend ruffled tentacles to grasp him, Emerson circled around it and lowered himself cautiously into a chair. He stiffened when I went to the bed, but relaxed a little after I had taken the box out from under the mattress and handed it to him. The sight of the contents brought a soft whistle to his lips, but he did not comment until after he had examined both scepters thoroughly. And when he raised his eyes to my face, they glittered with the old blue fire of archaeological fever. If they are fakes, they are the finest I have ever seen, and you and Vandergelt have gone to considerable trouble to deceive me. They are genuine, 
We are not deceiving you. Not even Cyrus has seen these, Emerson. He knows no more about the matter than does our unknown enemy, who put together the same clues. Cyrus, unknown? Not to me. What? I cried. You recognised him? Of course. He had grown a beard and dyed it and his hair, and he looked older, which, Emerson mused, is only to be expected since he was older. No doubt about it, though. Well, well, this explains why he was so bad-mannered. I could not imagine why he was put out with me, since I had been one of the few to defend him. What a sad world it is, when greed proves stronger than gratitude, and the lust for gold overcomes friendship. Men are so naive, I exclaimed. The commonest reaction to favours rendered is resentment, not gratitude. He probably detests you even more than he does those who condemned him. So it was Mr. Vincey. I thought I recognised his voice. You know him? Yes, that is his cat. I indicated Anubis, who was curled up on the sofa. He asked us, curse his insolence, to care for the animal while he went to Damascus. He certainly was not in Damascus, Emerson said. Very well, let us get down to business instead of wandering all around the subject the way you women are inclined to do. Vinci is on the loose, and it would be extremely careless of us to assume he has given up his little project. He has all the more reason to be vexed with me now, after I got away from him so neatly. I could... What's the matter? Something caught in your throat? Have a glass of water and don't distract me. It didn't seem an opportune moment to remind him that his escape had been neither neat nor due to his efforts. Choking on my indignation, I remained silent. Emerson went on thoughtfully. I could track him down, I suppose, but I will be damned if I allow him to interfere with my professional activities any more than he already has. If he wants me, he will come after me. Yes, that will be best. I can get on with my work, and if he turns up... I'll settle the fellow. I was meditating how best to respond to this complacent statement when I heard someone approaching. The steps were those of Cyrus. The rapidity of their pace made my scalp prickle with apprehension. He was almost running, and as he neared my door, he began to call out. Amelia, you there? Just a moment, I called snatching the box from Emerson and hastening to restore it to its hiding place. What is it, Cyrus? What has happened? Big trouble, I opine. We have found a stowaway. As soon as I had the box concealed, I admitted Cyrus. In my excitement, I had overlooked the fact that Emerson's presence might cause some embarrassment, particularly to Emerson, until I saw Cyrus's jaw drop and colour flood his lean cheeks. Emerson had gone equally red in the face, but he decided to brazen it out. "'You're interrupting a professional discussion,' he growled. "'What's all the fuss about?' "'A stowaway,' I reminded him. "'Who? Where?' "'Here,' Cyrus said. One of the sailors pushed her into the room. One had to assume she was female from her dress, though the worn black robes completely covered her shape and the dusty veil hid all but a pair of terrified dark eyes. "'It is some poor village woman fleeing a cruel husband or tyrannical father,' I cried, my sympathies immediately engaged. "'Hell and damnation!' Emerson exclaimed. Her eyes found him where he sat bolt upright, hands clutching the arms of his chair. With a sudden effort, she tore herself free and flung herself at his feet. Save me, O oh father of curses. I risked my life for you, and now it hangs by a thread. Exaggeration seemed to be in the air that day, I thought to myself. She had tried to keep the murderous guard from entering Emerson's prison. But how could her dread master know of that? Was this even the same woman? Her voice sounded different, huskier, deeper, and with a distinct accent. "'You are safe with me,' Emerson said, studying the bent black head with, I was happy to observe, a rather sceptical expression. "'If you speak the truth.' 
You doubt me? Still on her knees, she sat back and wrenched the veil from her face. I cried out in horror. No wonder I had not recognized her voice. The prints of fingers showed dark on her bruised throat. Her face was equally unrecognizable, swollen and stained by the marks of brutal blows. This is what he did to me when he learned you had escaped, she whispered. Pity had not altogether wiped out my suspicions. How did he learn... I began. Replacing the veil, she turned to me. He beat me because I had shown compassion and because... because he was angry. Emerson's face was impassive. Those who had never beheld a demonstration of the seething sea of sentiment his sardonic exterior conceals might have believed him to be unmoved, but I knew he was thinking of the child woman he had been unable to save from her murderous father. Nothing of this showed in his voice when he said gruffly, Find her a room, Vandergilt. God knows you've enough useless space on this boat. She kissed his hand, though he tried to stop her, and followed Cyrus out. Frowning, Emerson took out his pipe. I heard Cyrus summon his steward. After directing the fellow to show the lady... He stumbled a bit over the word, but I had to give him credit for the effort. To a vacant stateroom, he returned. Are you loony, Emerson? The dad... Er, darn woman's a spy. And her bruises were incurred in an effort to give verisimilitude to an otherwise unconvincing story? Emerson asked dryly. How devotedly she must love her tormentor. Cyrus's lean face darkened. That's not love. It's a kind of fear you'll never know. You are right, Cyrus, I said. Many women know it. Not only the helpless slaves of a society such as this, but English women as well. Some of the girls Evelyn has taken in off the streets. It does you credit, Cyrus, that you can understand and sympathise with a condition so alien from any you could ever have experienced. I was thinking of dogs, Cyrus said, blushing at my praise, but too honest to accept it when it was undeserved. I've seen him come fawning back to the feet of the varmint that had beaten and kicked him. You can reduce a man to that state, too, if you go about it right. Emerson blew out a great cloud of blue smoke. If you two have quite finished your philosophical discussion, we might try to settle this matter. The girl's arrival raises another point which I was about to make when Miss uh, Peabody got me off the track. Vincy may not be the only one involved. Cyrus expressed surprise at the name and I took it upon myself to explain. I thought at the time his voice was familiar, Cyrus, but he had disguised his appearance so well I could not be certain. Emerson has just now confirmed my assumption, and I suppose he could hardly be mistaken. Do you know Mr. Vincy? By reputation, Cyrus replied, frowning. From what I've heard, I wouldn't put such a trick past him. He certainly was not the only one involved, I went on. Abdallah claims to have killed at least ten of the enemy. This little sally produced a smile from Cyrus, but not from Emerson. Local thugs, he said curtly. Such men can be hired in any city in Egypt or in the world. The girl is another such tool. Vinci has an unsavory reputation as regards women. Women of the... Uh, of that class, you mean, I said, remembering Vincy's grave courtesy toward me, and remembering as well Howard's veiled hints about his reputation. Repressing my indignation, I went on. I find your use of the word tool interesting. She may still be serving him in that capacity. Cyrus is right. I am not so naive, Emerson shot me a malignant glance, as to accept the girl's story unreservedly. If she is a spy, we can deal with her. If she is telling the truth, she needs help. Must have been a good-looking woman before he got to work on her, said Cyrus. This apparent non-sequitur, which was, of course, nothing of the kind, did not escape Emerson. 
His teeth showed in a particularly unpleasant smile. She was, yes, and will be again. So, behave yourself, Vandergelt. I don't allow distractions of that nature to interfere with my expeditions. If it were up to me, I'd kick her off the boat tonight, Cyrus declared indignantly. No, no. Where's that famous American gallantry? She stays. Emerson turned the singularly unpleasant smile on me. She will be company for Miss Peabody. After they had gone, I gathered up a few things and went to the woman's room. The door was locked from the outside, but the key was in the lock. I turned it, announced my presence, and entered. She was sprawled across the bed, still swathed in her dusty black robe. It was with some difficulty that I persuaded her to discard it, and she refused to allow me to attend to her injuries. So I handed her the clean nightgown I had brought and allowed her to attend to her ablutions in private. When she emerged from the bathroom, she seemed startled to see me still there. Averting her face and cringing like the dog with which Cyrus had compared her, she hurried to the bed and got under the covers. "'I don't know what we are to do about clothing,' I said, hoping to put her more at ease by discussing a subject that seldom fails to interest females. "'My travelling wardrobe is not extensive enough to equip you as well.' "'Your gowns would not fit me,' she muttered. "'I am taller than you, and not... not so... Hmm, I said. "'I will procure fresh robes for you when we stop at the next town, then. "'This one is filthy. "'And a veil, please. "'It would hide me from watching eyes. "'I doubted it would prove a sufficient disguise "'to deceive the man she feared so desperately. "'But since my aim was to soothe her and win her confidence, "'I decided not to raise unpleasant subjects.' Under my tactful questioning, she unbent so far as to tell me something of her history. It was a sad story, and sadly not uncommon. The child of a European father and an Egyptian mother, she had fared better than the offspring of most such alliances, for her German father had at least had the decency to provide a home for her until she reached the age of eighteen. His death left her at the mercy of his heirs, who disclaimed any responsibility and denied any relationship. Her efforts to support herself in a respectable occupation had been frustrated by her age and her sex. While employed as a housemaid, she had been seduced by the eldest son of the family and cast out onto the street when his parents discovered the affair. Naturally, they blamed her and not their child. She had used the last of her savings to return to the land of her birth, where she found her maternal relatives as hostile as those of her father. Alone and despairing in Cairo, she had met him. Seeing she was trembling with fatigue and agitation, I bade her rest. Her reticence could not be allowed to continue indefinitely, of course. I was determined to know all she knew— but that could wait till another time and perhaps a more persuasive questioner. When we tied up for the night, I sent one of the servants to the village bazaar to purchase clothing for Bertha, for such, she claimed, was her name. It certainly did not suit her, conjuring up, to me at least, images of blonde Germanic placidity. I had not achieved my aim of picking Bertha's brain by the time we arrived at our destination, Emerson refused to have anything to do with the matter. What can she tell us? That Vincy is a brute, a liar, and a seducer of women. His past activities, criminal or otherwise, are of no interest to me. I am not a police officer. His present address, even supposing he were fool enough to return to any location known to her, is equally irrelevant. When I want the bastard, I will find him. Just now I don't want him. I want to get on with my work. And I will do it, come hell or high water, miscellaneous criminals or female busybodies. For a stretch of almost 40 miles along the Nile in Middle Egypt, the cliffs of the high eastern desert rise sheer from the water's edge, except in a single spot where they curve back to form a semicircular bay some six miles long by three miles deep. The barren level plain seems even more forbidding than do other abandoned sites, for this is a haunted place, 
the sight of short-lived splendor, of a royal city now vanished forever from the face of the earth. Here, equidistant from the ancient capitals of Thebes to the south and Memphis to the north, the most enigmatic of Egyptian pharaohs, Akhenaten, built a new city and named it Akhenaten after his god, Aten, the only one beside whom there is no other. By Pharaoh's order, the temples of other gods were closed. Even their names were obliterated from the monuments. His insistence on the uniqueness of his deity made him a heretic in ancient Egyptian terms, and in our terms, the first monotheist in history. The portraits of Akhenaten show a strange haggard face and an almost feminine body with broad hips and fleshy torso. Yet he was not deficient in masculine attributes, as the existence of at least six children proves. Their mother was Akhenaten's queen, Nefertiti, lady of grace, sweet of hands, his beloved. And his romantic attachment to this lovely lady, whose very name meant the beautiful woman has come, is shown in numerous reliefs and paintings. Tenderly he turns to embrace her, Gracefully, she perches on his knee. These depictions of marital accord are unique in Egyptian art and uncommon anywhere. They had a particular attraction for me. I don't believe it is necessary for me to explain why that was so. Some scholars view Akhenaten as morally perverse and physically deformed and decry his religious reformation as nothing more than a cynical political manoeuvre. This is nonsense, of course. I do not apologise for preferring a more uplifting interpretation. I trust the reader has not skipped over the preceding paragraphs. The aim of literature is to improve the understanding, not provide idle entertainment. We were all at the rail on the day of our arrival, watching as the crewmen manoeuvred the Dahabiya in toward the dock at the village of Hagi Kandil. The period of rest had done Emerson good. Tanned and bursting with energy, he was almost his old self again. Except for the confounded beard. He was also in a high good humour, for though it had almost choked me to do it, I had not pressed him on the subject of Mr Vincy and Bertha. However, Cyrus and I had discussed the matter at length and had agreed upon certain precautions. Waiting on the quay were twenty of our faithful men from Azir, the little village near Cairo which produced some of the most skilled diggers in Egypt. I had sent Abdullah to fetch them to Amarna, and the sight of their keen, smiling faces was more reassuring to me than that of a troop of soldiers would have been. They had worked for us for years. Emerson had trained them himself, and they were devoted to him, body and soul. Emerson climbed over the rail and jumped ashore. He was still thumping backs and shaking hands and submitting to fervent embraces when I joined the group. I was not the second one ashore, however. The cat, Anubis, preceded me down the gangplank. Abdallah drew me aside and gestured at the cat, which was giving each set of sandaled feet a thorough inspection. Have you not rid yourself of that four-footed afrit? Sitakim. He was the betrayer of Emerson. If he was, it was inadvertent, Abdullah. Cats cannot be trained to lead people into ambushes, or to do anything else they don't want to do. Anubis has become very attached to Emerson. He stayed with him, on the foot of his bed, all the while he was ill. Now, Abdullah, have you warned the other men that Emerson is still in danger from the man who called himself Schlanger? and told them of the subjects they must not mention? Such as the subject that you are the wife of the father of curses? Abdallah spoke with a sarcasm worthy of Emerson himself, and his prominent hawk-like nose wrinkled critically. I have told them, Sid. They will obey, as they would obey any command you gave, though they do not understand your reasons. Nor do I. To me, this is a foolish way of bringing back a man's memory. For once we see eye to eye, Abdullah, 
said Cyrus, joining us. But I reckon we've got to go along. When the Sid Hakim speaks, the whole world listens and obeys. No man knows that better than I, said Abdallah. Emerson's shout brought us gathering around. Abdallah has set up camp for us, he announced. And I have washed the donkeys, said Abdallah. Emerson stared at him. Wash the donkeys? What for? He was following my orders, I said. The little animals are always in wretched condition, covered with sores and inadequately tended. I do not allow... Well, that is beside the point. Will you now condescend to tell us where we are going and what you propose to do, and why we require a campsite when we have the Dahabia? Emerson turned the stare on me. I have no intention of staying on that cursed boat. It is too far from the tombs. Which tombs? I asked, stepping heavily on Cyrus's foot to still the objection he was about to make. All the tombs. The southern group is a good three miles from here, and the northern group is even farther. There is another interesting area in a hollow behind that low hill near the centre of the arc of the cliffs. There are no tombs there, I objected, unless the brickwork... Emerson gestured impatiently. I will make my final decision tonight. My object today is to make a preliminary survey, and the sooner you stop arguing, the sooner we can get at it. Well, any further objections? He wheeled suddenly on René, who had edged closer. There were no further objections. Before the day was over, any doubts as to Emerson's physical condition were removed. He declared we did not need the donkeys, a statement with which everyone disagreed, but to which everyone except myself was too cowed to object. I knew perfectly well that he was testing us, me especially, and so I did not object either. We must have walked almost twenty miles, counting the perpendicular distances we covered, scrambling over piles of rocky scree and climbing up and down the cliffs. The easiest way of describing this hegira is to envision the area as a semicircle, with the Nile forming the straight side. The cliffs of the high desert curve like a bow. At the extreme north and south ends, they almost touch the riverbank. Hagi Kandil is somewhat south of the midpoint of the straight line, so we were a good three miles from the nearest section of the cliffs. The path led through the village and the surrounding fields out onto the plain. An undulating, barren surface littered with pebbles and potsherds. The ruined foundations of Akhenaten's holy city lay under the drifted sand. It had stretched the entire distance from the north end of the plain to the south. The portion we had excavated during the years we worked at Amana lay farther to the south, but I felt sure the slow, inexorable hand of nature had reclaimed the site and buried all evidence of our labour as it had that of the ancient builders. Emerson struck briskly out across the plain. Quickening my pace, I caught up to him. I take it, Emerson, that we are going to the northern tombs? No, said Emerson. I glanced at Cyrus, who shrugged and smiled, and invited me, with a gesture, to walk with him. We allowed Emerson to forge ahead, with only Abdallah close on his heels. No one else seemed eager for his company. We did, in fact, visit some of the northern tombs, but not until after Emerson had indicated another kind of monument he wanted to examine in detail that season. Around the rocky perimeter of his city, Akhenaten had carved a number of commemorative markers, defining his boundaries and dedicating it to his god. Emerson and I had found and copied three of them ourselves. These stele, as they are called, were similar in form, a central round-topped marker bearing a long hieroglyphic inscription under a scene in bas-relief that depicted the king and his family worshipping their god Aten, in the form of a sun disk extending rays that ended in small human hands. Statues of the royal family stood on either side. Most of the boundary stele were in ruinous condition. Some portions had been deliberately destroyed by the royal heretic's enemies after his death and the restoration of the old gods he had denied. 
There are two series of inscriptions, one earlier in time than the other, said Emerson. Hands on his hips, bare-headed in the baking sunlight, he stood staring up at the cliff that towered over us. This is one of the earlier. There are two princesses shown with their parents. The later Steely show three daughters. Cyrus took off his solar topi and fanned himself with it. How the dickens you make that out, I don't know. The top of the darn thing has to be thirty feet off the ground, and the cliff is absolutely sheer. It cannot be approached except from above, said Emerson. He turned. Charlie was trying to hide behind Abdullah, whose tall form and voluminous robes offered a good-sized shelter. But Emerson's eyes went straight to him. With ferocious good humour, Emerson said... The boundary stealer are your responsibility, Holly. A healthy young fellow like you should enjoy the challenge of copying texts while you dangle at the end of a rope. A precipitous path led us up to the ledge on which the northern group of nobles' tombs were located. Once they had gaped open, vulnerable to the depredations of time and tomb robbers, Recently, the Antiquities Department had put up iron gates at the entrances to the most interesting of them. Emerson studied these gates, which had not been there in our time, with critical curiosity. Isn't there an American saying about locking the barn door after the horse is stolen? Ah, well, better late than never, I suppose. Who has the keys? I can get them, Cyrus said. Since I did not know, uh, I may want them later, was the curt reply. He refused to say more until we had reached Abdullah's campsite. Knowing Abdullah, I wasn't surprised to see that his efforts had consisted of putting up a few tents and gathering camel dung for a fire. Very nice, Abdullah, I said. The rice, who had been watching me out of the corner of his eye, relaxed and then stiffened again as I went on. "'Of course, nothing is as commodious as a nice, convenient tomb. "'Why can't we...' "'Because we are not going to work at the tombs,' said Emerson. "'This site is equidistant between the two groups, northern and southern.' "'Site?' Cyrus repeated indignantly. "'What the di- the dickens do you want to waste your time on this area for? "'There can't be any houses out here, so far from the main city, "'and no one has found any evidence of tomb shafts.' Emerson's well-shaped lips, now alas virtually hidden from my fond eyes by bristling black hair, curled in a sneer. Most of my colleagues couldn't find a tomb shaft if they fell into it. I told you, Vandergelt, explanations will have to wait till this evening. We have quite a distance yet to cover. Follow me. The sun was now directly overhead, and we had been walking, to use that term loosely, for several hours. "'Lead on,' I said, taking a firm grip on my parasol. "'Emerson had already eyed this appendage askance, "'but had not asked about it, "'so I saw no reason to explain "'that a parasol is one of the most useful objects "'an individual can carry on such an expedition. "'Not only does it provide shade, "'but it can be used as a walking stick, "'or, if need be, as a weapon.' My parasols had frequently been employed in the latter capacity. They were specially made with a heavy steel shaft and a pointed tip. Like the gallant gentleman he was, Cyrus came to my rescue. No, sir, he declared. It's high noon and I'm famished. I want my lunch before I stir another step. Emerson was ungraciously pleased to agree. The shade of the tents was welcome. One of Cyrus's servants unpacked the hampers his chef had provided, and we consumed a luncheon far more elegant than most field archaeologists enjoy. While we ate, Emerson condescended to lecture again. He directed most of his remarks at the two young men. The brickwork, Miss um, Peabody, referred to, is on the slopes and at the bottom of the hollow behind us. Some of it probably belongs to tomb chapels. The ruins on the floor of the hollow are clearly of another nature. I will start there tomorrow with a full crew. You, Vandergelt, and Miss... Um, 
"'If the title bothers you so much, you may dispense with it,' I said calmly. <clears throat> said Emerson. "'You two will assist me. I trust this meets with your approval, Miss Peabody.' "'Quite,' I said. "'Mentergilt? I can hardly wait.' said Cyrus, with a grimace. Very well, Emerson jumped to his feet. We have dawdled long enough. Let us be off. Back to the Dahabia, Cyrus asked, hopefully. Since you have decided where you mean to excavate, good God, man, there are a good six hours of daylight left, and we have seen less than half of the area. Hurry up, can't you? Enviously, the others watched Cyrus's servants strike off toward the river with the empty hampers. Then the procession formed again, with Emerson's entourage trailing after him. I presumed he meant to complete the circuit of the cliffs, and my heart beat high at the thought of seeing again the southern tombs where we had dwelt for so many happy years. But somehow I was not surprised when he led us into the foothills toward an opening in the rocky ramparts. Cyrus, ever at my side, let out a stifled American oath. Great jumping Jehoshaphat! I had a horrible premonition about this. The Royal Wadi. It's a three-mile hike each way, and I'll bet you the temperature is high enough to fry an egg on a rock. I'll bet you it is, I agreed. As I have already explained, but will reiterate for the benefit of less attentive readers, the wadis are canyons cut through the high desert plateau by past floods. The entrance to this one was located midway between the southern and northern groups of tombs. Its proper name is the Wadi Abu Hassa El Bahri, but for reasons that should be evident, it is commonly referred to as the main wadi. The Royal Wadi proper is a narrow offshoot of this larger canyon, approximately three miles from the entrance to the latter. Here, in a spot as remote and desolate as a lunar valley, Akhenaten had caused his own tomb to be built. If the southern tombs brought back poignant memories, the Royal Tomb recalled scenes that had impressed themselves indelibly upon my heart. In the gloomy corridor of that sepulchre, I had felt Emerson's arms about me for the first time. Along the rubble-strewn floor of the wadi, we had raced by moonlight to save those we loved from a hideous death. Every foot of the way was familiar to me, and the spot was as fraught with romance as a garden of roses might be to one who had led a more boring life. Shortly after we entered it, the valley curved, cutting off our view of the plain and the cultivation beyond. After approximately three miles, the rocky sides closed in and smaller wadis opened up on either side. Emerson had already disappeared. Following, we saw him trotting along one of the narrow side canyons whose floor rose as it proceeded to the northeast. There it is, I said, in a voice pent with emotion, ahead and to the left. Soon the others saw it too, a dark opening framed by masonry above a scree of tumbled rock. Charlie groaned. His clean-shaven countenance already showed signs of what promised to be a painful sunburn. Even a hat cannot entirely protect those of fair complexion from the effects of Egypt's burning solar orb. When we had climbed to the ledge in front of the tomb, Emerson was there, glowering at the iron gate that barred entry. "'We will certainly need this key,' he said to Cyrus. "'Make sure I have it tomorrow morning.' "'By the time Emerson announced we were finished for the day, "'I was as much in the dark about his intentions as was Cyrus. "'He had scrambled around the foot of the cliffs "'to the north and south of the royal tomb for over an hour, "'poking into holes like a ferret after a rat. "'Where are we going?' Cyrus asked, "'as we trudged wearily back along the rock-strewn path. See here, Emerson, there's no earthly reason why we can't spend the night on the Dahabia. I never said there was, said Emerson, with an air of innocent astonishment that left Cyrus gnashing his teeth. When we reached the gangplank, I saw that Anubis was waiting for us. Where he had been or how he had spent his time, I could not imagine. 
but when we approached, he rose, stretched, yawned, and accompanied us onto the boat. "'We will meet in the saloon in half an hour,' said Emerson, heading for his room. The cat followed him. I heard him say, "'Nice kitty,' as he stumbled over it. I had barely time to bathe and change in the time he had arbitrarily allotted, but I managed it, hastily selecting a garment that required no prolonged process of hooking up and no assistance with regard to buttons. I cannot imagine how women lacking husbands or personal maids ever manage to get dressed. Gowns that fasten up the back are impossible except for a contortionist. Emerson was already there, brooding over a heap of papers and plans spread across the table. His eyebrows lifted when he saw my pink flounces and ruffles. The garment to which I have referred was a tea gown, but he made no comment, and only grunted when I ordered the steward to serve tea. I was pouring when Cyrus came in, followed closely by the two young men. Apparently they felt there was safety in numbers. Poor Charlie was as red as an English brick and René's mouth repeated the downward droop of his moustache. Emerson sat tapping his fingers on the table and looking pointedly patient while I dispensed the genial beverage. Then he said, "'If the cursed social amenities are concluded to your satisfaction, Miss Peabody, I would like to get on with it.' "'Nothing has prevented you from doing so,' I said mildly. "'Take this to Professor Emerson, René, will you please?' "'I don't want any damn tea,' said Emerson, taking the cup. "'I thought you were all burning to know where we are going to excavate.' "'You told us,' Cyrus said, while Emerson sipped his tea. "'The steely... No, no, they won't occupy us for the entire season,' Emerson interrupted. "'You American dilettantes are always after royal tombs. "'What do you say to the tomb of Nefertiti?'